Mario Party! Welcome to Identifying Luck for Mario Party 6. It is here where we will learn how to best improve our odds of winning at the only Mario Party game with a built-in day and night cycle for every board. Let's start the first chapter of our journey with the bonus stars. We've got the happening star, minigame star, and the orb star. I'm sorry to say that Coinstar is no longer with us and has been replaced by the Orb Star here. Farewell, my friend. The Orb Star is awarded to the player that used the most orbs. Take that word used very literally, by the way. The Snack Orb and Boo Wave Orb's text descriptions end with can't be used or placed, and since they are technically not used, they do not count towards the Orb Bonus Star. This should go without saying, but no, disposing of these orbs does not count as using them either. Every other orb will contribute to the Orb Bonus Star, though. You can only use one orb per turn. So so on a 20 turn game for example, the maximum amount of orbs a player can use by the end is 19, not 20 because you can't start your first turn with an orb. This can create somewhat of an issue. What if you only have one orb in your inventory and now isn't the best time to use it? Should you use it anyway so you have a higher count for the orb star or should you save it so you can use it later? There are going to be a lot of different scenarios for how to handle this kind of situation but let's go over the most likely. If you're playing against someone who is dedicated to using an orb every turn and they're already ahead of you on their orb count, then you can forget about trying to catch up and use your orbs at optimal times. If no one else you're playing with is aware of how the orb star works, then you may be able to get away with using your orbs whenever you want while also making sure your orb count is higher than the others. If you're at the end game and you feel like not using an orb will jeopardize your chances of getting the orb star, then use it now. Unless it backfire on you in a meaningful way or help out the greatest threat, you do not want to give up a bonus star to an opponent. If none of these scenarios apply and you're just stuck debating whether you should increase your orb count or save the orb for a different time, then it'll come down to what orb you're carrying. If it's a yellow orb which affects whoever lands on it, then you're probably good to place it down since these orbs rarely require an exact moment for them to be played in order for their potential to be realized. Red orbs on the other hand will often have moments where using one on a specific spot during a specific turn is optimal. This is because red orbs get activated when an opponent merely passes the space they were placed on, so making sure you place a red orb at the right spot at the right time may be a big deal. Green orbs, which affect your movement, are similar in this regard. Using the Metal Mushroom as an example, its purpose is to protect you from rivals' traps, so using it when there are no traps around may feel like a waste, but if you're adding to your orb count, then it isn't unless there's a trap way ahead that would ruin your game. As a general rule of thumb, if you only have one orb and you're not sure whether to use it or save it until your next turn, then ask yourself what value you're gaining from waiting until the next turn to use it. If the value is about the same as what you'd get on this turn, or even if it's just a little bit more, then don't wait and just use it now so that you can get your orb count up. The minigame star is awarded to the player that collected the most amount of coins from standard minigames and battle minigames. That was a change that Mario Party 5 introduced and it's being kept here. So don't think you're guaranteed the minigame star if you've been winning every standard minigame. If a battle minigame comes out of nowhere and it contains a huge pot of coins, then losing that could cost you this bonus star. Are. Losing coins in the battle minigame will not affect this bonus star though. Our spaces for this title are Blue, Red, Happening, Duel, DK, Bowser, Miracle, and many capsule spaces which we'll cover in a later section. During the last 5 turns event, there's a chance that all blue and red spaces coin values will be tripled from 3 to 9. The hidden blocks in this game must have taken their name quite seriously considering they are nowhere to be seen. This is the first Mario Party to not include them, so if you're the kind of player to get a star in your first turn, then I'm sorry to say, not today. What this means is that unlike previous Mario Parties, you should not land on a blue space hoping a hidden block will appear. It never will, so don't base any of your plays on it. The best mechanic ever, dueling, now has its own dedicated space. Sure, it was a capsule you could place down back in Mario Party 5, but here it has firmly planted itself upon every board as a member of the space family. 
glad to have ya. When a player lands on it, they must choose an opponent to duel in a duel minigame. After this, the initiator will have the option to choose what will be dueled for, coins, or a singular star. The highest amount of coins the initiator can bet can't go over the least wealthy player's total amount. The maximum number of coins that can be bet in a duel is 99, even if both players are above that amount. Don't be dumb with what you bet. If you're right behind a star, then don't bet the amount of coins that would put you below purchasing that star. If you're looking to buy a certain orb, then don't bet the amount of coins that would make it so you can't afford the orb. Then again, the worry of betting too high only matters if you lose, right? So if you just, you know, get really good at dual minigames, then who cares how much you bet? You can have your opponent bet a star while you bet a bundle of coins in return. In this title, that amount is 40, which is 10 lower than the 50 coins Mario Party 5 priced it at. While this option may sound like a no-brainer, what you've got to consider is that on boards like Snowflake Lake and Fair Square, 40 coins can be worth a lot more than a singular star, something we'll get more into in the board section. As for the other four boards, I feel a lot more comfortable trading 40 coins for the potential of a star for my opponent. What isn't too well known about dual minigames in this title is that some of them only appear during the night. These minigames being Light Up My Night, Boot Off the Stage, Boonanza, Trick or Tree, and Something's Amiss. Use this knowledge to determine whether or not you want to engage someone in a duel in daytime or nighttime. And now it's what you've all been waiting for, the round of mir- CHANCE TIME! Are you watching me Mario Party devs? There's just no way you designed this tile's chance time the way you did without having watched my video on Mario Party 5 first. There's just no possible way. You have to be some kind of time travelers. You can't just... Alright, so... In Mario Party 5, it's chance time has the initiator role for who's on the left side, who's on the right side, and the trade. What we discovered is that the randomly generated trades have a huge bias for the player on the left. With that said, here we are in Mario Party 6. Everything looks about the same. The initiator rolls for who's on the left side, who's on the right side, and finally the trade. Through repeated testing, we can see that the trades still look to be randomly generated and the roulette still flips through them at the same impossible to time speed. What's different? I imagine that the devs must have looked back at Mario Party 5's chance time and felt somewhat bad for how incredibly rigged it was for the player on the left because that's the only explanation I can think of for why this chance time is unequivocally rigged for the player on the right. It's so rigged, in fact, that I don't even need to show you the repeated testing I did. You can watch the roulette shuffle and see with your own eyes that none of these trades purely benefit the left player. At least in Mario Party 5, the player getting screwed over had a chance at getting 20 coins, but they don't even get that anymore. Mario Party 5 rigged its trades in favor of the left player so that whoever used a chance time orb will have an advantage in the trade. While not a perfect reason, it's still a decent reason for rigging chance time. What's your excuse, Mario Party 6? Your chance time is completely one-sided in favor of the right player and with zero reasons for doing so. Was it guilt? Did you feel bad? I don't know, but what I do know is that the powerful trade options like the double star steal, star swapping, and swapping stars and coins will pop up no matter what turn it is or what placement the players are in. Unfortunately, there is no way to guarantee that you'll be the player on the right. All three roulettes simply roll by way too fast for any human to react to them. If you're in a bad situation, then as always, this space can help you out with the ever so powerful star swap or star and coin swap. And you know what the worst part is? This is the last chance time in a fully original Mario Party title. I can only imagine what kind of brand new chance time awaits us in the future. DK spaces are only around during the day, as they are replaced with Bowser spaces at night. Landing on the DK space will spawn the friendly ape, who will give you one of two events. DK bonus. DK lets you roll a barrel block to get coins equal to the amount shown. The possible results are 5, 10, 20, and 30. In addition, you can also get a star from this event. DK Minigame. All players participate in a minigame where they collect bananas. At the end, Donkey Kong gives everyone coins equal to the amount of bananas that they got by once, twice, or even thrice, as he converts the bananas into coins. Not 
sure how that exchange rate goes, but whatever. <laughs> While DK appears to be this all good space you always want to land on, that's not always the case. The DK minigames in this title aren't that difficult, and players are likely to receive a healthy amount of coins from each of them, meaning if a threat on the board needs just a few more coins to advance their game further, then triggering a DK minigame could be the last thing you need. It doesn't help that this event triggers more often than the DK bonus either. In terms of said bonus, you're very likely to end up much wealthier or in one further placing than you were before due to receiving a star. If DK space only triggered this event, then I would say try to land on his space as often as you can. But alas, I would avoid him if certain other players getting some coins would be harmful to my game. Landing on the Bowser space will spawn the King Koopa, who will gladly decide which event he wishes to put you through. Bowser minigame. Bowser will take half of the loser's coins, all of the loser's coins, or all of the loser's orbs while sparing the winners. This event is the most common one and what you should basically expect whenever someone lands on this space. The only other event that can occur is the Bowser bonus, where Bowser rolls his special dice block, which displays a certain number of coins or star. The amount he hits is what he steals from the player. The possible results in this dice block should look familiar because they're the same results as the ones in the DK bonus dice block. The clear difference here being that you're losing whatever's hit instead of gaining. Again, this event is unlikely to occur compared to the Bowser minigame event, but that doesn't really change how you should approach the Bowser spaces, right? WRONG! If you're great at Bowser minigames and unlikely to lose them, then you could purposely land on Bowser spaces in an attempt to make a threat in the game lose their coins or orbs. This kind of dastardly plan can backfire, of course, if you end up losing the Bowser minigame yourself, but that's why I specified you have to be great at them. If you land on Bowser with zero zero coins in your wallet, then he'll pity you enough to give you 10 coins. Battle minigames periodically appear in lieu of a 4 player minigame about 20% of the time. The amount of coins STOLEN from each player is determined via roulette. The possible results are 5, 10, 20, 30, and 50. The low values are more common during the first half of the game, whereas the high values are more common during the second half of the game. Once all coins have been gathered, every player will vote on which of the three battle minigames shown they would like to play. Whichever of the three receives the most votes is what's decided. If there's a tie, as in two minigames receive two votes each, then the game will choose the minigame that received zero votes, as though it's upset with you and your playmates' inability to cooperate. You'll often want to wait for the other players to vote on a minigame before voting yourself. This is because if two players vote for the same minigame and another player votes for a different minigame, then you now have the option of either voting along with the two players to select the minigame they wanted, or you could vote along with the one player so that the game selects the minigame no one wanted. If you're in a situation where no one wants to be the first one to vote, then it's probably because they have a certain minigame they want to be selected. Don't be afraid to ask and see if you can come to an agreement. Regardless, you should be considering which minigame you have the best chances of winning at and aim for that one selection. Mike minigames periodically appear in lieu of a 1v3 minigame about 20% of the time, but only if the mic is turned on or if the option to play mic games with the controller is selected. This title has 23 items, referred to as orbs, for players to obtain. Every time an orb is used, there's a small chance that it'll contain some coins, from as low as 2 to as high as 10. This occurrence is completely random and from what I've seen, not dependent on much of anything. So, should you use an orb in hopes that it'll give you the coins you need for an event on the board? I certainly wouldn't count it out, but relying on an unlikely occurrence like this isn't something I'd base my game on. Due to the existence of the orb star, using an orb every turn is already something you want to do regardless, so I treat these coins as more of a cute pick-me-up than something to be relied on. These eight are green orbs, these six are red orbs, these seven are yellow orbs, and these two are blue orbs. Each color has its own effects, which will be expanded upon later. In Mario Party 5, you could throw orbs 10 spaces ahead of you. In this title, you can only throw orbs 5 spaces ahead of you, but you can now throw 5 spaces behind you. Spaces that are included in this distance count are Blue, Red, Happening, Duel, DK, Bowser, Miracle, and Character. Orb, Star, and Shadow Star spaces are not included in the distance count. You can only throw orbs onto blue spaces, red spaces, or character spaces. Every other space not mentioned cannot have an orb thrown thrown onto it. Knowing these rules for orb placement and how the mechanics function will prevent you from getting caught off guard, wondering why you couldn't throw an orb to the spot you wanted. Each orb space in the previous title had an icon that alluded to or flat out told you which orb was on the space, but in this title, if it wasn't obvious already, a space's icon depicts 
depicts the owner of the space. While this makes it harder to know what effect an orb space has, it's still important information since you'll know which player benefits from that space activating. Side note, the owner cannot activate their own orb space. However, if they land on one they own, they will receive 5 coins. The item shop is back, and it brought not one, not two, but six item tables with it. One per board. Why didn't I specify item shop tables? Because not only do they supply info on how the item shops work, but also how the orb spaces work. Let's see an example of an item table with good old towering treetop. You'll notice that not all 23 orbs are on the table, and that's because only certain orbs appear on certain boards. Towering treetop here, like most boards, has around 11 orbs that have a chance to appear out of the 23 that exist. So knowing which orbs a board contains is a big deal. It'd be silly to focus on trying to obtain an orb that doesn't exist on the board you're playing on. Like if I really wanted a metal mushroom here, despite there being no chance for it to show up. The item shop will always hold three orbs, no more, no less. What it has in stock when you visit is dependent on your current placing and luck. Each item in stock has the placing's item chances applied to it. For example, if you're in fourth place and enter the item shop, then the first orb in stock has a 15% chance of being a super shroom, a 15% chance of being a sluggish shroom, a 10% chance of being a warp pipe, a 40% chance of being a flutter, and a 20% chance of being a thwomp. These chances are applied to each orb in stock. Repeats are allowed. The item shop's prices for each orb vary depending on your current placing. For example, if you're in second or third place and see a super shroom in stock, then it'll cost you the base amount of 15 coins to buy it. If you were in first place, then it would have cost you the expensive amount of 20 coins to buy it. If you were in fourth place, then it would have cost you the discount amount of 10 coins to buy it. Some orbs will vary more and some will vary less, such as the mushroom here, which costs 5 coins no matter which place you're in. The item shop actually has one more variable that it checks for before rolling for what orbs are in stock, and that's how many coins you have. The shop will never have an orb in stock that you cannot afford. Notice that no matter how many times this player visits the item shop, they can only find mushrooms and spinies. This is because the player only has 5 coins, and these two orbs are the only ones that said player can currently afford. Simply put, the game will only roll for the orbs that you can afford. If there's one that you can't afford, then the game will not roll for it. For example, let's say you're in 4th place and only have 10 coins. The item shop table says you have a 40% chance of the flutter orb showing up, but since you don't have enough coins to afford it, this 40% probability is not considered, and all the other orbs that you can afford are given an equally high chance of being randomly selected. Situations where one could take advantage of this quirk of the system is by purposely losing coins below a certain orb price threshold so that you have a higher chance of getting the orb you want. Other than niche scenarios like these, knowing that you're guaranteed certain orbs when you have a certain amount of coins, such as this mushroom and spiny example from earlier, can absolutely help out your game. If you have 4 coins or lower, then you will not be able to access the item shop. This would be the end of the item table explanation if we were just talking about the item shop, but this title introduced orb spaces, which grants any player that passes over one a free orb. The orb you receive from one of these spaces is dependent upon what turn the game is on and your current placing. For example, if the game is on turn 10 out of 20, then it's in the first half, and if you're in first place, then you'll receive one of these orbs, each having a higher or lower probability of showing up. Keep in mind that this is just one of six item tables. Tables. A lot of the numbers are different when you look between them, and you've also got to keep track of both the item shop and the orb space's probabilities. I should clarify before we start talking about the orbs that we won't be discussing the cursed mushroom orb since it doesn't appear in party mode. Green orbs affect the player or the dice block when the player uses them. They cannot be placed on the board. Mushroom Orb lets you move using two dice blocks. If the player rolls double sevens, then they'll receive 30 coins. Rolling a double of any other number will instead yield 10 coins. This orb shows up on every board, and really, why wouldn't it? It's the mushroom item, been here since the beginning. Its pricing is always 5 coins no matter what board you're on or what placing you're in. It's the most common orb to obtain from an orb space. There are, of course, scenarios where you have a higher chance of getting a different orb, but overall, this dude pops up the most. But just because it's a common orb doesn't mean you should use it just because you can. 
rolling two dice blocks is a big deal, so always be sure to count ahead on your possible routes whenever you have a mushroom in stock to see if giving yourself a boost would be a good play. The red orbs are your enemy when using a mushroom because they'll activate the moment you step on them. If a thwomp orb was placed a few spaces ahead of you, then using a mushroom to try and roll high is pointless because the thwomp will stop you in your path. If you have no way to get around it, then simply facing it head on with a regular dice block and then mushrooming after is a better move. We'll discuss the red orbs in detail soon. Super Shroom Orb lets you move using three dice blocks. If the player rolls triple sevens, then they'll receive 50 coins. Rolling a triple of any other number will instead yield 30 coins. Like the mushroom, the Super Shroom shows up on every board, and surprisingly enough, it's not all that uncommon. Orb spaces, no matter the board, will often give first and second place a higher chance of receiving a mushroom, with third and fourth place having a higher chance of receiving a Super Shroom. The clearest example of this is on EGAD's Garage, where in the second half of of a game, 4th place has a 0% chance of receiving a mushroom, but a 20% chance of receiving a super shroom. Likewise, 1st place has a 0% chance of receiving a super shroom, but a 10% chance of receiving a mushroom. This is some pretty straightforward game balancing that almost anyone can get behind, but please don't assume every orb's chances of appearing will make the same amount of sense as our mushrooms here. There are some questionable decisions that were made, I assure you. The super shroom costs 20 coins for 1st place, 15 for 2nd and 3rd place and 10 coins for fourth place. You might assume that if you're in first that you probably have a lot of coins anyway so spending 20 isn't a big deal but there will always be those times where the player in first has a lot of stars but no coins. If you're in this position then spending 20 of them on a super shroom may prevent you from purchasing the next star you come across unless you're confident that you'll win the next minigame. The lower prices of 15 and 10 are much more reasonable especially if you've got coins to spare. Blasting ahead with triple dice blocks is always fun, but not if you pass over an enemy's red orb space. So check the map in earnest beforehand, lest you want to lose some coins or get stopped in place by a thwomp. Sluggish Shroom Orb lets your dice block roll slowly in ascending order, allowing you to choose which number you roll if you time your jump, which is not hard to do. You've just got to jump a little before the number you want shows up. Getting to basically choose which number you roll in a board game just sounds broken, doesn't it? If I get this bad boy, then I can hold on to him until I reach a space that could change the entire outcome of the game, like a chance time space, and just choose to land on it. Or hey, if I need to duel a certain player for the star, then I can just choose to land on them during the final five turns, or land on a duel space. It doesn't matter. Maybe there's not even a specific space I want to land on. Maybe I just feel like rolling high. Well, I can just roll an easy 10 and be done with it. An item like this you'd expect to cost a lot at the item shop, but no. The priciest it gets is 15 coins if you're in first place. It's 10 if you're in second or third, and 5 if you're in fourth. The fact that this item has a decent chance of even showing up for first place is kind of bonkers. Oh, and look here, on Towering Treetop, it actually has a pretty decent chance of showing up on the orb space for any placement. Now, you might be thinking that some boards don't have it, right? But no, it's available on every board, with a pretty decent chance of showing up in the item shop or orb space no matter your placement. Oh, I'm sorry, not no matter your placement, because on a board like Fair Square, you have a higher chance of getting a sluggish room in the second half of the game if you're in first place than second place. And if you're in third or fourth, you have a 0% chance of this thing showing up. But that might be because there's somehow a better orb for those placings, right? Let's look. Third or fourth place has a higher chance of getting a piranha plant and potaboo. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather have an item that lets me basically choose which space I'd like to land on up to 10 than either of these boys. Piranha plant could be useful though. <laughs> Point B being, the Sluggish Shroom is a fantastically versatile item that you will always find a use for in your inventory. Whereas some items may be hard to use because you're saving them for a good move to make, the Sluggish Shroom suffers from the opposite problem, where there are so many good moves to make with it that you might be paralyzed with fear trying to decipher which one is the best. This is the kind of item that can decide games in the end, so if you have one in tow, then always check the map and go over which 10 spaces you can land on in every direction are and how each one would affect the course of your game. I swear, I need this guy in the reverse mushroom to duke it out or something. They're both too broken. <laughs>
Metal Mushroom Orb lets you encase yourself in metal and move without being harmed by rival's traps. It doesn't matter which trap it is, the Metal Mushroom is unstoppable and will prevent any foe's red orb space from affecting you no matter what. The coolest part about this orb is how many unique animations there are for negating your foe's traps while you're in your suit of metal. I'm so glad that extra effort went into this. In a world where zaps can obliterate your coins, paratroopers can switch up your location, and thwomps can halt your movement before a star space, the Metal Mushroom Mushroom will be a valuable companion on your quest towards super stardom, at least only on Egad's Garage, Snowflake Lake, and Clockwork Castle, as those are the only boards you can find this metal menace on, with one specific exception that we'll cover later on. When it does, it's 15 coins for first place, 10 coins for second and third place, and 5 coins for fourth place, which isn't bad at all and well worth purchasing if you can afford it, especially if you're in one of the later placings, cause I hate to say it, but Egad's Garage and Snowflake Lake prefer first and second place obtaining this orb at the orb space over third and fourth place. I guess the devs decide to treat this orb as counterplay that the higher placings can use to defend themselves from the lower placings, which makes some sense, but please take this into account when you're at a lower placing yourself, since you're unlikely to receive this orb for free. When it comes to using it, do so when you feel that you're in real danger of stepping over a foe's trap. Only use it otherwise if you're adamant about raising your orb count for the orb bonus star. There will be some give and take here where you may want to use it at a poor time to increase your orb count, but would like to use it later when you're close to a trap an opponent laid out. As always, you've got to weigh the pros and cons, trying to determine which outcome would help you out in the long run. More often than not though, I'll find myself using a metal mushroom before moving towards a thwomp space, especially if it's preventing me from reaching the star. I should further clarify that the metal mushroom does not protect you from any orb space that requires you to land in their space to activate them, so you can't defend against any of the yellow orbs such as piranha plants, spinies, and so on. Just the red orbs that activate when you step on them. Bullet Bill Orb lets you roll a 1 to 10 dice block, and if you pass or land in the same space as an opponent, then you'll steal 20 coins from them. This is one of those hit or miss orbs where you could use it and end up stealing 60 coins in one turn if everyone's in front of you, or nothing at all if people are always far away or you just end up rolling low. It only shows up on Egad's Garage and Fair Square, where you can purchase it for 30 coins if you're in first place, 20 coins if you're in second or third, and 15 coins if you're in fourth place. Please keep in mind that this orb only steals 20 coins if you manage to arrive at an opponent's space with it, and there's a decent possibility that you might roll low and steal nothing if there are a little further away from you. Unless there's some amazing setup in front of me where I may be able to steal from multiple players, I would not spend any coins to purchase this orb from the shop. If I'm using it, then I probably got it from an orb space, which never grants it to first or second place, so, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be getting it very often. I'm not saying this orb is awful by any means, by the way, but it's definitely inconsistent, and requires you to use it at the right opportunity to maximize its usefulness. Sure, gaining as many coins as possible is great, but think about the fact that you'd be deleting 20 coins from an opponent in front of you. If you're both close to the star or an item shop, then you could ruin their next move by not leaving them with enough to buy what they wanted. Warp Pipe Orb lets you switch places with whoever the Wheel of Chance chooses. While you may be tempted to treat this roulette's timing similar to that of Mario Party 5's roulette, don't. They change the timing. To get the pointer to land on the character you want in this title, you must press the A button when it's hovering over the character that's one space behind your target. So if I wanted to land on the top right character, then I'd press A the instant the arrow is over the top left character. The pointer can be a bit tough to time at first, but do it enough times and you'll get it to stop on a dime. If an entire minute passes before you press A, then the game will get fed up with how long it's taking you and stop the arrow for you. Funny enough, it will always stop the arrow on the bottom character. So if you're aiming for the bottom character and you want a 100% guarantee of nailing them, then wait out that minute. Who cares who you're annoying by doing so? By the way, this roulette functions the same no matter which event it pops up for, so the moment you see this pretty design, remember your timings. This orb only shows up on Snowflake Lake, Castaway Bay, and Towering Treetop. On the latter two boards, it can get a bit pricey for first place with this cost of 20 coins, but don't 
don't let that amount scare you. It's much better spending coins in a warp pipe if that means it'll help you avoid losing a star to Bowser in Castaway Bay, and if you get the timing down, then you can put a big threat in your awful position so they'll lose a star instead. These are how game-winning moves are made. A similar situation can happen in Towering Treetop, where you can choose to swap with someone that's right behind Boo so you can steal instead of them. Snowflake Lake prices this orb a bit cheaper for first place at 15 coins, which is interesting because I'd argue that this is the board where the pipe will be at its most useful. You're constantly checking your surroundings to ensure that your opponents can't chomp your stars away, so having a warp pipe in hand to flip your fate onto someone else is a great idea. This item's reliability wholly depends on whether or not you're good at timing the roulette. If you're proficient at it, then grab this pipe when you're able to. If you're garbage at timing it, then this is still a good grab, but be more wary about where you're using it so you don't accidentally help out a threat. Flutter Orb lets you summon Flutter, who will fly you straight to the star space. This magic lamp ripoff only appears on Towering Treetop and EGAD's Garage, likely because they're the only boards without any gimmicky star spaces. First place has a 0% chance for this item to show up for them in the item shop, as well as a no percent chance for getting it at an orb space. Which makes sense, it'd be ridiculous if first place, who's already ahead, could buy an item that easily lets them further their lead, right? <sighs> Second and third, however, are given the honor of summoning Flutter, but they've got to cough up 30 coins to do it. Add that to the cost of the star and you'd be paying 50 coins total for that sucker, which will thin your wallet out a bit. Despite this bank account scare, purchasing the Flutter should be considered. Do you have enough coins to afford it? If so, will you be able to afford the star after? Is the star close by to where a threat is? If you answer yes to all of these questions, then you should buy, especially if you're in fourth place and it only costs 20 coins to to do so. The only times I wouldn't buy it in this situation is if someone would steal it for me the turn after, if I was about to lose all of my orbs anyways, or if I need to keep my coins high for a boost steal or to duel for a star. If none of those scenarios apply, I'd fly to the star easy peasy. Red orbs take effect when an opponent either passes or lands on them. If a player lands on one, it'll still have the effects of a blue or red space. The orb disappears once it's been activated. What makes these types of orbs so useful is that they cannot be replaced by other orbs, which means that they will eventually activate unless one was placed where a star spawns. Potaboo Orb. Any opponent who passes it loses 10 coins. This is a simple, albeit useful effect. You can place this lad behind a star so that anyone shooting for one will have to suffer a 10 coin loss, which could potentially lower their wallet's amount below 20, thereby screwing them out of a star. You could also place them behind Pink Boo to reduce the chances of someone making a power play or item shop so that your foe's wallets hurt even more. Using this capsule on a player with a ridiculously high coin amount tends to not be worth it since they'll likely be able to purchase whatever they want even after getting minus 10. I'd only target the millionaire in the match if I needed to beat them out in coins by the time end game rolls around. Otherwise, I'd prevent other players from making moves that could threaten my game, such as someone moving to Pink Boo who's made it clear that they want to steal from me. This fireball can be in EGAD's Garage, Fair Square, Snowflake Lake for some reason, and Castaway Bay. In rare cases, it can't be obtained by first or second place, but most of the time, all placements have a decent chance of obtaining one from an orb space. At the shop, you can purchase it for a measly 5 coins if you're in second place or below. Keeping one of these in your inventory just in case is well worth the cheap price. Zap Orb. Any opponent who passes it loses 5 coins for every space he moves past it. So if you were to place this orb directly in front of a threat and they roll a 10, then they will lose 5 coins 10 times in a row for a total of 50 coins lost. There is a chance that they may just roll a 1 or a 2, thereby minimizing the effects of this orb, but in that case, they just rolled a really low number, so either they go nowhere or lose a bunch of coins. <laughs> Due to the severity of this orb's effect, it can also act as a deterrent for Mushroom and Super Shroom orbs. Very few people will choose to roll double or triple dice blocks knowing that every space they move with such a high roll will delete 5 of their coins, thereby pressuring them into not moving a high amount of spaces and just rolling normally so that they don't zap away their entire wallet. I'm sure there are people out there that are totally willing to roll multiple dice blocks regardless 
this either out of spite or because they need to get to a certain space despite zeroing out their coins. I salute these poor souls. Obviously, zap orbs aren't effective at all against players that already have zero coins, so just don't place them in front of broke players. The only real counter to this chad is the metal mushroom, which can save you from the excruciating pain of losing so many coins. This really goes to show just how useful it is to have one in your inventory in case your opponents get rather aggressive with their orb placements. But you would of course love to have the zap orb in your inventory too. It can only be found in EGAD's garage in fair square. It's quite rare to find it from an orb space considering its many low 0% and 5% drop rates. You're more likely to spot it in the item shop where it sells for as low as 10 coins for 4th place to as high as 20 coins for 1st. This amount is absolutely warranted considering just how effective it is at crippling your opponents. This orb is a priority purchase in my book. If I have coins to spare, I'm buying it. Twister Orb. Any opponent who passes it will be blown away to another space, and by that it means any blue or red space, no other types. Whereas Potaboo, placed behind a star, has a chance of preventing a foe from purchasing it by reducing their coins, a Twister will absolutely prevent them from purchasing it by throwing them to a different space in the board. It's main problem, as you might have guessed, is its unpredictability. Sure, you can toss a threat away from something they want, but you may inadvertently place them in an even better position than before. You also have to consider that this orb does not function like a thwomp. Players affected by it can still move after being twistered, so if they get dropped off behind something good, then they can likely access it granted they rolled high enough. When deciding if you should place this orb in front of a threat, you need to consider if blowing them to a different space in the the board is worth the risk. You don't want to become your worst enemy. This orb only shows up on Snowflake Lake and Clockwork Castle. Whereas the latter lets players of all placings obtain the orb in pretty much every scenario, the former only lets fourth place buy it in the item shop. You might assume that this is the dev's way of giving fourth place a better shot at pulling ahead since this orb is pretty good on Snowflake Lake, but fourth has a 0% chance of getting this orb from an orb space. Not sure what the goal was here. Regardless, it's rather cheap in the item shop, only going for 5 coins unless you're first place. Having one in your inventory can be good for either of these boards if you want to gamble in trying to put a threat in a bad position, such as tossing them in front of another player's chain chop or in the path of Bowser. Thwomp Orb. Any opponent who passes it will get thwomped and must stop moving. This orb is mean. Place it a single space away from a threat when they're in a position to further their game, such as buying a star. It doesn't matter if they roll a 1, 15, or 30. When that thwomp slams down, they will stop moving and suffer the Mario Party 6 equivalent of losing a turn. This can, of course, get negated by a metal mushroom, which is why you should always be keeping your foe's orbs in mind so that you don't accidentally waste this swamp on someone that was easily able to avoid their doom. This lug appears on Towering Treetop, Fair Square, and Clockwork Castle. It has a fairly high chance of appearing from almost all of the possible pulls, and its cost in the item shop ain't half bad either. Although I would only pay first place's 15 coin cost if the much cheaper 5 coin cost mushroom wasn't available. Stopping an opponent in their tracks is good, but not so good to pass up rolling 2 dice blocks for 10 less coins. Well, most of the time. Babam Orb! Any opponent who passes it will go half the spaces they have left to move, rounded down. So if a player has 5 spaces left to move, then the Babam will leave them with just 2. Frankly, I see the Babam as a worse version of the Thwomp. With the latter, you can stop an opponent right in their tracks, whereas with the former here, it lets the opponent continue moving spaces after activation. I just can't think of a situation where that effect would be better than stopping them immediately. If this orb was immune to the Metal Mushroom or forced the player to take a random route while under the effects of it, then I could see scenarios where you'd want it over the Thwomp, but as it is now, it's just a Thwomp wannabe. Sorry, dude. Thankfully, it only appears in Egan's garage and Castaway Bay, the former of which it has an abysmally low chance of appearing in, and the latter of which you might actually see it pop up. Interestingly enough, the Babam and Thwomp can't be found on the same board together. What if the devs thought that letting the Thwomp be on these boards would be too overpowered, so they decided to put in a nerfed version of it in the form of this Babam orb instead? I know that sounds crazy, but I just really can't wrap my head around this item's existence. Obviously, don't buy it if it's in the shop. 
Paratrooper Orb, my favorite orb in the game. Its effect is simple but powerful. It causes the user to switch places with any opponent that passes it. So if you throw it down in 5 turns later or on the other side of the board when someone comes into contact with it, then you'll both switch places. To get the most use out of it, you need to recognize what spots on the board might be useful to you in the future. Other than a player using a metal mushroom to bypass it, this orb does have a downside and it's the wonderful variable of unpredictability. And most cases when you place this orb down, you have no idea when it'll be activated. Someone could pass it in the next turn with a high roll or in many turns from now if they keep rolling low. Heck, if you place it after a junction, then this orb may get activated way later in the game due to people taking the route that avoids it. These factors can absolutely cause this orb to backfire on you, where you're in a great position to make a move and now someone decided to pass it. That's just great. It's for this reason you need to observe where everyone is before you place the orb down. This will give you a decent idea of when it'll be activated and about how far away you'll be when you and your opponent swap places. This orb can be found in Egad's Garage, Snowflake Lake, and Clockwork Castle. It's on the rarer side, not showing up much in the item shop or from any of the orb spaces. If you do happen to see it in the item shop and know how to use it properly, then it can be a powerful purchase. Yellow orbs take effect when a player lands on them. If the owner lands on the space, they receive 5 coins. During the last 5 turn event, the owner will receive 15 coins if the coins times 3 roulette was chosen. The orb also stays on the board as long as no one replaces the orb or if a star space doesn't appear on it. That last part is crucial. A few of these orbs effects may appear weak at first, but they make up for it by remaining on the board even after they've been activated. Place them earlier on in the game so that they have more turns and therefore more opportunities to have their effects activated. If you want them to activate as often as possible, then place them on the main path of the board, where your opponents can't avoid it. Spiny Orb. Any opponent who lands in it will lose 10 coins. This is the yellow orb equivalent of the Potaboo, which also makes an opponent lose 10 coins. The obvious downside here being that an opponent must land on this orb to activate it instead of merely passing it. This orb has potential to deal some damage if it gets activated multiple times over the course of a game, but there are other yellow orbs that just do its job better. It shows up on Towering Treetops, Snowflake Lake, Castaway Bay, and Clockwork Castle with an average chance of appearing in the item shop or at an orb space. Its cost of the item shop is low, but I just can't see myself buying this over a mushroom, super shroom, sluggish shroom, metal mushroom, thwomp, and pretty much anything else. Maybe I'll purchase it if I'm playing on Castaway Bay, since that board has a lot of straight lines to take advantage of. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother, and if it popped into my inventory, then I'd try and place it where the most traffic is. Goomba Orb. Any foe who lands on it hits a dice block that determines how many coins they give you. The possible amounts are 3, 5, 10, 15, and 20. There's an equal chance for each result to appear. This orb functions differently than the Spiny, Potaboo, and Zap orbs from before in that you obtain the coins from the person that landed on it. This effect can be fantastic if the Goomba rolls 10 or higher, which it has a 60% chance to to do. On the other hand, it may end up rolling a 3 or a 5, which is less game-changing. It appears on Towering Treetop, Ecad's Garage, and Fair Square, and is a fairly common pull all around. I'd buy it if I had the spare coins and place it directly on the main path. This is the kind of orb that pays for itself after a few players land on it, so choose a great spot for it and watch your opponent's frustration as they're forced to donate to your foundation. Piranha Plan Orb. Any opponent who lands on it must give you half of their coins. This plan existed in the previous title, but there you could activate them yourself and lose half of your coins, whereas here you can't screw yourself over by landing on your own space. Also in the previous title, the coins the victim lost just went into the abyss, whereas here they go to the space's owner. Talk about an upgrade! It appears in Ecad's Garage, Fair Square, Snowflake Lake, and Clockwork Castle. Okay, hold on a moment. How in the world is this plant perfectly growing in ice? steel, and concrete. That's absolutely ridiculous. What makes this even more confusing is how this plant can't be found in towering treetop and castaway bay. You know, the two boards with actual soil found on the pathways. <laughs> Whatever, man. It has an average chance of appearing from orb spaces, with some placings having no chance at all for seeing it appear. You'll more often see it at the item shop going for as low as 10 coins for 4th place and as high as 20 coins for 1st. If 
if you've already got a mushroom and have coins to spare, then adding this orb to your inventory can ruin other players' games if their coin count is high. Even if someone only has around 20 coins, that amount getting cut in half will prevent them from purchasing a star, so the orb will end up being useful regardless. The power this orb possesses makes it a target to get replaced though, so don't throw it down within 5 spaces of someone or they'll just end up saving themselves the trouble of dealing with it. If you see a piranha plant orb up to 5 spaces ahead of you, then replace it immediately unless you need to hold on to the orb in your inventory. Losing half of your coins is no joke on its own, but giving those coins to another player is absolutely devastating. Klepto Orb. Any opponent who lands in it will be sent back to the star space. This orb potentially helping out an opponent is what makes it so unreliable. Sure, the Tweezer has a chance of helping out an opponent too, but you can at least guarantee who will pass it and somewhat control when it will be activated. With Klepto here, you can't force a particular individual to activate it since it needs to be landed on, which also means that tons of turns could pass without any activation, thereby leaving it up to chance on whether or not it'll actually hurt a player's game. It's at its most unreliable in EGAD's Garage, a traditional board where being sent back to start isn't a huge deal and can help you in the long run if the stars spawn close to you or if you'd like to visit the item shop. Castaway Bay, the only other place this orb can appear on, is a one-way path board where players need to reach the end in order to obtain a star. To deal the most amount of damage, I'd place this orb near the end of this board's paths, so that any unlucky soul that lands in it has to travel tons of spaces once more if they want any hope at buying a star. But even in this specific scenario, it can end up helping an opponent. What if Bowser's ship is at the end of the path? Your foe landing on your orb space would actually help them in avoiding the big bad star steal punishment. All this said, I can't in good conscience recommend purchasing this orb at the item shop. Yeah, its price is cheap, but there are just much better orbs to buy. Only nab it if you need something to use to up your orb count. Toady Orb. Take an orb from an opponent who lands on it. If a player has multiple orbs in their inventory, then the toady will take one at random. Not one of my favorites, but if placed in a good spot, this orb can be quite useful by keeping your orb stock up and your opponents down. What I find most unfortunate about it is that it isn't available on boards where it'd be most useful. Wouldn't it be nice for someone's snack orb or a boo away orb to be stolen so that they won't have any protection? Well, tough luck, because the toady orb doesn't appear on Towering Treetop, Snowflake Lake, or Castaway Bay. If it did, then I'd praise it, but it can only be found in Fair Square and Clockwork Castle. It cannot be found in Fair Square Shop. You can only obtain it via orb spaces here. Not sure what influenced this decision, since I don't think it's overpowered at all in a place like this. Maybe the devs we're just trying to make room for other orbs. Clockwork Castle Shop does sell it though, and it has an average chance of showing up. Thankfully, its cost is cheap, so if your opponents are skilled and buying great orbs for themselves, then grabbing one of these and throwing it onto the main path could help cripple the competition. Kamek Orb. If an opponent lands on it, you get one of the orbs they've placed on the board. Interesting. So we have an orb that can steal a player's orb from their inventory, and an orb that can steal a player's orb space. To see how effective Kamek is, we've got to take a look on the boards it appears on, Towering Treetop and Egad's Garage. Let's start with the trees. The possible orb spaces that you can steal are Spinies, Goombas, Kameks, and Thwomps. That's... An incredibly disappointing list. If you could steal a zap space or a piranha plant space, then I'd give Kamek here a bit more credit, but as it stands right now, I just don't think the potential steal targets make this item worth it. I'd say you shouldn't purchase it, but it looks like the devs got me covered since you can't. It only shows up to first and second place via orb spaces. If you happen to pull one, then you may as well place it down in the best spot you can. The garage's potential for orb space steals is crazy. Not only are piranha plants and zaps up for grabs, but there's a wider range of potential orbs to nab in general. Kamek is definitely Definitely a lot more powerful here than in Towering Treetop, especially since you can actually purchase one from the item shop if it happens to pop up while you're in first or second place. Is it worth buying? If you have the coins to spare, since it can be a real nuisance for the players trying to catch up, having their orb spaces taken away from them. Mr. Blizzard Orb. If an opponent lands on it, they'll lose all of their orbs. Just like we did with Toadie and Kamek, let's check out which boards this orb can be found on. And when doing so, we find that it can't appear on Snow. Snowflake Lake, are you serious? So the piranha plant can be found in this snow themed board, but not the snowman? If not there, then where, oh where, can the snowman be found? We've got Egad's Garage, which I guess I can pass off as a manufactured snow kind of deal, but then 
There's Castaway Bay. Castaway Bay, the tropical themed board. The snowman can be found on a tropical themed board. It's not even like we're high in altitude here. We're on the coast, where I presume Mr. Blizzard feels most comfortable showing up at. Whatever melts his boat, man. It can't be purchased in the garage, but can be purchased in the bay. Considering Ekad's garage has quite a few orb spaces clocking in at 7, Mr. Blizzard can really hurt the competition by freezing away some orbs. At the bay, he can do the job I wanted Toadie to do, that being deleting a person's boo away orb to make them vulnerable. Despite the damage he can do, I don't see myself gunning for this orb when I see it in the shop. I'd much rather purchase a boo away orb or mushroom to protect myself or better control my movement respectively. Blue orbs protect you from either Boo or Chain Chomp. They cannot be thrown onto a space or used like the other orb types. Instead, they're used automatically, but they can be trashed at any time if you wish to free up your inventory. Or for the meme. <laughs> the Snack Orb's the one that prevents a Chain Chomp from stealing from you. It can only be found in Snowflake Lake, where only 2nd and 4th place have a chance at seeing it at the item shop. Why did they skip third place? What about this orb makes the devs think only the second and fourth placements deserve to buy it? Regardless, if you see it, then buy it. It's a must-have item that you always want in your inventory, especially because it's only 10 coins and can't be obtained from an orb space during the first half of the game. You'll feel great when someone tries stealing a star or two from you when you have this in stock. It can really mean the difference between winning and losing. The Boo Away Orb is the one that prevents a Boo from stealing from you. As said before, each of the blue orbs are used automatically, so if you have a Boo Away Orb, for example, and someone decides to steal coins, from you, your orb will get used up. You can't say no and hold on to it until someone decides to steal a star, which is probably for the better so that players can more easily fight back against those in higher placements. It can only be found in Towering Treetop and Castaway Bay, with only first and third place having a chance at seeing it in the item shop. Okay, so now second and fourth place are getting screwed over here. What's going on? Are the devs just screwing with us? I have no clue. Just like the snack orb, if you see this flashlight, then buy it. It's great protection can't be obtained by an orb space during the first half of the game. You don't want to end up giving coins to another player, or worse, a star. Let your mind be at ease. Once five turns remain, the final five turns event will commence. The event is hosted by Brighton during the day and Twilia by night, but the difference is purely cosmetic. Whoever's hosting will give the current standings and then let the player in last spin a bonus wheel, which rolls too fast to time, giving them one of the following. Blue and red spaces are worth triple the number of coins, so players gain or lose 9 coins, as well as gaining 15 coins when landing on one of their own character spaces. Don't be too afraid to get a bit more risky with your coins if this one is selected. Recall that this title does not have a coin bonus star, so unless you're trying to beat out another player in coins, feel free to use what you have to get ahead. Receive 40 coins, the most simple result of all, the last place player gets 40 coins. Is it good? depends on the board. I'd be happy to get this if I was playing on Snowflake Lake or Fair Square since coins are pretty valuable on those boards. Five of their character spaces are added to the board. These character spaces can pop up on blue spaces or red spaces. They will only replace other players' character spaces if there are no other regular blue spaces or red spaces to occupy. This event is pretty cool and gives you quite the edge, granted the right orbs are placed in the right spots. There may come a time where a path you wanted a threat to take gets populated with your character spaces, which would be a rare case of this event backfiring, but it's still possible. This event can only spawn orb spaces whose orbs appear on the current board's item table. Bowser Revolution! You thought it was gone, but nope! It was, for some reason, moved from the Bowser event to this final 5 turns event. Did the devs think it was too powerful? Not sure, but anyways, in this event Bowser takes everyone's coins and splits them evenly among all the players. While this event can be scary if you have a lot of coins, don't burn what you have assuming that it's gonna be picked. The other three events have a pretty even chance of being selected, but this one is rarer because it shows up on the roulette less frequently. Again, I wish I could say that this roulette was easily timeable, but there's no point in even talking about it due to how fast it shuffles. Regardless of what the roulette selects, if one player lands on the same space as another, then they will trigger a duel minigame, allowed to wager whatever they like. We already talked about how powerful duels can be, and with another method to trigger them, it's something you may want to take advantage of by having a sluggish room in style. 
stock. If you see a threat that needs to go down, then you can purposely land on their space and challenge them to a duel. Before we move on to the board section, I'd like to inform you that most of my advice will pertain to the board itself. We'd be here forever if I covered every possible orb placement for every space. Each board you play on in a game will have a different layout of orb spaces from the last, and that's something you need to adapt to yourself by applying what you know about how each orb works. What will probably make the biggest difference in your games is keeping track of what each orb space effect is. You can't rely on the space's icon anymore since it now only shows who the owner is, meaning you've got to do your best to remember what your opponent placed down so that you can gauge the pros and cons of different options. Don't be afraid to ask everyone but the owner of a space about what kind of orb was placed down. Chances are they'll tell you, or just lie. <laughs> I can do that too. Looks like we've fallen into Towering Treetop. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the least amount of blue spaces at 41. Remember the star spaces? Because they sure remember you. Let's remind ourselves once more how the star space works. On Towering Treetop and Egad's Garage, when you buy a star, the star space itself will move to another random location. However, only certain spaces have been programmed to host a star. We refer to these spaces as star spaces. When a star space isn't active, it'll look like your average blue space. Let's say you're smack dab in the middle of a game. You remember that these four star spaces have been deactivated, and you notice that the current active star space is this one. With that being the scenario, where, oh where, will the next star pop up? It's here, since all the other spots are either currently deactivated or will deactivate after its star has been purchased. But there's one extra quirk that this title star spaces have, and it makes keeping track of them a lot easier. Let's say that this was the order the star spaces activated in. Once they've all been activated, the game will simply repeat that same order over and over again. The same goes for Egad's Garage, which only has five star spaces. It'll randomly activate one star space after another, but once they've all been activated, that same order will keep repeating. With this, I can confidently say that Mario Party 6 has the easiest traditional star spaces to keep track of in the series. All you need to do is memorize the order that the stars popped up in, and after they've all popped up, then you'll know exactly where to place yourself for the next one. You'll look like a prophet to those that don't know the secret. Unfortunately, as said before, Towering Treetop and Egan's Garage are the only boards in this game with traditional star space mechanics. But hey, whenever you play on them, you now know what to do. Here's this board's item table once more. The happening space behind the start forces the player to use a big feather to tickle the giant tree's nose in order to have it sneeze. If the tree sneezes, then its intensity will cause players to drop from the space they were on to a different one below them. This graph depicts which spaces can be fallen from along with which spaces can be fallen onto. For example, if you're on this red space up here when the tree sneezes, then you'll always fall down to this blue space. If you're on any of these three spaces before the slide when the tree sneezes, then you'll always fall onto this red space. You heard that right, some spaces share the same fall destination, making it a little easier to keep track of which space leads where. You may have noticed that some spaces don't have anywhere for a player to fall onto, such as the ones on ground level, obviously, and the ones higher up on the sides. Players that are on these spaces while the sneezing event activates will not fall to a lower space and will instead remain where they are. If you press the A button below 6 inputs, then the tree will not sneeze. Sneeze. If you press the A button at least six times, then the tree will have a large chance of sneezing so long as there's at least one player on a space that can be fallen from. If there are no players on any spaces that can be fallen from, such as the ones on ground level, then the tree will not sneeze. To reduce the chances of the tree still not sneezing despite these requirements being fulfilled, make sure you're hitting A as quickly as possible. The more A presses, the less likely the tree is going to have that frustrating feeling of needing to sneeze but not being able to. With this information, you'll have a great grasp on knowing when to make the tree sneeze to screw over other players and when not to so that they stay where they are. For example, if a threat's approaching Pink Boo, then make the tree sneeze so that they fall all the way down to this lower path. Is a threat getting too close to the star? Make him fall to increase your odds of getting it instead. While it'd be optimal to know where every space leads to when fallen from, it can be a pain trying to memorize them all. A good rule of thumb to follow is that all higher up spaces on the main tree structure, that being only the spaces actually connected to the tree, 
will cause a player to fall to the space that's directly below them. The largest downside to this event is that you can't view the map before tickling the tree's nose, meaning you've got to remember where everyone is to know if it's worth making them fall or not. It's for this reason that you should check all players' locations prior to rolling if there's a chance you'll activate this event. As you can imagine, any event where you can control which routes multiple players are on is very powerful, so you want to know exactly how it works and have as much information as possible when deciding if you should follow through with it. The happening space left of the beehive gives players the choice to ride one of three fluffs for free. Whatever fluff they choose takes them to one of four possible spaces on the board. Sadly, it doesn't matter which fluff you choose. They all have an equal amount of taking you to one of the four possible landing spots, of which there's one on the left one up top, one on the right, and one on the bottom. I wish each fluff had a higher chance of taking you to certain ones, but from my testing, they seem content with dropping you anywhere. When deciding whether or not you should even take a fluff to begin with, check where the star is and remember the possible landing spots. If it looks like your odds of obtaining the star are better by taking a chance, then go for it. You could also use this event to try and get closer to Pink Boo if you need to make a big play. If you're not feeling it, then decline the ride and move on. At least you'd be getting one step closer to the happy star, the happening space at the top of the board has two functions, depending on what time of day it is. If it's daytime, the player sees Woody, who showers coins on all the spaces and players. He's quite generous, so some players can see themselves gaining over 10 coins from this happening alone. This can be great for you if you needed the extra cash, but gifting everyone else some coins as well can cause disaster in the long run, especially if that was the extra oomph that someone needed to be able to afford a steal using pink Boo. Be cautious when activating it, and only aim to do so if your opponents wouldn't greatly benefit from such an offering. If it's nighttime, the player sees Waruki, <laughs> Wa Warukio, who makes spiny eggs rain down on all spaces and players, who lose coins during the shower. The amount of coins lost tends to be around 5, which is lower than the average amount of coins gained during the woody version of this event. Guess the devs wanted to take it easy on us. If you already have a great amount of coins, then deleting some from your foes sounds like a good move to me. I'd much rather have everyone take the L than everyone take the dub. If it's daytime, then the pink flower at the left of the board will be in bloom, allowing players to bounce up to a route that they can't access during the night. Likewise, if it's nighttime, then the blue flower at the right of the board will be in bloom, allowing players to bounce up to a route that they can't access during the day. We'll discuss these two routes momentarily, but first, let's take a look at the main route. Unless a player keeps fluffing themselves to the left, which is unlikely, everyone will eventually have to cross these spaces no matter where they choose to go, making them great candidates to place your spiny, goomba, and kamek orbs on. This also means that if you can't afford to lose anything, then replace a player's orb that's been placed here. Shouldn't be too difficult considering you just got an orb from the orb space after sliding down. This is also a great place to use a mushroom or super shroom so that you can skip the inevitable orb spaces that players place down. Also because this is a bit of a dry spot in the board, containing no star spaces, junctions, item shops, or pink boots. This junction's right path quickly loops back to the main path, but that doesn't doesn't mean it's useless, it contains two star spaces, an item shop, and four happening spaces. If you're desperate to up your happening count, then take this route and try this out. Use a sluggish room to land on the fluff happening and decline it. When your next turn rolls about, all you need to do is roll a 3, 4, 5, or 10 to land on another happening space. That's a 40% chance. Not bad for trying to land on two happening spaces in a row. This doesn't even take into account the possibility of landing on this blue space or red space, which allows you to take another go at the 40% chance of landing on a happening space on your next turn. To purposely execute this strat, as said before, you need the sluggish room, so make sure you have one in stock before attempting it. The left path while daytime has a dual space and orb space. Not bad. Sure, it doesn't grant you immediate access to an item shop like the right path does, but the next junction's top route throws one in your face the moment you take it. What about this right route, though? It can contains a star space and a chance time space. If your game's been feeling off and you'd like a chance at chance time, then chance it all by landing on it. I wouldn't go on this route unless a star space urged me to suddenly detour that way. The earlier Junction's nighttime route puts you three spaces away from Bowser, which is the same amount of spaces from Bowser that this Junction's right route is. So no matter which one you choose, if you have three spaces remaining, you're kinda screwed. Not very nice. It's pretty clear that this nighttime route isn't as good as the daytime one, which makes sense 
sense. I guess the devs wanted the special route to be clearly better. The right route of this higher up junction leads to a dual space, orb space, star space, and pink boo. That's a lot. The top route's great too, offering an orb space, chance time space, a happening space, and two star spaces. While at first glance these routes appear to be equal, their power varies depending on whether it's daytime or nighttime. Pink Boo isn't available during the day, making the right route a little weaker while the sun's out. But you know who likes the sun? DK, whose space here can only be accessed if you take the top route. There's also the higher possibility of there being a star up here since this route contains two star spaces as opposed to the right route's one. Pink Boo is plenty available during the night though, working to the right route's benefit. The ability to steal a star for 40 coins is incredible and can be a real game changer if your threat doesn't have a Boo Away orb to protect themselves. Stealing coins is great too and should always be done if you can afford it, unless you don't want to incur the wrath of any of your opponents. This right route also helps you avoid the Bowser space that the top route has to deal with during the night, making this path a safer bet while the moon's out. Watching for which players are close to reaching Pink Boo or a star will help you determine whether or not you want to warp pipe with them. It's one thing to deny them from stealing a star or buying one, but it's another to put yourself in the position to benefit from it. Considering how spread out the star spaces are and the potential for your movement to be affected, Flutter's a great orb to use here if you're able to afford it. Placing Thwomps before stars is a classic, but placing one before Pink Boo is a way of denying another player planning a steal. You don't need me to tell you just how useful Boo Away orbs are. If one appears in the shop, then buy it immediately. Overall, Towering Treetop can appear a little daunting at first due to its varying junctions and difference in power between them based on the time of day, but if you learn when certain routes are at their most powerful and get a handle of powerful happening events such as the Fluff or Sneeze, then you'll find yourself navigating this board with ease. We are now entering Egad's Garage. If this place is his garage, then I can't fathom what his house looks like. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of happening spaces at 10. Here are its 5 star spaces mentioned earlier. This low amount of star spaces combined with how they repeat the same cycle over and over makes it extremely easy to have a great idea or flat out predict where the next star will be, which raises the skill ceiling for orb play by quite a bit. Here's this board's item table, the largest one in the game. Landing on a happening space on a conveyor belt causes it to move, sending all players on the conveyor to the space in front of the first junction. There are three conveyor belts total. Each one has two sides to it, which it switches between whenever it's activated. You might think you've got to memorize each side now, but nope, it's actually quite simple. Every time a switch happens, blue spaces turn to red spaces, red spaces turn to blue spaces, and happening spaces stay in the same spot. Nice and easy. Any character spaces on a conveyor belt will be destroyed upon switching sides. They will not come back by switching again. This means you need to be aware that any orb you place down on a conveyor belt has the potential to go to waste if a player lands on that conveyor belt's happening space. When a conveyor belt is activated and all players on it are sent to this space, then all players affected by the event will receive some coins. The low conveyor belt awards around 4 to 6 coins, the mid conveyor belt awards around 8 to 10 coins, and the high conveyor belt awards around 9 to 12 coins. Upping your happening count and receiving a healthy amount of coins is a pretty sweet deal on its own, but you're also placed directly behind a junction, where you can go to the orb shop or head up to the other junction. The obvious downside to this event is the possibility that you were in a great position that you were just moved out of. What if you were way up here, ready to nab the star, just to roll low and get sent back to the beginning? That'd be a bummer! This is why you want to have a mushroom or super shroom in stock so that you can avoid landing on these happenings when they wouldn't benefit you at all. If you activate a happening space on the low or high conveyor belts, then they'll switch sides, which we already know, but if you activate the mid conveyor belt's happening space, then not only will it switch sides, but it'll cause the low conveyor belt to switch sides as well. Keep in mind that this only works one way. As said before, the low conveyor belt happening only affects the low conveyor belt, making this a fun little quirk of the conveyor belts that may not see much use in real gameplay, but is a good detail to keep in mind in the rare scenario that it actually ends up affecting the game. Someone could be on the low conveyor belt while you're on the mid one. If you're trying to screw them over, then you could sluggish room to activate the mid one so that both of you get sent backwards. There are three teleportation units, with a happening space next to each one. 
Landing on one of the three makes EGAD appear to ask the player if they want to use the teleportation unit. Accepting will let the player go in and be teleported to the teleporter it's linked to. The teleporters are linked as follows. West to Northeast, Northeast to Southeast, and Southeast to West. Each link will stay the same no matter what. There is no event that changes or alters where each teleporter leads. They are perfectly consistent, and because of that, it makes it easy for you to take advantage of them. See a star spawn on the left side of the board while you're over here on the bottom right side? Use a sluggish room to land on the teleporter, warp over, and get the star your next turn. If it wasn't already obvious, the sluggish room is a fantastic item on this board due to the conveyor belt and teleporter happening events, which affect movement, and if you're consistently moving to where you want to be in a Mario Party game, then you're probably winning. Stock up on a sluggish room whenever possible. Back to the teleporters. You'll notice that every teleporter, not just the northwest one, has a star space in front of it, meaning there's a great chance that if you land on the right teleporter space that you'll end up right behind the star that you need. These other two star spaces are further away from the teleporters, with the top one still being somewhat close to the northwest one and the middle star space just being in no man's land. Never underestimate the power of warping around the map, even when you don't consider star spaces, since they can help you avoid deadly orb spaces that your opponents have laid out for you. The happening space in front of the giant fan makes EGAD appear to ask if the player wants to use the Wealth Suckage Apparatus. Quite the name. Accepting lets the player use it to suck coins away from the other players. The other players have to tap A as quickly as possible in order to save as many coins as possible. This event isn't affected by placements or what turn the game is on. Each player on the receiving end of this event will be given a random number from around 7 to 10, which indicates how many coins they'll lose if they don't press A at all. If they press A at a quick pace, then they can prevent a coin or two from being stolen. If they press A really fast, then they can prevent up to 5 coins from being stolen. It seems like the rate at which you can prevent coins from being stolen is a little inconsistent, where even pressing it super fast doesn't always prevent more from getting sucked away. But through repeated testing, it does have a higher rate of success than only a few A presses or none at all. If you're the one that activated this event, then lucky you! Unless everyone is completely broke, you're likely to receive upwards of 20 or more coins from them. It's like having Boo steal from everyone without having to pay him. You have the option of saying no to stealing coins, and there is a situation where this might be a good move. What if there's a threat that you don't want buying the star, and a non-threat is right next to it as well? Using this event could potentially screw over the non-threat and let the threat get away with the star. This kind of scenario is a little unlikely, but this stuff happens. Check out the map before activating this event, and keep in mind the possibilities before suctioning up a great amount of coins. The happening space next to the rocket ship summons EGAD to ask the player if they want to use his Calamity Launcher to put character spaces on the board for them. The number of coins paid determines how many character spaces will be placed. Only orbs that appear on this board can be launched from the Calamity Launcher, so it can never launch a warp pipe for example, since that orb can't be found on this board. Orbs can land on any empty blue space or red space, meaning it can't replace a character space unless there are no more empty blue spaces or red spaces available. Not like that little tidbit's too big of a deal though, since the prices for using this contraption are outrageous. It starts with 10 coins per orb if you're only launching one, to 15 coins per orb when launching two, then 20 coins per orb when launching three, 25 coins per orb when launching four, and finally 30 coins coins per orb when launching 5. The value you're getting per orb as you launch more and more is a ripoff, and that's not even mentioning the two main problems. The first being that you don't even get to choose what orb is launched, let alone know what orb was launched since all you see is your character symbol. The only info you can gather is if it's a yellow orb or a red orb, based on where the symbol's positioned, but that's all you can figure out. It could be a Goomba, Piranha Plant, who knows? You sure don't. The second problem is that you don't get to choose where an orb is launched, meaning EGAD could fling those suckers onto a conveyor belt, and we've already discussed how that could be bad. Heck, the fact that he basically refuses to override any other character space should tell you how mean this machine is. The icing on the cake here is that this is a happening space event. If it was instead an event that you could just pass by and activate whenever you wanted, then I could kinda see why it was designed in such an odd way, but considering you have to land on a single space that's not even on the main path, 
this dude just leaves me scratching my head wondering if he's gone insane. I've never selected the set 5 option, let alone the set 4 or set 3 options. This goes for other players too, I just never see it. Most of the time when I land here, I'll immediately quit out or set only 1 or 2 orbs if I have the extra cash. I can only see myself setting more than 2 orbs if I have a lot of coins to spare and we're playing a game that's longer than 20 turns, since then you're getting more bang for your buck that way. Am I being too harsh in this event? Possibly, I'm sure if you get lucky with what orb is placed down where, then it could wreak havoc on players, but I prefer saving my coins and choosing which orb I want and placing it where I want on my own. If I were designing this machine, then I'd make it so any orbs launched from it count towards your orb bonus star. That would make this event a bit more interesting with how many coins you'd have to spend if you can even land on the happening space to begin with. The last two happening spaces are located next to the huge structure shaped like EGAD. Again, landing on one of these calls the professor down to ask the player if they want to use the machine. During the day, the structure is known as the Shuffleotron, which allows players to put all their orbs in the machine, transforming them into different orbs. Any orb can transform into any other orb, no matter what place you're in or what turn the game is on. You could be in first place, throw in a Goomba, and it'll evolve into a Flutter. Heck, this machine can spit out multiple of the same orb, so you could throw in two Goombas and get two Flutters. I assumed that some of the orbs would have a higher chance of popping out than other ones, but through repeated tests it seems like all orbs have a fairly equal chance of popping out. What's better is that this event has two happening spaces that can activate it, so you're more likely to encounter it in a game, and the event is free. What's the downside? You have to throw all of your orbs into the machine, or none at all. So if you have one orb you want to hold on to, but two that you don't, then you need to decide for yourself if you think it's worth it to sacrifice all of them for a shuffle around, or keep what you have. Consider if the orbs in your inventory are going to be of use to you next turn or in the near future. If at least two of them won't be, then you should shuffle them around for a chance at receiving something more valuable. During the night, if accepted, the player puts all their orbs in what's now the Orb Morpher, which transforms their orbs into coins. The amount of coins an orb turns into is based on what it's worth at the item shop. But Zoomzike, an item's value at the shop, differs based on what placing the shopper is in. Does that mean that the coins received from this event also differ based on what placing you're in? That's absolutely correct. So if someone in first place were to throw a Super Shroom into this machine, then based on the item shop chart, how many coins do you think they'd receive? 20's the answer I'm baiting you into saying, when in reality, it's actually 10. Yeah, any orb that first place throws in here won't receive the first place item shop value of the orb, but the fourth place item shop value of the orb. And when you think about it, it makes sense. It'd be silly for first place to get way more coins out of an event than fourth place, so doing it this way balances things out. Here's how this event affects the other placings. Second place will receive this second and third place item shop value of the orb, third place will receive the first place item shop value of the orb, and fourth place will also receive the first place item shop value of the orb. So let's do this again. You're in third place, activate this event, and throw in a mushroom, super shroom, and sluggish shroom. How many coins total will you receive? 40. Since you're in third, you'll receive the first place item shop value of the Mushroom, Super Shroom, and Sluggish Shroom, which is 5, 20, and 15 respectively, added up to 40. This quirk of the Orb Morpher means that it's a lot more powerful when used by third and fourth place than the higher placements. Like, if you're in fourth place and throw in a Flutter, Bullet Bill, and Super Shroom, then you're gonna walk away with 100 coins! Jeez! Obviously, you've got to consider if exchanging all the orbs in your inventory is worth the coin payoff, and honestly, it won't be worth it most of the time. Throwing away all your orbs is risky, since you're willingly going a turn without using an orb, which is going to reduce your orb count for the orb bonus star. And that's not even taking into account that the orbs in your inventory could be greatly useful for your situation or will be useful in the near future. I certainly wouldn't throw away any orbs in here if I was in first or second, but if I was in third or fourth and my current orbs kinda suck, then getting a ton of coins in return doesn't sound like a bad deal. Whenever the time of day shifts, this middle platform will rotate a quarter clockwise. When a game starts, it will always be in this position, where the left route leads up, the right route leads down, and the chance time space is on the top left. When the time of day shifts for the first time and the platform rotates a quarter clockwise, it'll look like this, where the left route now leads down, the right route now leads up, 
and the chance time space is on the top right. The rotation after that leaves us with a similar layout to the first, except now the chance time space is on the bottom right. This final rotation leaves us with a similar layout to the second, except now the chance time space is on the bottom left. The platform will repeat this same process of rotating a quarter clockwise every time of day shift. The fact that each rotation of the platform changes where two routes go makes this mechanic an especially important one to keep track of. What if you're trying to travel to the top right part of the board by cutting through the middle here? If the platform rotates before you pass through, then you'll end up going the complete wrong way. It's for this reason you shouldn't be afraid to pause to check how many turns are left before the time of day changes. That'll let you know how many turns are left before the platform rotates, which gives you useful information on what pathways will be available to you and when and where certain spaces will be. Speaking of spaces, any character spaces on the platform will remain after the platform rotates, unlike the conveyor belt discussed earlier, so feel free to throw down orbs onto this mechanism, there's no worry about the game ripping them away from you. Character spaces aside, there's a star space on this platform, which can be tricky to follow with how it rotates, which is why, again, knowing exactly how many turns away it is from rotating a quarter clockwise will give you an advantage in obtaining this star when it pops up. Having a mushroom or super shroom in stock will help you out the most in covering the distance necessary when trying to travel to this platform in time. If you're in a situation where you want to delay reaching the platform, then you could throw a paratrooper ore behind you and hope a player passes it in time for you to swap places with them. You could also use a sluggish room to manipulate your movement by giving yourself a low roll, but frankly these sluggish lads are much better used when landing on key spaces such as happenings, chance times, and duels. I'm not saying that using a sluggish to slow yourself down before the platform rotates is a bad play, but it's certainly not a position I'd like to be in since I prefer saving them for the spaces I mentioned earlier. This board is fairly non-linear, as in there's not really a main route that you will cross every time you loop around. There's just too many junctions and shenanigans you can get up to that'll let you avoid dangerous pathways. If I had to choose a path that I'd say is the hardest to avoid, then I'd go with this stretch of land on the left. Two junctions lead there, these two conveyor belts drop you right before said junctions, and it's necessary to enter if you want to reach the top of the board, unless you teleport there, of course. Why so much focus on finding a path that players will cross through? Because that lets us know where the best places to throw down their orbs are, of course. If you're gonna plant a piranha which can steal half of a player's coins for you, then you want to set that trap in a place where it's most likely to be activated, and these five spaces before the teleporter happening are great candidates for that. This space right before the star and this space right after these two happenings are also good spots to place an orb due to the difficulty of avoiding them. Placing the orb on a star space is often a bad move because it'll get deleted as soon as the star spawns there. I wouldn't do this unless I was in a position where I needed to have even a small chance of a threat landing on one of my spaces, even if it's going to get deleted a little later. Placing an orb on the platform is great too since it's a nice shortcut path that experienced players will take advantage of, and if you can set up some traps there then they'll either be punished or think twice about taking it. If you plan on heading to the left side of the board, then you should almost always head left on this junction since it leads you into an item shop. Going up and then left will save you a space, sure, but getting to visit the shop is a powerful move in case you can grab something great for your situation. If your inventory is already full, then feel free to head up on this junction and then left to save yourself the extra space. This junction's up path has a decent chance of landing you on a happening space to up your happening count and gift you some coins. Unless you need to get to the higher part of the board quickly, landing on either of these happenings tends to be worth it. If you aren't going to land on either, then this path is a great shortcut to the middle platform, which could be leading you to the higher conveyor belt where you have access to the top of the board, or it'll have you loop back to the junction you just exited. This isn't all bad since you'll get a free orb out of it and could possibly be going for a star, landing on chance time, or a dual space. This loop around also puts you in a good position to farm the conveyor belt happening spaces if you're close to getting the happening star. This top left junction's right path is in a similar situation, where its value is dependent on how the platform is oriented and what your current goals are. If you're aiming for chance time, this happening on the top conveyor belt, or a star that spawned here, then this path is gonna look pretty good to you. There's also the possibility of you wanting to loop back around to the beginning. Most of the time though, I end up choosing the top path since it can 
contains an item shop, a DK space, if it's daytime, the suckage happening, and a potential star space. It is one space longer than cutting through the middle though, and sometimes you're one space away from a game-changing move, but you've also got to consider that this top path skips the top conveyor belt happening, which if landed on, completely destroys any hopes you had at reaching the top part of the board since it plops you down right at the bottom. This bottom junction's left route could either loop you back around the top or send you to the bottom part of the board. The former is good if this top right star just spawned and you need to make your way back there. Looping around could also assist in upping your happening count due to there being four happening spaces on this route alone. For the latter, if the platform's sending you down, that'll cause you to skip a second orb space, two happening spaces, a potential star space, a DK space if it's daytime, and the path to the item shop since you'll be on this upper route. The only advantage it brings that the other route doesn't is possibly landing on the dual space, chance time space, and saving you one space distance-wise. So unless those situations apply or the stars spawn in this path, it's almost always better to head down so that you can take advantage of all the item and happening opportunities it provides. If no one's around, then placing a zap on one of these two blue spaces is a pretty good move, since if someone lands on a conveyor belt happening and gets sent back to this blue space, then they'll be directly behind your zap, forced to either take the full brunt of it or take the alternate route. Flutter can be great here if you have the coins to afford them, but don't underestimate the power of mushrooms and well-placed paratroopas. Overall, EGAD's Garage is a well-made but wacky board where you've got to keep track of the middle platform's movements and use the board's plenty happening spaces to your advantage in order to become the superstar of some dude's garage. <laughs> it ain't so fair over at Fair Square. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of red spaces at 11. Here's this board's item table. Fair Square only has one star space that can always be found here in the middle. It will never move. Players are given the option of purchasing up to five stars if they can afford it upon reaching this space. During the day, Brighton gives out stars that cost 20 coins each, meaning if you wanted to purchase five of them, you'd have to shell out 100 coins from your wallet. During the night, Twilia gives out stars for a random price that she decides by hitting a dice block. The price will either be 40, 30, 10, or 5 coins. If stars end up being 5 coins a pop, then you could buy 5 of them for a mere 25 coins, which is a ridiculous steal! Even the possibility of a star being worth 10 coins a pop is crazy, since you could get 5 of them for 50 coins. It's this little mechanic here that can make this board completely broken, since if only one player manages to reach the star space while stars are so cheap, then they'll likely reap an enormous lead over their competition, leaving everyone else scratching their heads trying to figure out how they're supposed to close what's at least a 5 star gap now that the stars are worth 20 coins a pop again. This situation happens fairly often and is the main reason why so many people detest playing this board. Overall, Fair Square is not a board I recommend going to, unless most of the players don't care about getting curb stomped or have a good idea on how to properly handle this gimmick. <sighs> If it wasn't clear already, this board is a giant circle. I mean, it doesn't look like a circle, it actually has points and edges like that of a star, but you get what I mean, you go in a circle. And that's most evident where the star is in the middle. If you really wanted to, you could spend the entire game in this circle, going round and round, buying stars whenever they're cheap, or at least that's what it feels like you can do on paper. In reality, the devs thought ahead and placed a womp here that blocks you from running in circles. He charges 10 coins for anyone who wishes to pass, and pays that cost really adds up over time. If you're looking to return to this inner circle without paying this fee, you can instead take this junction's top route and the following junction's bottom route. This path is 13 spaces long as opposed to the Womps 2, which makes this path sound atrocious, but coin management is essential on this board. You do not want to miss out on purchasing an extra star due to having a low coin count. Making this decision of paying the Womp to pass an important one if you're while it isn't bursting at the seams. This board has quite the low amount of happening spaces with a whopping four. 
which may cause you to think that nothing much goes on here, but that would be a mistake considering two of this board's events can be activated at any time by merely passing them. When players go by the big chest at the left side of the board, they're given the choice of paying coins to play the slot game, a 5 coin price during the day and a 10 coin price during the night. The player receives coins based on which pictures they line up. During the day, coins are worth 10 coins, mushrooms are worth 15 coins, and fire flowers are worth 20 coins. During the night, those coin values are doubled. Where coins are worth 20 coins, mushrooms are worth 30 coins, and fire flowers are worth 40 coins. Lining up chests will give the players all the coins that were saved up from players' past payments, similar to how the Koopa Bank works from previous titles. The pattern for each slot is the same every time, meaning you can practice the timing for each one so that you can get the picture you want for the maximum amount of coin gain. In most cases, that max amount will be the Fire Flower, which is the highest for both daytime and nighttime, unless a lot of players have played this machine already and have raised the jackpot value. Unless you're playing a pretty long game, I find that the chess value doesn't get too high either because players simply don't do this event enough or they line up the three chests before it gets to a noteworthy amount. In most cases, I'll aim for the Fire Flower, which there are two of in each slot. You might assume that getting all three of a picture in a row is difficult and that you should shoot for a picture that has two of its kind in a row, such as the coin. But don't be discouraged. This slot machine actually wants you to win. For the first slot, it plays as you expect it to. You press A and the slot stops in the picture that was there when you pressed. For the second slot, so long as you're within two pictures before what you got on the first one, in this case a Fire Flower, then despite not pressing A at the exact right time, the machine will keep spinning and land on your target. This is also true for the third slot. All you've got to do is either land on what you previously got, or at most, two pictures before your target. This leniency does not apply to pressing the A button after what you got on the first slot. So in this case, if the Fire Flower passes by and then you press A, then you're going to get whatever you pressed A on. Take advantage of the leverage this machine gives you by observing what pictures come before the one you want, and pressing A as soon as those pictures enter your vision. Luckily, our Fire Flower friend here has two coin pictures that precede it, so the moment you see them on the second slot, press A. The third slot goes rather quick, but the same logic applies. Press A as soon as you see the two coins in a row, and I know that the two coins here are actually more than two spaces behind the Fire Flower, but considering how fast this slot goes, reacting to these two coins' appearance is essential as it'll stop you either on the first Fire Flower if you're quick, or the second which comes right after if you're a little slower. Again, you could shoot for the chest, but I'd only do so if the amount is rather high or there's a threat behind you that you desperately want to prevent from getting any coins. Because remember, this event can be activated by merely passing it, so its doors are open to anybody. When players go to the hat-shaped building on the right side of the board, they have the option of playing a hat shell game called the Star Shuffle, where the price is one star to play. The star is placed in one of the hats, and they will shuffle around for a while. During the day, there are three hats to choose from that shuffle slowly, and guessing correctly rewards the player with two stars. At night, there are six hats that shuffle quickly, and if the player guesses right, they'll get three stars. If the player makes a wrong choice in either day or night versions, they'll lose the star that they wagered. This is a high-risk, high-reward game that you should always take in the daytime, unless you're absolutely terrible at tracking this kind of stuff. It's only three hats that'll do one of two kinds of shuffling. One is a simple switching maneuver, where two hats in the circle quickly swap places with one another, then a different pair of two hats, and so on until they get bored. This is really easy to keep track of. I don't see many people having trouble with it. The second kind of shuffling they'll do is spin in a circle round and round, sometimes reversing their direction. It's here where I see players sometimes lose track of the one they were following. Keep a close eye on the hat with your star in it. Follow it in a circle over and over again. The speed doesn't increase or decrease at all. You only really need to worry about it reversing, because them stopping to switch to the other shuffle isn't a big deal. If you beat this game, then you'll get your star back and an additional one for your keen eye. If we're talking about the nighttime version, then I advise against playing it unless you're really confident in your tracking skills or simply won't win the game unless 
you take a big risk. Doubling the amount of hats from 3 to 6 already makes this game harder than its daytime counterpart, but this version goes further by increasing the speed of both shuffles. The hat switching is still pretty doable, yeah, but watching them spin in circles is enough to make you dizzy. I've done this little game plenty of times, and I still sometimes have trouble tracking where in the world my target hat is after a few spin rotations. Them reversing actually makes things a little easier here since they slow down for a moment when they do, but if you get bad RNG and they perform a lot of rotations in a row, then you probably won't have a good time. That 2 star reward is really nice though, especially on a board like this where an opponent can have an insurmountable lead due to buying tons of stars at a cheap price. If you don't want to be left behind in a situation like that, or want an extra trick up your sleeve to obliterate your competition, then practice this game, the nighttime version mainly, over and over again until you're confident that you're a magician. Those were the pass by events, now let's move on to the happening spaces. Landing on the one in the top left building makes a broom fly out of the window and takes the player either either one space before the star space or one space after it. The odds appear to be 50-50 regardless of a player's placing or what turn the game is on, making this happening an incredibly useful tool if you're desperate to reach the star space in time. You could use a sluggish room to purposely land on it and hope you flip the coin right so that you can easily purchase a star your next turn, bypassing all those spaces you would have had to cross, some of which likely contained a lot of players' traps. We do have to consider the possibility that this broom's delivery service will drop you after the star space, in which case that certainly isn't optimal, but you're still within 12 spaces of it if you end up taking the Womp route. Even if the situation ends up happening, you still upped your happening count by one, which in a board with only four happenings is great. The two happening spaces on the top right building will make players go inside and they are transported back to this space at the start. While yes, I said earlier that landing on a happening space is good, these ones in particular are a little mean considering they come right before the hat switching event. I would never purposely land on these happening spaces unless we're at the end game or I didn't have any stars on me to play the hat switching game, cause honestly bonus stars matter the least on this board out of any other one in this game, and securing an extra star or two from this magical event over here is well worth it. Keep a mushroom or super shroom in stock so that you can reduce your chances of being screwed out of upping your star count. The happening space at the top of the board will start a game of chance that involves all players. During the day, players give up 10 coins each. Then, one by one, they choose the chimney which they think will produce the tallest plant. When all are picked, the plants reveal themselves, and the tallest plant gives the player that picked it all the coins that were put into the pot. Literally, the, the pot, okay. At night, the game is the same, but players give up one star each. The winner ends up with all the stars given. While yeah, getting 10 coins from every player is great and all, getting a star from every player is absolutely insane. But unlike that one sweet dream happening for Mario Party 5, this happening event is completely luck based. Yup, I'm happy to say that there is no indication of which chimney will produce the tallest plant, which is phenomenal, cause if there was a tell, then I'd lose my mind over how broken the space would be during the nighttime. If you're afraid of giving someone the lead by landing on this event during the nighttime, then don't fret, it's optional. So if you're way in the lead, just say no to planting anything and move on. If you're behind though, then you could shake up the competition by forcing everyone to participate in some fun chance event. I leave that decision up to you. Normally, I'd observe the board for a main route that players are bound to cross, but due to this board's gimmick, you should focus laying your orbs down in the inner circle where the star space is. Throw a piranha plant here! Heck, throw two! Three even! I've seen players get absolutely shredded by orbs in this section due to how often they have to visit it. This place is also where the bullet bill shines, since people tend to get clumped here all clamoring for a star, especially if the price is low, allowing you to steal 20 coins a piece from the fools. The last orb that can deal a lot of damage here is the Thwomp, which if placed directly behind the star space can prevent a player from purchasing any stars that turn, and with what we've learned about how one could potentially be in a situation where they could buy 5 stars with only 25 coins, stalling someone for one turn until it's daytime can be a game changing move. These deadly orb plays in this circle is also why the Metal Mushroom Orb is fantastic here, or you know it would be if it existed on this board, but it doesn't, so seriously, 
fill this circle with chaos. You will reap the benefits and reduce the chances of a player blasting ahead in star count. Most of the junctions on this board are really short and simply let you enter or exit the inner circle. The circle's first exit drops you by a dual space and lets you try out the slots on the left or potentially land on this happening space. If you aren't aiming for any of these, then you're probably better off taking the second exit, where you can either enter back into the circle later on or make your way to the hat switching game in hopes of obtaining another star or two. You might feel uncomfortable with this move considering you're getting pretty far away from the inner circle, but the bottom right junction here lets you enter it just a few spaces before the star space, which can be great, especially if it lets you skip some of the orb spaces the other players threw down. This junction is also where chance time is, so if you've got a sluggish room and luck is on your side, then take your shot here. Otherwise, you could head down to get back to the main route, where you've got to walk another 32 spaces before reaching another junction. On second thought, heading down on this part without a mushroom or super shroom is going to waste you a lot of time. I could maybe see it if you need to stock up on items by walking by this orb space and visiting the item shop, but even then, this long journey before being able to enter the inner circle again is painful and will likely take you at least three turns to complete, which is an entire day or night cycle. What if it's currently daytime, you go down and then it switches to nighttime, where stars are now worth only 5 or 10 coins apiece. Without any mushrooms to spring ahead, you're gonna be missing out while the competition's enjoying their luxuries. It's for these reasons I almost never head down in this junction and instead enter the inner circle, where I have a lot more options, such as the star space, exiting at the first junction, exiting at the second junction, or looping back around. Overall, fair square can feel incredibly unfair if one player reaps the benefits of a low star cost. If you can make sure that player is you and not others by flooding the inner circle with well-placed traps and upping your star count further via the hat switching game, then you'll find yourself on top of it all. Things are a bit shaky over at Snowflake Lakey. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of dual spaces at Eight, which is insane, but we'll talk more on that later. Here's this board's item table. There are no star spaces on this board. Heck, this wasteland is devoid of any stars whatsoever. Instead, each player starts with five stars or more, depending on the number of star handicaps, and the objective of the board is to steal stars from the other players by riding chain chomps. There are four dog houses on the board, and when a player reaches one, they have the option of paying coins to ride a chain chomp. During during the daytime, players can ride chain chomps at the cost of 20 coins for a dice block and move that many spaces from the doghouse. For every player that the chain chomp passes, a star is stolen from the victim and is given to the player riding the chain chomp. At night, players can purchase up to 3 dice blocks per ride, with each one costing 10 coins. Although this board has no stars, additional stars can be received from the DK space via Donkey Kong's bonus game. Other than that though, the stars everyone starts with is all there is. As you can imagine, this gimmick completely turns the game on its head, forcing you to think about how you and other players move around in a much different way than before. So to combat this novelty, let's learn about how these chompies work. You don't have to outright pass a player to steal a star from them. Even landing on their space will do. If you come across multiple players on the same space, then you'll steal a star from each of them, which can be fantastic if you manage to pull it off. If you pass a red orb space while on a chomp, then it won't activate, but if you land on its space, then it still won't activate, even though the chain chomps disappeared, thus creating a rare situation where a player can take their turn while on an opponent's red orb space. Intentional or not, this little detail's pretty funny. Landing on a regular orb space after having ridden a chain chomp will activate its effect though. That red orb detail might call into question how good they are on a board like this, cause what's the point of throwing them down if they can't stop another player on a chain chomp, right? That's simply looking at things from the wrong perspective. You want to put these orbs in places that'll affect players before they get onto a chain chomp. For example, if you're directly in front of a doghouse, scared of losing a star to whoever rides the bad boy, you could throw down a twister orb right before the entrance so that any potential attacker will get blown away somewhere else, thereby protecting your rear. In fact, screw the twister, if you throw down a paratroopa orb behind a doghouse, then any player that runs into it will switch 
places with you, which is fantastic because that means you'll be ready to ride a Chain Chomp even if you roll a 1. The only way this really backfires is if you were in a position to steal a star from another player and got thrown to a doghouse with no players in front of it, granting the player that activated your Paratroopa a favorable position. But this is a risk I'll often take due to how powerful it can be to not only deny someone of a star stealing position, but granting yourself that position in return. I'd place a paratrooper before every doghouse except this bottom right one if I can help it. Why? Because it's the only doghouse that has a junction you can take to avoid the paratrooper regardless of the time of day via this Womp, which charges players 10 coins to pass. And I don't know about you, but I definitely pay 10 coins to avoid giving a threat a star stealing position. Every other doghouse has a junction at most a couple spaces before it, sure, but here's the thing. Chilies block them off during nighttime, forming a 30 space long path that players cannot exit from until they reach the Womp Junction, and that's only if they pay him the 10 coin fee. But Zoomzike, you only roll one dice block when riding a Chain Chomp, so it ain't so bad, right? Oh, you poor child. That's only during the daytime. Recall that during the night, players can roll up to three dice blocks for only 30 coins, making this 30 space zone an absolute bloodbath for those that fall victim to it. I am dead serious when I say this is where most games on this board are won and lost. You do not want to be stuck on this route while a player is riding a chain chomp, which is why you need to know how to protect yourself. The first method is what we already discussed with the Tweester and Paratroopa orbs. Place them directly before one of the three doghouses so that you can prevent a player from reaching a great position. Another method is using a movement orb, such as a mushroom or a super shroom, to blast way far ahead of a threat so they can't reach you. On the other hand, blasting ahead could let you reach a doghouse to, in turn, obliterate your opponents. So always be aware of where the next doghouse is and how close the other players are to it in case they're in a vulnerable position. Mushrooms aside, you can warp pipe yourself with another player for the same reason you'd throw down a paratroopa, to give someone else your bad position and grant yourself their good one. The snack orb, which we talked about a while ago, prevents a chain chomp from stealing from you one time. Keep in mind that it doesn't get rid of the chain chomp, it merely forces it to skip your space. It'll be free to continue its path of destruction, perfectly able to steal from any other player it comes across, unless they also have a snack orb. If you're on the same space as another player with a snack orb, and a chain chomp comes towards you guys, then their snack orb will not only protect them from losing a star, but you as well, since again, it causes the chomp to skip that space, period. So if you're in a bad situation where a player behind you is getting ready to chomp your star away, but there's a player ahead of you with a snack orb in their inventory, then try to land on that player's space so that you can also benefit from their snack orb. You can more easily accomplish this by using a sluggish room to purposely land on their space, thereby guaranteeing your safety as long as they've already moved that turn. Yet another way to protect yourself from a chomp is to land on either of these two happening spaces up top, which will make a snowman throw a large snowball that will roll from this blue space all the way to this red space, capturing any players that are in the way and taking them back to the start. While returning to the start isn't my preferred method of avoiding someone on a chain chomp, I'd certainly sluggish room to do so if I didn't have any other option. Even without the threat of losing a star, transporting yourself to the opposite side of the board while also upping your happen account is a pretty sweet deal if it sets you up in a better position than the one you were in. Such an example would be if some opponents were on the bottom of the board, which would allow you to potentially steal multiple stars using this doghouse here, especially if it's nighttime, and honestly keeping track of the day-night cycle on this board is gravely important. There's a big difference between an opponent rolling a single dice block with a chain chomp versus rolling up to three, so ensure that you always know how many turns are left for the current time of day so that you can prepare appropriately for what's coming next. Landing on a happening space next to the frozen pond activates a coin game. During the day, Brighton will toss down coins to the players for 15 seconds. The amount of total coins thrown down adds up to 30. Your aim is to skate around and collect as many coins as you can. Touching a wall does nothing, but if you touch another player, then you'll bump into one another and each get stunned for a second, wasting time that could have been spent on gathering coins. This is why you should focus on coins that drop close to you, and avoid skidding towards coins that you know other players are going to grab 
have before you. The penalty is only a second though, which isn't too harsh, so don't be afraid to contest a group of coins if you think you can make it there before your opponents. Recall that it takes 30 coins to roll 3 dice blocks on a chain chomp at night, so you want as many coins as possible so that you'll always be ready to steal your opponent's stars with an absurdly high roll. This advice, of course, goes for your opponents too, which is why if there's a threat that needs a few more coins to guarantee that they can roll more dice blocks with a chain chomp, then you should target them. How? By repeatedly skating into them. Sure, you'll both get a second of invulnerability, but once it wears off, you can just bump into them again, reducing their chances of gathering the coins they need to make a big play. When activating this event at night, players throw snowballs at each other to knock coins out of them for the taking. These aren't coins that magically pop out of thin air, by the way. They're coins that come straight from your wallet, with each snowball knocking out about 3 to 4 coins. Hence why you must avoid any snowballs thrown your way to prevent the loss of your goods in a second of stun time. When it comes to offense, you can launch snowballs pretty quickly, throw them at your opponents and quickly grab the coins that pop out. Heck, grab the coins that pop out of the players that other people hit. There's no rule against stealing the coins others were trying to steal. Going for the coins in the ground will likely make it easy to get a clean shot on you though, so be careful as your greedy self cleans up the snow of all the money. If there's a threat that you really need to lose quite a few coins, then repeatedly launch snowballs at them. And if it's seriously crucial that they lose a lot, then don't even bother picking up what they drop. Just keep firing snowballs their way so that they're put in an awful position. The only downside to this strategy is that there's a second of invincibility you're given after being hit. So if your target's coins aren't picked up by anyone, then they can reclaim them in time by using their invincibility. This is unlikely to happen since most of the time players will run rampant for the coins that drop. But if you notice that your target just keeps reclaiming their own coins, then start taking them for yourself before they can. The daytime version of this event only has two happening spaces that trigger it this one on the top, and this one on the bottom, as opposed to the nighttime version of this event, which has the two aforementioned happening spaces with an additional two here on the bottom. You might think that this makes it more likely for the nighttime version to pop up in games, but that isn't the case because it's difficult for players to even reach the circle in the night due to the chilies that block three of the four junctions that lead here. What you may have noticed is that the arena for this event has multiple dual symbols as a part of its architecture. While it may be a way of showing that this is a battling arena, I think it's meant to symbolize just how many dual spaces are on this board. There's two along the outer ring, two on the inner paths, and four in the inner circle. There's so many in fact that this is the only board in this title where you can land on a dual space within the first turn. And when you think about it, the abundance of dual spaces here makes sense. Everyone started with five stars, and this place is all about stealing them, so what better way to stick with the theme than by allowing duels to occur left and right? If you're in a position to duel someone, and you most likely will during a game here, then don't be so quick to bet a star. What if a threat is right behind a doghouse and could potentially steal multiple stars from players in front of them? Sure, stealing one of their stars may be helpful to your star count, but if you duel them out of enough coins for them to not be able to afford a chain chomp, then you can screw them out of even more stars. We've gone over how useless most of the junctions are during the night, but what about during the day? It should go without saying that when reaching any of the junctions on the outer ring, that you should always, always consider the positions of the other players. You should be doing this no matter what board or title you're playing, but you should especially make that a habit when you're on good old Snowflake Lake, where one slip up could mean giving an opponent a star. Am I about to go right in front of a doghouse when an opponent's behind me? Then I should probably change directions. Is it about to turn nighttime next turn while I'm in front of everyone else? Better rush to the middle of the board so I don't get stuck. Board awareness will save you from crushing losses and help bring you towards grand victories. If you're in the middle of a game and first place is so far ahead in star count that it feels impossible to catch up to them, then try convincing the other two players to try and land on a chance time space. There's one on this top left path and one in the middle circle, which is easy to access during the day. If you and the other two players all work together by trying to land on either chance time space, then it's highly likely that 
one of you is going to land on it and hopefully end up screwing over first place out of what felt like a guaranteed win for them. It should also go without saying that the excess of dual spaces allow you to challenge first place directly for their stars, but make sure you're confident because you definitely don't want to extend their lead even more by losing. Overall, Snowflake Lake often results in players getting curb stomped by chomp after chomp, but if you stay aware of players' positions and use movement orbs accordingly, then you can not only avoid bad situations, but flip them around so that you're in the advantage. Say hey to Castaway Bay. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the least amount of spaces in this title at 62. Here's this board's item table. The low space count makes a lot of sense considering this board is linear. You start here at the beginning and will eventually reach this endpoint, where you'll either meet DK, who you can purchase a star from for 20 coins, or Bowser, who will take away a star or 20 coins if you don't have a star. You can tell which one's open for business based on which boat is at the dock. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you whose boat is whose. <laughs> Each time one of them is visited, they switch places. Regardless of who you end up visiting, you'll be taken back to the start. This gimmick creates an interesting relationship between players, where they must do their best to roll what they want based on which character's at the end. For example, if you're on the final island and Bowser's at the end, then you're hoping to roll low so that a different player will visit him instead so that DK can appear just in time for when you get there. In a situation like this, you may decide to use a sluggish room to roll low, and if you're the player behind someone in this kind of situation, you may also roll low so that the cheeky player in front of you doesn't do the Mario Party equivalent of slowing down when a blue shell is approaching you. This situation doesn't pop up as often as you think though, because the devs thought ahead and threw in a twist via the bell happening spaces, which there are four of on the board. Landing on one will cause Bowser and Donkey Kong to switch places, the same way they would if one of them was visited. This complicates the earlier strategy quite a bit. If Bowser's waiting for you, then do you hope you roll low or sluggish room to guarantee you roll low, or do you attempt to land on this bell happening space to bring DK out and hope you can reach him in time before an opponent. There's also the possibility that you'll be in prime position to visit DK on your next turn just for another player to ring the bell and switch him. Heck, the last space before you visit Bowser or DK is a bell happening space. You could be waltzing up to DK eager for a star just to swap him to Bowser, completely screwing yourself on your next turn unless a different player switches them once more. A lot of chaos can happen with these bell happenings, and that's because they're powerful tools. Reaching the end of the board takes some turns and if you can waste all the time a threat took to get there by making them visit Bowser, then that's fantastic, especially if you make them lose a star in the process. To be the best villain of all, keep a sluggish shroom in stock. It is incredibly versatile on this board, letting you roll high if you need to get closer to the end, low if you need to stay away from the end, or getting you the exact number you need to switch the placements of Bowser and DK to either assist you in getting a star or preventing another player from grabbing one. Mushrooms and Super Shrooms are incredibly useful here too for similar reasons. If DK is within range, then snipe him with a high roll. Oh, but what if a threat's close to DK and you can and snipe him, but you don't have enough coins to buy a star. Visit him anyway. Regardless if you can buy a star from him or not, the mere act of visiting him will cause him to switch places with Bowser. Is this an incredibly petty move? Yes. Is it worth it to prevent a threat from getting the star and potentially making them lose one instead? Of course it is. The happening space on this jungle island will cause new Kiki to appear, who will ask you if you want to play a game. Accepting will have you trying to catch the coins he throws down while avoiding the spiny eggs that fall with the goods. It's a pretty straightforward game that you should always accept unless you don't like money. Getting hit by a spiny egg will stun you for a second, disallowing you from picking up any coins, so it's pretty clear that you should steer clear of red and only run towards yellow. I don't recommend jumping as that runs the risk of smacking your noggin into one of the spiky lads. Instead, prioritize staying in the middle so that you can adapt to where the coins fall. If you see some falling to one side, then go for them and quickly return to the middle once more, ready for the next batch. If done correctly, you should get at least 20 coins, which is a fair amount. There's a statue on the third island that'll be that of a mushroom if it's daytime, or that of a Goomba if it's nighttime. During the day, if you pay your respects to the great mushroom spirit, it'll either ignore you, which is unlikely, grant you some coins, a range of about 6 to 11, or as you might have expected, grant you a kind of mushroom. Funny enough though, it grants every type of mushroom except 
mushrooms. Go figure. What's stranger though is that it grants the metal mushroom, which cannot be found on this board via the item shop or an orb space. This is the only way you can obtain one in this bay. I guess the almighty mushroom spear is just that powerful. But don't get too excited though. There's only two red orbs that can be found on this board, the Potaboo and Babam, and I consider them to be the worst of the red bunch. So you may as well use it to up your orb count for the orb bonus star if you have no other orbs in your inventory to use. Sorry dude. During the night, if you pay your respects to the great Goomba spirit, then every player on the board will swap positions with one another. A much more volatile effect than that of the mushroom spirit. Similar to the bell happening, someone landing on this one during the night can absolutely obliterate your chances of getting a star or be your knight in shining armor by switching you with someone that was in a much better position. Again, like the bell happenings, having any kind of mushroom, not you, in stock will help you in adapting to wacky shenanigans like these. If you see a player with a sluggish room heading right on this junction, then prepare for the possibility that they'll purposely try and land on either the bell happening space or the Goomba Spirit one. And yeah, you can't know for sure what move a player is going to make in a game, but if you take into account what their best move is, whether or not they know what their best move is, and whether or not they're taking the game seriously to begin with, then you'll start to have a sixth sense for knowing what your opponent is up to. Back to the Goomba Spirit, its holiness is a wonderful way to shake up a game that isn't in your favor. Consider what the worst case scenario is, and if it ain't looking too bad, then try to land before your majesty. Oh, what happens if you don't pay your respects to the Goomba Spirit? Well, you get punished for your insolence, and everyone pays for it by swapping places with one another the illusion of choice. <laughs> On the northern island, there's a river flowing downstream. Players passing by are stopped by a shy guy who asks if they want to go rafting for 10 coins. Accepting takes the player downward, dropping them off at this space, just a few spots away from the star space. However, if DK's boat is docked at the star space, there's about a 90% chance that Bowser will fire cannonballs at the rafting player. If hit, they will lose 5 coins, and their turn ends on this space instead of getting to continue moving with whatever space count they had left. This is a fantastic method of cutting your way across the board to where DK is. In most cases, you won't have to deal with any orb spaces or happening spaces ruining it for you so long as you take this opportunity at the right time. What's the right time? I'd say it's when your space count is 4 or higher when you reach this shy guy, cause then when you get dropped off, you can immediately talk to DK about getting your hands on a star. If your roll's lower than a 4, then, well, it could be a 3, which is gonna switch DK to Bowser, but if it's lower than that, then now you've gotta wait an extra turn where whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. That isn't to say that taking the shortcut without having the space count to visit DK immediately is a bad idea, but it certainly risks other players taking taking advantage of your vulnerable position by purposely landing on a happening space to switch DK around with Bowser. A situation worse than this one is if, again, you don't have enough spaces to visit DK and there's already another player there on the island. What this means is you'd get dropped off on the island right before DK, the other player rolls and will likely get a star from DK, and then you'll have to suffer from Bowser. Not a good play. The obvious downside to taking this raft while DK is available is the high chance that Bowser will shoot his cannonballs at you, which was obviously put in here to preemptively nerf the strategy we just talked about. Does it work? I'd say so. As said before, I gauge the chances of this event triggering at about 90%, and the chances of being hit by a cannonball feel like it's 50-50. So overall, it feels like you have a little less than a coin flip's chance of losing 5 coins and being forced to land on the raft blue space, which can screw you over like we discussed just now, but isn't the end of the world. I'd still say that riding this raft is worth it if you have enough coins to afford it and the space count to reach DK. If the former is lacking, then don't take it. And if the latter is lacking, then don't take it unless the island is free of players or none of them have sluggish rooms to purposely switch the ships on you. You can, of course, ride this raft when Bowser's at the dock instead of DK. If you ride it in this situation, then you have no chance of being shot at with cannonballs, which makes sense because the whole point of the cannonballs was to nerf a pretty good strat, whereas here, the strat seems to be getting as close to Bowser as possible. If you have a star to lose and your space counts high enough to visit him after rafting to this island, then you're just handing it over to the big bad himself, something that we call 
throwing. In almost all situations, even landing before Bowser is a bad move because you're likely to be the next one to run into him. But despite how odd a play this is, there are a select few scenarios where it'd be the smarter option. What if there's another player on the island who's really close to Bowser, has no sluggish room to purposely roll low in hopes of avoiding him, and their turn comes after yours? A situation like this would play out like so. You ride the raft to the island, end your turn a few spaces before Bowser, said player's turn begins, and they have to roll a normal dice block while being close to Bowser, which odds are will result in them visiting Bowser and switching the boats around so that on your next turn, DK's waiting for you. Sure, there's two other players in the game that could land on a bell happening to switch them around again, but those are the kinds of risks you've got to keep in mind when going for this kind of play. Another scenario where leaping into the jaws of the shark may be a better option is if your space count is at exactly 3. If it is and you ride this raft, then you'll land on the bell happening that's directly before Bowser, which will switch him with DK, whom you can now visit on your next turn so long as no other player visits him first or lands on a bell happening of their own. Do you see the running theme here? A lot of moves and strategies on this board can be screwed up by other players landing on bell happening spaces, which is why I again stress the importance of checking where your opponents are, how far away they are from these happenings, and if they have a sluggish room to land on them on purpose. You're going to feel a lot better making big plays after figuring out the odds that something can go wrong. And sure, this doesn't prevent bad things from happening, but it sure lets you know the odds of your big brain play paying off in the end, and I don't know about you, but I like identifying my luck. There's one big part about this board that we haven't talked about yet, and that's Pink Boo, who could be found by this a house. Oh, that's right, our pink friend can only be visited during the nighttime. Due to this board's gimmick, it can be difficult to rack up stars here. You could buy a star one turn just to lose it your next go around. You may even find trouble getting a single star due to the other players reaching DK before you or switching the ships around as soon as you're about to visit him. It's these troubles that often pop up when playing here that, I argue, makes Pink Boo a much more useful tool on this board than on Towering Treetop, where it's a lot more common for players to end the game Game with a bunch of stars. The low potential for high star counts by the end of a game on this board is why you should greatly consider holding on to your coins and going for a steal on any player that's a threat. But of course, if there's Pink Boo, then there's also the Boo Away Orb, which first and third place have a chance at buying from the item shop, and third and fourth place have a chance at receiving from an orb space. Again, I have no clue why second place gets the short end of the stick here. If a threat has a Boo Away Orb on hand and you really need that thing gone to steal a star from them, then consider trying to convince another player to try and steal coins from them to waste their boo away orb. It might sound impossible, but if you pitch that you're all gonna lose the game unless the threat loses a star one way or another, then they'll be more likely to help out. If not, then check how many turns are left. If there's about 8 left, then you can probably steal coins from the threat to waste the boo away orb on your own, and then steal a star the next time you visit Pink Boo. But that's a big if, cause if you get the timing wrong, when you reach this island, then the sun might be out, which means Pink Boo's house will be demolished, so be weary of when you set foot into this place. All this talk about how great Stealing Stars is on this board means it'd be a fantastic move for you to have protection of your own. If you see a Boo Way Orb up for sale, then buy it. Your stars are too valuable here not to. Stealing coins from players isn't exactly a death sentence for them here, but it can prevent them from having enough coins to steal a star from you. So look out for those troublemakers and you'll be having a good time. Junction-wise, they all eventually lead to the same place due to this board's linearity, but the difference in power between junctions is bigger than it's ever been. Take this first one for example. You could travel 4 spaces to reach the main route, getting a free orb in the process, or travel 8 spaces to reach the main route, visit the item shop, and have a chance of landing on a happening space. The power the former path provides is that of speed. Its space count is half that of the latter route, but it doesn't provide the luxury of choosing which orb you receive or the possibility of upping your happening count. Part of why there's likely such a difference in space count between these routes is, again, due to this board's gimmick. It's all about managing your spaces and distance from other players so that you can be in a position to visit DK instead of Bowser. While I don't think it's that important to manage where you are at the beginning of this board, it's something to keep in mind for future junctions. 
For this one in particular though, I'll tend to take the shorter route. Sure, that means I won't get to directly buy what I want from the orb shop, but keep in mind that mushrooms and super shrooms are really powerful here, and that there's a decent chance to receive one from an orb space. So unless I'm looking to bell it up or delay my movement, this short path is all me. The second junction's right path is 7 spaces long with an orb space and bell happening space. The top path is 9 spaces long with the raft event, a dual space, an orb space, and pink boo. More often than not, you'll find yourself taking the top path. The right one only saves two spaces, with its only real offering being that of the bell happening space, which, don't get me wrong, can absolutely turn the game on its head, but if you're not gonna land on it or doing so would be detrimental to your game, then you're probably gonna wanna head up to potentially take advantage of the raft event or pink boo if it's nighttime. This is all without mentioning the possibility of you wanting to land on a dual space, of which there is only one of on the entire board. That's seven less than that of Snowflake Lake. Lake. Talk about a step down. Although it was probably designed this way, because again, stars are super valuable on this board. So dueling for a star is a big deal, and one you want to take advantage of if you're adept at duel minigames. This final junction's left path is 5 spaces long with no notable spaces in sight, and its right path is 14 spaces long, containing a bell happening, chance time space, the spirit happening, and a DK or Bowser space. There is a very clear distinction between these two routes. One is short and straight to the point with no distractions, whereas the other is over three times as long and has plenty of notable spaces to activate. This is the part of the board where things get spicy, and you want to make sure you choose the right path so that you don't end up getting screwed. Let's cover the basic scenarios first. If DK is available and you can visit him to buy a star if you take the left route, then do so and ignore whatever's to the right of you. If Bowser's at the dock instead and you're not about to land on the bell happening space at the end, then take the right route to try and delay your fate in hopes that something will change it. This decision becomes a lot more complicated the more play players that get involved. You'll need to keep track of who has enough coins to buy a star, who has what movement orb, whose turn is when, and where every player is. If that sounds overwhelming to you, then good, it is. The better you can digest these tons of variables, the better your resulting decision will be. If DK's at the dock and a player has a mushroom or super shroom, then of course they're going to use it to guarantee they'll reach him. That's a no-brainer. So log that in your head and think about what the next player's turn might be like and so on. By the end, you'll have a decent idea of whether DK or Bowser will be at the dock when it comes time for your turn, and as a result, we'll know whether taking the short route or long route will be better for you. This is if we're only talking about buying the star though. What about screwing over another player? There's a bell happening on the right route, so feel free to land on it to cause some trouble. We've also got good old chance time and the spirit happening for either some coins, a mushroom, or a player position swap if it's nighttime. There's tons of shenanigans you can pull here, but you've got to consider what's best for your and the other's games before making a decision. When it comes to orb placements, I'd throw them down on the main route by the second island or by the bridge leading to the last island. We've already talked about how red orbs are a bit underwhelming, and frankly, the yellow orb possibilities aren't much better. The only one that's going to be making you money is the spiny. That's it. So I wouldn't aim for purchasing them and instead prioritize the movement orbs, one of which we have neglected to cover yet. The warp pipe. I haven't brought it up until now because I wanted to make sure we know everything about this board prior because man can this orb do some damage. As you can imagine, the ability to basically swap positions with whichever player you want is fantastic and borderline game breaking here if you know how to time the roulette with ease. Is a player chilling behind Pink Boo, ready to steal a star from you, waste your Boo Away orb, or preparing to become a threat in the game? Swap with them! Is a player right behind DK eager to buy a star? Swap with them! Is a player trying to land on chance time as a Hail Mary to overthrow your greatness? Swap with them! The Warp Pipe is an amazing tool on this board, able to cover nearly every big move an opponent can make that would greatly further their game or destroy yours. The only move that it can't reliably cover is if DK's at the dock and a player's about to roll triple dice blocks from super far away. 
Keep in mind that the dock is only 36 spaces away from the starting space. That is the maximum distance you can warp a player with a super shroom to, which is honestly pretty bad and probably a waste of a warp pipe unless it is absolutely critical to your game that they do not reach DK and you're willing to gain any kind of advantage no matter how tiny to prevent them from doing so. In almost every other scenario though, the warp pipe comes out on top when used properly, so buy it alongside the mushrooms if it pops up in the shop. Overall, Castaway Bay may be a linear board, but it's one with many movement strategies and important events that you need to get the hang of if you want to swamp the competition. It's time for Clockwork Castle. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the least amount of red spaces at 6. Here's this board's item table. During the day, DK will be present somewhere on the board. If you reach him and have enough coins to purchase a star, which is 20 coins, then after your decision, he will relocate to a random blue space or red space. If you reach him and do not have enough coins to purchase a star, then he will not relocate, instead remaining on the same space he was at. After all players have taken their turn, DK will take his, moving clockwise around the board. If DK reaches you, then you'll be forced to pay 20 coins for a star if you can afford it. Regardless if you can pay the fee or not, he will continue to move the amount of spaces he has left. He can only roll numbers that will let him land on a blue space or a red space. Character spaces are fine too. He cannot roll numbers that would land him on a happening, duel, or chance time space. For example, if there's a happening space one space ahead of DK, then he can't roll a 1. If there's a dual space four spaces ahead of DK, then he can't roll a four. If DK is about to reach a split path, such as in this situation, then the rule we talked about goes into effect a little differently. This bottom path has a happening space two spaces from him, but he can still roll a two. Why is this? Because the top path has a red space two spaces away. This means that if DK happens to roll a two, then he will always take the top path since he cannot land on the bottom path's happening space. If he reaches a junction and both paths have a space he can land on, then he'll decide which path to take at random. He will not prioritize a certain path just because a player's there, as nice as that would be. He just ooks his way to whichever path calls out to him. DK has a 50% chance of rolling double dice blocks. You'll know he's about to do so because he'll pull a banana out of his pocket and munch on it before rolling. During the night, DK will be replaced with Bowser, who shares the exact same behaviors and decision making as DK, except visiting him will cause the player to lose a star or 20 coins if they don't have a star. He will always relocate upon a player visiting him. In addition, Bowser moves counterclockwise around the board instead of clockwise, and his indication for rolling double dice blocks is spewing fire instead of munching on a banana. Now that we've got the gist of how both DK and Bowser behave, we've got to solve the eternal problem on this board. How does one get close to DK and stay away from Bowser? Trying to catch DK normally can be a pain since he has the potential to roll a high number, widening the distance between you two, or rolling double dice blocks, which will likely put him on the opposite side of the board from you. As always, movement orbs are your friends here. If DK's a ways away, then just roll double or even triple dice blocks to reach him. If he's behind you, then either roll normally and hope you get a low number, or use a sluggish room to purposely roll low so that he'll monk it over to you. If a player threw a thwomp down on to the field, then you can purposely run into it to stop your movement so that DK will reach you sooner. The reverse effect of this works too, where throwing a thwomp right in front of someone as they're trying to move to DK can crush their dreams at buying a star. If someone puts you in this position, then use a metal mushroom if you have one to overcome losing any spaces. If there's a player behind you that's in front of DK, then try throwing a paratroopa orb directly in front of them on your turn. Once it goes back to them, they'll bring you closer to DK unless they metal shroomed out of it. If you're a petty player, then you could throw someone off DK's path entirely by forcing them to run into a twister. If it wasn't already clear, the red orbs on this board are absolutely brutal when used properly. Do not underestimate them. If there's someone in the game with you that knows how to take advantage of these items, then hold on to your metal mushrooms for when the time is right. You never know when you may need to defend against what would be a game-changing move. 
running away from Bowser can be a bit terrifying. You'll feel safe on the opposite side of the board just for him to roll double dice blocks and come dangerously close, if not close enough, to deleting a star from you. The safest place to be in when he's on the field is a little over 10 spaces behind him. This way, you won't accidentally run into him, and even if he does roll double dice blocks, he won't be able to reach you. To screw other players into getting curb stomped by the big bad, throw down a thwomp onto a path where it can't be avoided, and watch them cower in fear as Bowser approaches their space. If a threat's nowhere near Bowser when you need them to be, then throw a twister right in front of them and hope that the game smacks them into doomsday territory. If you have a paratroopa orb, Bowser's right behind you, and another player is behind him, then throw your paratroopa in between the two. They'll then run into it on their turn, placing them right in front of Bowser while you get to chill out behind him. This only works if said player takes their turn after you, but this play can save lives, and so does the ever so useful Metal Mushroom, which will push you past the Womps trying to pin you down in front of Bowser, Tweesters trying to swoop you into him, or Paratroopas attempting to pull off the move I just mentioned. With what we've talked about, maintaining and manipulating your distance from DK and Bowser may sound easy, but there's something we've neglected to mention in all this, and that's the sudden change of direction that all players move in when the time of day switches. Remember, during the day, DK is out and all players move clockwise. During the night, Bowser is out and all players move counterclockwise. Let's say you're chasing after DK on the third day and come so close to reaching him, but not close enough. You know what's going to happen next? He's going to roll, move some spaces away, and now that it's night, we'll switch places with Bowser, who is now directly behind you and ready to move in your direction. This creates a complicated situation where you want to reach DK to buy a star, but don't want to fall short of him and end up being directly in front of Bowser when the time turns to night. This is why, if you know you can't reach DK in time, to just cut your losses and roll single dice blocks so that you can lengthen the distance between between you two for when Bowser takes his place. But what if Bowser's on the field and next turn DK will take his place? In this reverse scenario, maintain a healthy distance from Bowser. Remember, he has the potential to roll double dice blocks and takes his turn after everyone else takes theirs. If you're not directly behind him, but simply far from him, then odds are, unless he rolls pitifully low, he'll end up a respectable distance away, allowing you to try and reach DK when he swaps upon daytime. You may have noticed a pretty huge detail I've left out of the DK and Bowser explanation up until now, the warp pipes that are scattered across the board. And now that we have a great understanding of how DK and Bowser work, we can dive into this mechanic and see how it affects general movement on this board as well as this board's star gimmick. If you come across a green warp pipe or red warp pipe, then you'll be given the option to enter it. If you do, then you'll be warped to a warp pipe of the same color on the opposite side of the board. Gray warp pipes with X's over them cannot be entered, and DK and Bowser cannot enter a warp pipe period, no matter which color one is. During the day, there will be a green, red, and gray warp pipe on both sides of the board. During the night, there will be one green and two gray warp pipes on both sides of the board. As you can imagine, these warp pipes are a massive help in navigating the board. If DK's too far away for you to reach, but he's next to the same colored warp pipe you are, then take it and you'll be good to buy a star from him. If Bowser's on your tail and you need to get away from him by any means necessary, then use a close by warp pipe as an escape route. Now I say that, but as said before, Nighttime only has one set of working warp pipes, the green ones, reducing your chances of escape. Hence why you must always be alert to where each colored warp pipe is. It'd be an absolute shame if you thought that a warp pipe was going to bring you to safety just for it to spell your doom instead. Checking the map will always be your friend. The warp pipes will always be in the same layout every time a game starts. When day turns to night and only the green warp pipes remain, they'll be in the same spots that they were in during the day. No trickery there. Landing on either of the two happening spaces on the bottom of the board will randomly change the colors of the bottom three warp pipes. Landing on either of these two happening spaces on the top of the board will randomly change the colors of the top three warp pipes. It is entirely possible for no change to occur. There are nine warp pipe layout variations during the night 
and 36 warp pipe layout variations during the day, so it'll probably take you tons and tons of games on this board before you see them all. This isn't a memorization deal by the way, these images are simply meant to show you just how varied the warp pipe layouts are and how important it is to keep an eye on which warp pipes are lit up which color. Being aware of other players attempting to use these pipes as transportation will help you figure out where to place thwomps to prevent their dastardly plans from coming true. If a player lands on the happening space in front of Brighton's house during the day, they'll have the option of choosing between one of two chests. The gift they'll receive will either be 10 coins or a star. If you think which chest you choose here makes a difference, then you'd be sadly mistaken. Upon activating the event, both chests will contain 10 coins or a star, which isn't a big deal since it's all random anyways, a 50-50 chance to get either gift. And honestly, a 50% chance of getting a star with the worst outcome being 10 coins is well worth using your Selega Shroom on if you feel you're not going to need it in the near future. If you land on this happening space during the night, then no event will occur since Brighton doesn't come out during the night. If a player lands on the happening space in front of Twilia's house during the night, then the exact same gifting event will take place with the exact same mechanics and odds. If this event's activated during the day, however, then no event will occur, meaning if you want a chance at getting a star from a chest, then you've got to visit Brighton's house during the day and Twilia's house during the night. Landing on the happening space at the back of Twilia's ship will give the player the option to try and fish out an orb from the clouds. Through repeated testing, I estimate that there's about a 20 percent chance of receiving a babam, which will destroy all of your orbs. That's the only possible downside of this event though, so unless you have an orb you need to keep, or your inventory is maxed out with pretty good orbs, you should do some cloud fishing. You have an equal chance of reeling in any orb that can be found on this board. The chances don't seem to be affected by turn order or player placement. I can't see myself ever purposely trying to land on this happening space though. The event is nice, but it's nothing to write home about. Save your sluggish room for literally any other happening space, except for this happening space behind Brighton's temple, which will summon a UFO that takes the player back to the start, which is only 12 spaces away pretty pitiful for an event that you have to land on in order to activate. Despite the distance, it can be useful if you're trying to get closer to DK or further away from Bowser. You might also be in a situation where you want to access one of the lower pipes, which being at the start can help you accomplish. This happening's a bit of a miss overall, but don't overlook any niche situations that may pop up in a game. The happening space at the top of the castle will give players a chance to change the time of day via roulette. Sounds great, right? No! Through playing this dumb event over and over again, I discovered that each time you play it, the spinner decides to travel a random distance based on who the heck knows, meaning there's no way to reliably land on the time of day you want. However, most of the random distances the spinner chooses from do not take it more than 180 degrees, a semicircle, so we can maximize our chances of landing on what we want if we press the A button just a little before our target. This, of course, is no guarantee, but it's a whole lot better than assuming it's entirely out of your control and not trying. If the time of day you land on is already taking place, then nothing happens. If the time of day you land on is not taking place, then the time will immediately switch to the other, with a full three turns remaining until it switches back. This sudden change of time can be greatly useful in screwing over players who were close to DK by turning him into Bowser, or by saving yourself from Bowser by turning him into DK. Is this event worth using a sluggish room on though? That depends on where everyone's placed and what the goals are. If a threat's attempting to gain a star by visiting either Brighton's or Twilia's house, then switch the time of day so that the house they're going to isn't occupied at the moment. If they're attempting to enter a red warp pipe during the day, then switching the time to night will turn off that warp pipe and leave them a sitting duck. This whole board operates on this day and night cycle, so this event can be incredibly useful if opponents are in positions that rely on said day and night cycle, so look out for what they're up to and then decide if this space is worth landing on. Due to the clockwise and counterclockwise movement on this board, every path has two ways to encounter it, which doesn't change too much in what you should decide on, but there will be nuance in certain situations. The circle's top path has an item shop and orb space, whereas the bottom path has an orb space and warp pipe. The choice here is fairly clear. If you don't need to use a warp pipe, then take the top path so that you can not only visit the orb shop, but 
also step on an orb space. The nighttime version might be a little scarier since the warp pipe is three spaces away instead of day times two, and sometimes a single space is all it takes for Bowser to reach you. The castle's bottom path is eight spaces long, which can help you in catching up to DK or running away from Bowser. The warp pipe here can do the same job. These two happenings are good for farming up your happening count, and the orb space is appreciated. The top path is 10 spaces long, offering more situational events such as the chance time space and time changing happening space. If either of these won't benefit your game, then you'll likely want to take the bottom path instead unless you need a certain orb from the item shop or there's danger on the pathway. During the day, Brighton's Temple will have a junction that lets you choose between these left and right routes. Not only is the left route quicker with 5 spaces over the right route 6, it boasts a dual space and the chest happening space, which is incredibly valuable to land on if it's daytime. The right route's chance time space is, of course, a lot more dicey than the dual space, its happening space takes you to start, and the pathway is a space longer than the left path. I'd suggest not taking this route, but unfortunately, if you're visiting this temple during the night, you might be forced to. These floating platforms at the bottom are your only way up to the temple while the moon's out. But don't worry, once you or another player crosses them, they'll move to the other side to allow the next player to take the other path. This can create scary situations where you're fleeing from Bowser, desperate to reach these platforms so that he'll get diverted to the other path. Oh, by the way, DK and Bowser do not cause these platforms to move. During the night, Twilia's Temple will have a junction that lets you choose between two routes, and they're a bit more balanced than Brighton's. The path with the chest happening is still pretty good, still boasting a dual space, but the other path is a space quicker, has an orb space, and the fish for orb happening, which will often be a lot more useful than simply returning to start. Still though, if I'm to choose which path to take, I'll keep moving towards that chest happening, because the chance of obtaining a star from a happening space is just too great of an opportunity to pass up, unless I'm desperate for a certain orb that it'd be hoping for the left path to provide for me. As you might have expected, approaching Twilia ship during the daytime will meet you with the floating platforms we talked about earlier, which function the same way we talked about too. This board has two strings of spaces that you should throw down your coin stealing orbs on. This L, hold it please, and this reverse L, which I guess I'll hold. Populate these zones and you should have no trouble with running out of coins. Overall, Clockwork Castle is absolutely nutty with the amount of mechanics it provides. I see new situations each time I watch or play a game on this board, so that should tell you something about the complexity of this castle and how much of an advantage you'll have over others if you can use its many mechanisms to attack with confidence and flee with success. This title has 78 minigames that all have a chance to pop up in party mode, 73 if mic minigames are turned off. There's 23 4 player minigames, 16 1v3 minigames, 5 of which are mic minigames, 12 2v2 minigames, 6 battle minigames, 15 duel minigames, 3 Donkey Kong minigames, and 3 Bowser minigames. The day and night cycle that we've been talking about also affects whether you play the day Daytime version of a minigame or the nighttime version of one. Most of the time, the differences between the two are merely cosmetic, and you'll end up playing the minigame the same way regardless if the sun's out or not. However, there are a few minigames that drastically change in gameplay depending if it's night or day, in which cases we'll cover both variations. Some minigames are entirely unaffected by the time of day, such as Granite Getaway. In addition, some minigames only show up when it's daytime, and some only show up when it's night. I'll clarify which ones are which as they show up. 4 player minigames, blooper scooper, swim furiously to avoid getting sucked into a whirlpool created by a giant blooper. The last player swimming wins. If you touch a tentacle, barrel, or crate, you'll get stunned and will drift towards the father of bloopers. Making contact will result in a loss for you and a happy smirk from your competitors. Should you get hit, immediately swim to the perimeter of the whirlpool, where you're most safe. Getting hit here gives you a lot more time to recover than if you got hit closer to the center, where you have no recovery time and are way more likely to end up as a fossil for scientists to discover centuries from now. The crates and barrels float into the whirlpool from the up, right, down, and left directions. Make sure you're looking ahead at these areas as you swim along the perimeter so you don't get caught off guard. 
When the timer is at 20 seconds, you'll notice that the blooper's tentacles can be seen underwater. It's easier to see them at night because of the contrast, but don't let that fool you into thinking that they won't pop up in the daytime version. They will. They can't hurt you when they're like this, but you should still pay attention to their location since that's where the tentacles are going to pop out of about a second later when the timer ticks down from 19 to 18. They'll be in the whirlpool for a couple seconds, either rotating while moving towards the middle, rotating while moving towards the edge, or rotating while moving towards either. Their quick speed and random choice of movement is why players get hit by them so often, which is why you've got to keep an eye on them and know how to move in this whirlpool so that you don't get hit. If you swim with the whirlpool, then you'll move fast, but if you swim against it, then you'll move slow. Each speed is useful. If you're in a great spot with no obstacles, then swim against the whirlpool to stay within that safe zone. If an obstacle is coming towards you and you've got to flee or quickly evade it, then swimming with the whirlpool will grant you the speed you need for this maneuver. The whirlpool will always spin clockwise, so you don't need to worry about anything switching up on you. I'll reiterate once more, stay on the edge of the whirlpool. If your character's not hugging the edge, then you're not holding your analog stick towards the edge enough. If you get hit, then pretend that the edge of the whirlpool is a large piece of wood just waiting for you to lay upon it like a rose. <laughs> Cannonball fun, hop in a hover ship and open fire on your opponents. Each hit on a foe is worth one point. Whoever earns five points first wins. This is not, I repeat, this is not a survival based minigame. You do not have lives, you cannot die. This is a point based minigame. I say that because I'll see players treat this like a survival minigame and play super defensive or campy, and it's not to their favor because they aren't scoring any points. You want to find that perfect balance where you're hitting as many people as possible without getting hit yourself, because if you do get hit, then you'll get stunned for a short time as your machine gets launched from the impact. What will most aid your improvement in this minigame is getting a hang of how the shooting works. You can't fire a cannonball out of the same cannon twice. Your shots will always alternate between your left and right cannons. So if you fire and see a cannonball launching out of your left cannon, then no matter how long you wait to fire again, your next shot will come out of the right cannon. This is more important for close range combat, where you can easily miss a point blank shot if you didn't know which cannon was about to fire next. It doesn't matter as much when shooting a target from afar because the cannons are aiming at the same spot in the middle. Speaking of faraway shots, your cannonballs will always, always travel the same distance no matter if you're moving forwards or backwards. The only reason why it feels like their distance changes between the two is simply because you're moving as well, so don't get thrown off by that. Holding the L or R trigger will let you strafe in that direction a great movement option that can be combined with your regular movement, allowing you to more easily maneuver around and outplay your enemies. If you get hit, then after your stun time is over, you'll be granted 2 seconds of invulnerability, which is a ridiculous amount of time that you should be abusing to hit as many people as possible while you're invincible. Likewise, if you see that someone just got hit or just entered their invulnerable state, then don't waste your shots on them. 2 seconds is a long time in this minigame, and you shouldn't spend it throwing hands with someone that'll get a free point off you for taking advantage of their 2 second star man. The nighttime version is a lot prettier than the daytime version. This has no bearing on the mechanics whatsoever, by the way. I just wanted to share that. Catch you letter. The mail has been scattered everywhere. Grab the lost letters and hand them to the shy guy. Return the most letters to win. You simply need to walk up to a letter to pick one up and touch the shy guy to hand it to him. He'll run around in a frantic manner, but don't let that fool you. His movement is easier to follow than you might initially think. Most of the time, he'll keep to the edge of the arena and run either clockwise or counterclockwise, switching it up every couple seconds. Rarely will he move towards the center of the arena, and even if he does, he won't ever stay there. He'll always move back to the edge and proceed to sprint clockwise or counterclockwise once more. This is why when chasing him down, you shouldn't linger around the center, since he's unlikely to visit you. Try to instead corner him in this circle by intercepting him at the edge. He'll stop for a moment to receive any mail a player gives him, so whenever you see him stop, make Make sure you're front and center to deliver mail of your own as quickly as possible. If there's a bunch of players giving him mail at the same time, then it's important that you're one of the first so that you could potentially grab another piece of mail and deliver it to him again while he's stopped by everyone else. If the shy guy just started running clockwise when a player gives him mail, then he may decide to change directions. Don't assume he'll commit to one just because he was about to start running that way. When the timer's at 16 seconds, a pink love letter will draw from the sky, which is worth 3 points and absolutely worth getting. Heck, if the timer's at 20 seconds and I don't have any letters on my person, I wouldn't grab anything 
and wait for the love letter so I can snag it instantly. You don't want to be in a situation where the love letter drops and you can't pick it up because you're already carrying a letter. That's why you may have to concede a few seconds to not gathering anything if you want to ensure that your hands are empty for it. A great way to position yourself for getting the love letter is to look at the floor the moment the timer hits 16 seconds. The first shadow you see when the timer hits 16 seconds will always be the love letter, so follow the shadow as the letter drops and claim your three points. A love letter also drops when the timer hits 6 seconds, but the strat doesn't change. Just make sure that you actually deliver it to the shy guy in time. Getting body blocked in this minigame can cause you to lose, but that also means it can cause others to lose. If a threat has the love letter and the time's running out, then do your best to block them from reaching the shy guy. Time and time again I'll see people win this minigame by playing goalie. Oh, and guess what? The nighttime version is still prettier. <laughs> Circuit Maximus. Avoid the high voltage amps as you dash around the maze. Whoever reaches the goal first wins. If no one reaches the goal when the timer hits 5 minutes, then it's a tie. If this happens, then please send me your copy of Mario Party 6 so I can burn it because you clearly got a personalized copy if you and everyone else failed that bat. There's a set amount of amps for every section of the octagon as well as a set behavior for each amp. Certain amps are always stationary, certain amps are always moving left and right, and certain amps are always just bouncing off one another. You get the idea. The reason why this minigame feels random each time you play is because all the moving amps start at random times in their cycle, but knowing what to expect to a degree will help out a lot, so let's go through each section. But first, I need to emphasize the atrocious hitboxes in this minigame. No, I'm not talking about the amps, I'm talking about the walls. It's like a magician put up an invisible barrier around each and every wall, considering there's almost an entire character's worth of space that you're not allowed to move into. This causes players to get zapped again and again, since it often looks like they have enough space to avoid an amp if they move along the wall, but no, barrier. You Want to know what the best part is? The floor design. I'm not kidding. Look at where the barrier stops Mario and look at the floor he's standing on. You'll notice that the maroon colored markings along the edges cannot be stood on, almost as if they're marking where the invisible barrier is. Was this intentional? I sure hope not. That would mean that the devs intentionally made this disgusting barrier and I don't think I can handle that, so I'm calling this a certified coincidence. Use these floor markings to see if you have enough room to avoid amps close to the the walls. If it saves you from getting shocked even once, then it's worth it. If you get zapped by a moving amp, then it'll move the opposite way it was going when it hit you. This shouldn't matter in any game, since if you do get zapped, you should be pushing ahead, but if you end up getting stuck, then it's good to know the moving amp's behaviors. The first room has two amps on opposing sides, each moving up and down. You only need to pay attention to the left one since that's the direction you're going. Simply run past it when there's an opening. The second room will always have the same challenge, because all of the amps are stable stationary, meaning you can travel down and left each time you play this minigame without worry. The third room has two slow-moving amps on the top and bottom, and one fast-moving amp in the middle. When entering this room, I recommend waiting a split second for the camera to pan down and show you where the top amp is. If it's not directly beneath you, then freely run to the exit as you avoid the other amps, ideally by moving between them since I really don't trust the walls. <laughs> the fourth room has three stationary amps, one to the left, one up above, and one to the right, all of which shouldn't give you any trouble. There's one fast moving amp at the beginning and two slow moving amps in the middle and at the end. You also want to wait a split second for the camera to pan down so that the fast moving amp doesn't snipe you. When you've confirmed that it's not directly in your way, start running to the exit, avoiding the slow amps as you do. The fifth room consists of four slow moving amps, which sounds nice but none of them have a set direction. They're all bumbling about bumping off the walls and off one another, making this room the most random of of them all. Despite this, you should be fine as long as you don't rush it and simply wait for an opening. If you see multiple of them bunched up at the exit, then it may be worth it to purposely get hit and use your second of invincibility frames to move on to the next room. This track can work for any room, but this is the first room I'd see someone using it on. The sixth room has three pairs of amps that repeatedly bump into one another in a straight line. Each pair has a slow moving amp and a fast moving amp. Memorizing which ones are fast and which ones are slow will help keep you from getting caught off guard since this room feels random if you don't know how it works. Moving past the fast moving amp will be the most effective strat since it'll be getting out of your way quicker than the slow moving one. 
The seventh room has four stationary amps, located on the top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right areas. They aren't meant to zap you as much as they're meant to reduce the amount of space you have to navigate around the rest of the moving amps. There's one slow-moving one methodically hovering to and fro next to the entrance, which you need to look ahead for as you enter this room. Once past it, you've got to deal with three fast-moving amps simply moving left and right. If you're lucky, then a pathway will be immediately open for you to juke through, but if not, then wait a split second until one does. If you get shocked, then just immediately dash for the exit. The eighth room has three stationary amps forming a triangle in the middle. They serve as bumpers for the three amps that aimlessly bounce off everything. While it may feel tempting to try and squeeze past the left or right stationary amps by the walls, I should remind you that they're by the walls, so you do not have enough room for this maneuver. You have to go down the middle and avoid the bouncy boys as you make your way towards the exit. The last room is just the first room again, but you're entering from the right side, where you now have to deal with a single slow moving amp that shouldn't cause any trouble as long as you're paying attention to it. Daft rafts jump onto the floating platforms, but be careful not to fall into the raging river. Whoever reaches the goal first wins. If no one reaches the goal, then it's a tie. This means that if the other players fall off and you're the only one left, then you still have to reach the end in order to win. But guess what? When there's one player left remaining, the last raft appears instantly, letting the only survivor win the minigame early, likely as a reward for not having fallen off like the rest of the losers. If at least two players are present, then the minigame will proceed as normal. The layout is the same every time, regardless if it's day or night, so you can practice this setup over and over until you're comfortable with it. The times of day affect whether the obstacles you have to avoid are spinies or potaboos. The difference is merely cosmetic, but how bright the ladder is in the night may help you in avoiding them. If you get hit by an obstacle, then you're out. If you jump on a player's head, then their movement speed will be reduced and so will their jump height, but less so. If this happens to you, then you can either wait to recover before your next jump or go for it anyways. If you can afford to wait, then you should so that your restricted movement doesn't screw you over. If you can't afford a second, then make sure your jump is nice and high by holding A on your way to the next platform. I don't find jumping on players' heads that worth it in this game since it can be difficult to recover after all your extra height. I'd only do it if I needed to prevent a threat from winning. This minigame lets you go pretty far in the distance before cutting you off with an invisible wall, but I don't see a point in staying here considering this minigame isn't a race. Multiple players can win, so getting to the end first is only good for bragging rights. Well, now that I think about it, it does have value, huh? <laughs> the first two platforms are wide, with enough space to easily hold all four players. If you fall here, then I'll laugh at you. The two red platforms move away and towards one another over and over again, so don't get thrown off. The blue wood platform is wide enough to hold all four players side by side, but it's a bit short, meaning you've got to time your landing well. The rolling green logs will slowly move you backwards, but as long as you know it's coming, you shouldn't have any trouble leaping to the long wooden platform with three obstacles on each side. The split log platform floats left and right, but since it's the largest one, it's pretty safe despite its movement. Because it's technically two platforms, they'll fall one after another when they reach the waterfall. The wooden platform with obstacles on it can easily knock you out if you don't see them coming, so wait a moment before making your jump, which should be to the left as you have more leeway for landing on that side. The rolling brown logs are the opposite of the rolling green logs and will slowly move you forward, where you need to leap onto one red platform after another as they both are moving left and right in an alternating fashion. The tricky part is leaping to the buffed up split log platform, which has three obstacles on it with two of them at the front left and front right. You also have to deal with the moving red platform that you're currently on, making this jump one you've really got to pay attention to so you don't fail at the end. Fortunately, this split log platform doesn't move like the last one, so at least there's that. You have the option of jumping to rolling green logs or rolling brown logs. I recommend the green logs since they give you more time to make your jump to the thin platform with two obstacles on it, whereas the brown logs will pressure you to jump sooner, which could lead to a loss. These three platforms are undoubtedly the hardest part of this minigame. They're thin, so you have to make sure you don't overshoot or undershoot them, they have obstacles on them that you need to avoid as well, and they're moving left and right in an alternating fashion, making avoiding said obstacles a more difficult task. Do not rush this section. You can afford waiting half a second per platform to ensure your jump is a safe one. Players will more often than not lose at this part because they're rushing to the end, when they could have spent a little more time planning on how they're gonna land. 
The penultimate platform is a red one which moves forwards and backwards instead of left to right, so don't let that throw you off before you make your final hop to the last platform to secure your dub. Freeze Frame You have one shot to capture as many Goombas and UFOs or Shy Guys as possible in a photo. Whoever captures the most on film wins. If the timer runs out and you haven't taken a photo yet, then the game will not automatically take one for you. So if you don't have a pick yet and the time's about to run out, just press A anyways. Something's better than nothing. Each Goomba in your photo will earn you one point, each UFO or Shy Guy will earn you three points. If all players have zero points, then it ends in a tie. Multiple players can win. Shy Guys only appear during the day, and UFOs only appear during the night, making this our first minigame that has a gameplay difference between its day and night versions, because unlike UFOs, Shy Guys can't fly, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a panorama shot of all the Goomba's possible spawn locations, which are the same regardless if it's day or night. Obviously, they won't all be out and about like here, and there's a good chance that a few spawn areas won't be active throughout the entire minigame, but it's good to know where the Goombas could potentially pop out of so that you don't waste time looking in spots they won't show up in. Based on what we can see here, you have a better chance of capturing more Goombas if you keep your camera to the far right since it covers 10 possible Goomba spawns, as opposed to to keeping your camera to the far left, which only covers 7 possible Goomba spawns. Not moving at all and sticking to the middle ain't bad either, since it covers 9 possible Goomba spawns. You may find success in moving your camera left and right, over and over to try and cover the most ground, but I find more success focusing on the right side and shooting when I see at least 4 Goombas. Getting greedy is something you don't want to do in this minigame since you don't have a lot of time. The shy guys that only show up during the day have a small chance of appearing from the same spawns as the Goombas, meaning you don't need to learn any new spawn locations. These guys aren't shy about giving you points since you gain a whopping three of them upon taking their pick. So if you see one of them, then you should always take the shot unless there's no other Goombas on screen, which is unlikely. If the timer's nearing the end and you can only shoot one shy guy, then go for it. No time to waste. The UFOs that only show up during the night also grant three points per one captured, but unlike shy guys, they have spawn locations and behaviors unique to them. Sometimes they'll move a bit slower, giving you time to be the first person in the world to get a clear picture of a UFO. Other times they'll move faster, not giving you any time to react, but they do have a sound effect that plays when they come on screen, which may help you in capturing one. While you could stay still and prepare to quickly press A when a UFO's on screen, I don't recommend it due to their inconsistency in speed, their awkward movements, and how you'd be diverting your attention away from all the Goombas. I'd instead try and capture at least four Goombas, and if I hear a UFO and it's moving slower, then getting it in the shot's a bonus. Granite Getaway Run away from the massive rolling boulder. Whoever reaches the goal without getting squished wins. If all players get utterly crushed, then it's a tie. Multiple players can win. Holding down will let you run at your maximum speed, maintaining distance from the boulder. If you let go of your analog stick or hold up, then you'll move closer to the boulder. You almost never want to do this because if you run into any obstacle, then you won't have enough time to recover before being consumed. The only time I'd slow down like this is if I'm not confident I can react to the obstacles coming up, which shouldn't be an issue since this minigame's layout is the same every time. So if you played enough, then you should have a good idea of what's coming next, making slowing down unnecessary. But of course, I don't expect everyone to memorize this Temple of Doom's layout, so here are some general tips. Your jump will be the same height no matter how quickly you press or how long you press the A button. You'll always leap high into the air, so don't get thrown off by that. Stay towards the middle. A lot of obstacles are at the walls, which can be easily avoided if you're holding down and towards the middle of the tunnel. Doing this is especially important during the bridge section, where unless you want to fall into the abyss, you must stay in the middle to remain in the game. Only three players can run side by side on the bridge, with a fourth player needing to run behind them or run along the bridge's side structures. If you get caught in this position, keep holding towards the middle. If you don't, then you risk falling off. It may be tempting to try and jump to the middle, but I wouldn't recommend such a rash action. Once you enter the stone-walled part of the tunnel, you'll encounter blocks in a row, which you can't simply trip over and continue along like you did with the rocks at the beginning of this minigame. If you run into these guys, then you have a high chance of getting stuck and subsequently crushed by the big boulder boy behind you. This is why it's so important to keep laser focus on what's coming up so that you can jump in time. The last 
last two rows of blocks cover the entire surface, so simply jump over each one and you will secure your soul from a rocky demise. Lift leapers, leap over chasms in between moving lifts to reach the goal. Whoever reaches it first wins. If no one finishes the course within 5 minutes, then it's a tie. Now. This is a minigame that I can accept having a 5 minute timer for. You could give some players a day's worth of time and they'd still be stuck in the first section. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the tool assisted speedrun of this minigame, which is at 23.28 seconds, is quite achievable granted you practice this route enough. Start by holding right and keep holding it until the end of this section. Jump at the edge of the first ledge, but make sure you're holding down the A button when you do so your jump is as high as possible. If done right, then you'll barely land on the red platform then jump off the edge of it to the orange platform and then leap to the blue platform. If you don't make one of these jumps, then that means you either stopped holding right or jumped too early. Make sure you're jumping right at the edge of each platform. This is the hardest section of the task route, but if you get it down, then everything else is a bit easier. If you did the first section how I said, then keep holding right and jump to the raising platform, followed by hops to the next platforms that don't require any strict timing. In this warp pipe section, you want to jump to the lower green platform followed by the red one above, then you wait for the highest blue platform to lower before jumping onto it and finally jumping to the highest red platform once it gets close enough. Entering the final section, keep holding left and jump to the cloud on the top left, allowing you to jump over the spike balls and reach the goal after hopping atop a few clouds. If this task route is followed correctly, then your time should be ridiculously low, without anyone coming close, unless they did the same route. Again, this route may look intimidating at first, but you'd be surprised how quickly you can get it down after practicing it a few times, especially because the strictest part is at the very beginning. If you go for this route and make even a single mistake, whether that be falling, not holding your analog stick the entire time, or waiting too long in the warp pipe section, then the rest of the route will get thrown off, since the future platforms won't be in the same arrangement, which is why you want to know how all of these platforms move in case you need to wing it. You'll notice that every moving platform has a line behind it that indicates its movement pattern. If there's a vertical line, then the platform is going to move up and down. If the line's a circle, then the platforms are moving in a circle. Simple as that. Even if you mess up on the task route or decide not to take it, you should always follow the aforementioned path in the warp pipe section, since it'll be available to you no matter how many times you fall. Players often waste a lot of time here because of the influx of options they have, so keep focus on this one route and you'll escape a lot quicker than everyone else. Memory Lane. Follow the Shy Guy's route across the floor to the goal. Whoever reaches the goal first wins. If five minutes passes without anyone reaching the end, then the game will result in a tie. Has there ever been a serious instance of all four players being so ridiculously awful that the timer runs out on them? Has it happened to you? Come here! If multiple players reach the final panel at the same time, then the winner will be chosen at random. He will never go down. His default direction is up. He will never turn left or right multiple times in a row. He will always alternate between left and right three times by the end. When he does turn left or right, there will always be at least a one space gap between the rows of tiles he lit up. With this information, I opt in for only memorizing the tiles he turns at. Using this as an example, I'd really hone in on these tiles in specific, and when the minigame starts, I move in a straight line to each tile one after another. If I can, then I'll also keep in mind how many tiles tall or wide his path was, or if a tile was at the edge or not. If this sounds impossible to you and you're much better with numbers, then try this strategy instead. Count how many vertical tiles there are, then count how many horizontal tiles there are, and so on. When the shy guy reaches the end, you should have six numbers in your head. The first number is how many vertical tiles there are, the second number is how many horizontal tiles there are, and it simply alternates after that. Using this as an example, you'd count 2, 4, 4, 4, 3, 2. Then when you play the minigame, you go 2 vertical, 4 horizontal, 4 vertical, 4 horizontal, 3 vertical, and 2 horizontal. But Zoomzike, what about when he goes left or right? Don't I need to remember all of that too? You only need to remember his first turn, because remember, he will never turn left or right multiple times in a row. He always alternates. If you don't feel like following either of the aforementioned strategies, then do your best to paint a mental picture of the lit up tiles in your head while also keeping in mind the shy guy's behaviors. X-Ray Payday, or, or a money belt, a coin minigame. Open boxes to find coins. Watch the boxes as they get x-ray to see what's inside. Keep any coins you find. A box can contain 
contain nothing, one coin, a coin bag which is worth 5 coins, and hazardous items, such as a boxing glove which will stun you for one turn, or a bomb which will stun you for two turns. The maximum amount of coins a player can collect is 19. A box will take three turns to get to you. Focus only on the boxes with a coin or a coin bag inside of them and press A when they're right in front of you. If a boxing glove or bomb shows up in the x-ray, treat it like the filth it is and ignore it. Don't let your finger get ready to tap the A button for it. Just treat it like it doesn't exist and wait to focus on the actual valuables. When I see a coin or coin bag, I'll count up each time the conveyor belt moves. And when I reach three, I'll open up the box for the goodie. If there was a coin or coin bag after the one I counted, then I'll simply open the next box to nab it. I combine this strat with using my peripheral vision to keep track of where the coin or coin bags are so I don't lose sight of them. You can press A when a box isn't in front of you, which you want to avoid so you aren't out of sync with the conveyor belt. Make sure you're only pressing A when a box is beside you so this doesn't happen. Mow Town. Tame the wildly overgrown lawn with your lawn mower. Whoever collects the most grass clippings wins. If no one mows anything before the timer runs out, then it's a tie. Multiple players can win. Your goal is to maximize the amount of grass you mow while minimizing the amount of grass the other players mow. You can do this by always paying attention to where the most grass is and laying claim to it before anyone else. If you're worried about other players pushing you, don't. You can't get pushed in this minigame, making cutting off other players and body blocking them a solid strike. Rap. If they try to move against you, then they'll realize how futile their efforts are and move on elsewhere. You must hold the A button while moving around to mow the grass. If you let go, then you'll stay still and won't mow anything. You could do this in order to make a right turn, which mowing doesn't allow, but if you're properly charting your pass, then this shouldn't be necessary. You also have the option to hold the B button to move backwards, which doesn't mow anything. Now, unless you got stuck against another player, you should not be moving backwards. When the minigame starts, move in a straight line and do a turn turnaround before touching the other player if they're there. Unless one of the players did a weird movement, you should have a healthy amount of grass to mow to yourself. At this point, everyone will have mowed for some seconds, in which case you need to scope out which direction players are going and which patches of grass haven't been tended to yet. Move towards the largest patch while mowing grass along the way. If you get body blocked, then don't waste your time there and immediately detour to different patches of grass. Mowing at night isn't much different from mowing in the day, but it does look nicer. <laughs> Note to self, hit the three bouncing notes as many times as you can. Whoever hits the most notes wins. If no one hits a note before the time's up, then it's a tie. Multiple players can win. You can rack up a lot of points by bumping a note against a wall over and over. This can also happen with another player, but they'll get points too, which isn't ideal unless the player isn't a threat to win, in which case using them as a wall to raise your own score is a fair strat. If neither of these options are available to you during the minigame, then jump on players' heads to hit the notes above, or again, bounce them off the wall. Stomping players will also reduce their movement speed and jump height, making it more difficult for them to reach the notes. If you're jumped on, then unless you see an opening, move away from the jumping fiasco until you've recovered. I often see players trying to revenge jump immediately, which just doesn't work because their jump height is too low. If you see a player racking up points in the corner, then immediately go over to them to mess him up. Spending some alone time with a note in this minigame is a luxury you only want for yourself, ideally during the nighttime, which is much prettier by the way. <laughs> Odd card out. Find the card that's different than the others and press the correct button first to earn a point. Earn two points to win. If ten rounds pass without anyone reaching two points, then it's a tie. Here are all the possible cards that can appear in this minigame. Memorizing each of them will help you more quickly identify what the differences are between them since you'll know exactly which places to look for any oddities. That is, if this minigame didn't fall into the same pitfall that MPIQ did back in Mario Party 3. Yep, this is yet another minigame where most players won't use their heads to go at it properly, but will instead use their heads to mash the three buttons in hopes that they'll get the one in three shot of being right. The penalty for being wrong, you ask? Losing a turn, which is a very small price to pay considering you can easily spam buttons as soon as you're back up again. If you can get everyone to agree to play the minigame normally, then you won't have to deal with these spammy shenanigans and can instead focus on figuring out which card isn't exactly like the others. But if someone starts mashing and someone most likely will, then all bets are off and you must succumb to this strat if you want any chance at winning the game. You also have the option of using the forbidden technique, 
pausing. The cards will flip for two seconds before revealing themselves. If you pause right as they reveal, then you can scope which card is the odd one out, unpause, and mash the correct button. This way, you'll be the first person to hold up a sign, and it'll be the correct one to boot. If others are mashing, then this strat will not work, no matter how on the mark you pause when the cards reveal themselves, since one of the players will immediately hold up their sign to ruin everything. Only do this if 1. You hate who you're playing with, 2. They aren't mashing, and 3. If you're willing to play a little scummy. If you want to counter the other player's mashing and ensure you're the first one to hold up your sign, then you could pause right before the cards are revealed with an excuse like you have to check your phone or something. This might get them to stop mashing, and when they do, you can quickly unpause and mash yourself to be first. This is certainly a strat that wouldn't work twice, unless your friends aren't very sharp, but look, I'm trying my best to not get upset at how they screwed up this minigame again, okay? Pokey Punch Out. Punch and kick Pokey that emerge from the sand to score points. Whoever scores the most points wins. If no one scores any points when the time's up, then it's a tie. Multiple players can win. Attacking a Pokey's head will topple it completely and earn points for every one of its segments. Doing this gets you a ton of points in one fell swoop and saves a lot of time. So if you're able to hit a Pokey's head, do it. The highest part of a Pokey you can reach with your max jump from the ground is four segments up. If it's any higher than that, knock it down a segment until it's only four segments tall, then whack its head off. Make sure you don't blend your A and B inputs together. Hold A to jump high up, then press B. Sometimes I'll see players jump and not kick because they hit B while they were holding A, which doesn't work. A single punch can both hit a pokey segment and another player. So if someone's next to you and you're both going at the same pokey, then try angling your punches so that they'll hit both the pokey and your opponent. If the pokey's short, then doing this is a waste of time since you can simply knock the head off and move on. I'd only start spamming punches if the pokey was tall. With one exception. If a tall pokey spawns next to the staircase, then immediately scale the staircase to gain enough height to hit that pokey's head for a lot of points. Use the first step for pokies that are 5 segments tall. You can hit one that's 6 segments tall with a really well-timed kick, but it's hard to pull off and not worth the risk. Any pokies that are 6 segments or longer can be hit with a solid jump and kick from the second step, granted they're close enough. You will almost never need to set foot on the third step. It's far away and too much overkill for anything you'll encounter. Same as lame, choose a button to press. If you're the only player to choose that button, your platform will rise. Raise three levels to win. If 10 rounds pass without a winner, then it's a tie. Even if one player is higher than the others, multiple players can win. Ah, same as lame, one of the most ingenious Mario Party minigames ever conceived. The objective is simple. Press a button that no one else pressed, and you'll raise a level. Do that three times, and you win. Yet, this minigame can turn into a mind game mayhem as you attempt to predict which buttons the other three players are going to select. If you need to win this minigame, or you simply want to and are okay with everyone else winning, then tell your opponents that everyone can win if you all collaborate and choose your own button. For example, tell player 1 to only choose B, player 2 to only choose A, player 3 to only choose L, and player 4 to only choose R. If all players cooperate each turn, then everyone wins. You might think this kind of collaboration is impossible for you and the people you're playing with, but my friends and I can be very mean to each other during games and we'll still take the guaranteed win here, so I'd say it's always worth trying out. Thing is though, if a single person chooses a button that isn't theirs, then they'll screw over another player. This person that's defecting could be you. If there's someone who cannot win this minigame, then you could collaborate like normal, and then on the final button press, select the button that the threat said he was going to choose so both you and he don't win. This is how you lose a lot of trust, but it's for people who want that dub under any means necessary. If everyone's playing the minigame like normal, then it's prediction time. Are one of the players super predictable and only selecting a single button? Don't choose that button. Is someone spamming buttons on their controller? They're a little more likely to select A randomly because it's the largest button on the GameCube controller. What's interesting about this minigame is that when you press a button, your character will smack the button in front of them at the same time. So if you're mashing buttons, then your character's gonna button mash. One small detail is that your character won't press the button in front of them if you hit the same button twice. So if you and the other players agreed on hitting a certain button and you see someone's character hit the button in front of them, then either they didn't hit the right button the first time or they defected. 
pressing nothing will prevent you from going up even if no one else pressed nothing, so don't try to trick the game like that. I told you this minigame has a lot of layers to it. You could be big brain and win it all, or luck your way to victory. And honestly, would it be Mario Party if it was any other way? Smash Dance! Ground pound glowing panels to score. Whoever ground pounds the most glowing panels wins. If no one scores any points, it's a tie. Multiple players can win. Each panel you ground pound will award you one point. When a panel fades to blue, it'll fade out entirely soon after. Unless you're directly above a panel that fades to blue, don't go for them. You simply don't have enough time to score the point. If you jump on someone, then their movement speed and jump height will get reduced, but they can still ground pound, so this isn't too much of a punishment for them. If you, however, ground pound someone, then they will get stunned for four seconds. This might be the most brutal ground pound you can inflict upon someone in a Mario Party minigame. What makes this attack even better is that if you ground pound someone while they're standing on a glowing panel, then you can both squish them and hit the panel for a point at the same time. I recommend doing this to a threat whenever you can. See them going to hit a panel? Jump above, ground pound. Did they already hit a panel? Doesn't matter, ground pound. You can easily prevent a threat from winning this minigame if you ground pound them a couple times because deleting 4 seconds off of the 30 second timer for them is huge. Ideally, you'd want to be scoring points yourself, so you'd be getting these ground pounds in while point gathering simultaneously. Keep your eyes peeled for any panel that lights up. The moment you get close to the light, mash A. This will let you perform a short hop and ground pound in quick succession. I'll see players instead hold A to perform a high jump and then ground pound, which is good if you're trying to squish other players, but not when you're trying to hit a panel as quickly as possible. You don't need to be in the middle of a panel to score a point off of it. You could be touching a small part of its corner and that'll be good enough. If multiple panels light up next to you, then hit the panels that are closest, followed by the ones that are closer to other players so that they can't get them themselves. But obviously, don't get a panel that's right next to a player, otherwise you will suffer from a 4 second ground pound stun, and that is a terror you do not want bestowed upon you. It's a lot easier to tell which panels are lit up or not in the nighttime version of this minigame. Snow World! Press the buttons in order to spin your snowboard in midair. Whoever pulls off the biggest spin wins. If no one scores any points, it's a tie. Multiple players can win. You hit the A, B, Y, and X buttons in order. Then keep repeating until you hit the floor and are given your score. The game will not register a button press if you're holding down any of the other three buttons. For example, if I press A here while I'm holding down X or Y or B, or all of them, then my A press will not go through. It won't register. However, if I instead press A and am holding none of the other three buttons down, then the input will go through. Each button must be pressed individually without any of the other three buttons being pressed at the same time. This is where most people get tripped up by this minigame. They'll get stuck and swear that they hit the right button on screen, but the issue is that they did so while holding down a different button, even for a frame. So make sure your button presses are all free from one another. Now, there are many methods to hitting these buttons. You could use a single finger and quickly attack each button individually. While this has a low chance of getting you stuck, it's also incredibly slow and unlikely to win you the minigame. You could also use multiple fingers, each assigned to one of the four buttons, and press them in order that way. This method has a high chance of you getting stuck when starting out, but if you practice it, then I can see it scoring a ton of points when done proficiently. But I don't like the dexterity it requires performing. Introducing the slide. This is an easy to learn, high scoring method of playing this minigame that not a lot of players do because they either don't think of it or because it feels like it shouldn't work. To perform this method, you simply slide your pointer finger in a circular motion while pushing it against the controller. If you push too lightly while moving, then you won't press any buttons, whereas if you push too strongly, you'll move rather slow. Find that middle ground of a firm press onto the controller as you move in a circle. Speed that motion up, and when you play the minigame, your inputs will be at an incredible incredible speed when done properly. The only downside to this method is that it tends to get stuck a lot since your finger can easily press more than one button at once. But oftentimes doing this motion quickly is so effective that getting stuck a few times isn't enough to knock your score down. If you happen to nail this method down and not get stuck at all, then you can reach the maximum score of 9720.
like I did. If you're thinking to yourself that there may be ways to make the sliding method more effective, then you'd be right. If you have a smooth material nearby that can lessen the friction between your finger and the buttons, like a nice shirt for example, then you can put your finger in the shirt so that you can more quickly execute the circular maneuver. Something I do that is way more effective than it should be is putting a coating of lip balm on my controller's buttons. This makes them super slick, letting me slide my finger at lightning speeds without worrying about friction. I'm not responsible for any damage you do to your controller as you try to win this minigame. I'm only telling you the stupid things I've done that ended up working out. <laughs> Sunday drivers, press the buttons according to the Shy Guy's orders to hit the golf ball. Whoever hits 10 balls first, wins. If 5 minutes pass without any player reaching 10 points, it's a tie, even if one player has more points than another. If multiple players finish at the exact same time, the winner is chosen at random. The possible buttons each Shy Guy can display are A, B, X, Y, L, and R. If you press the wrong button, then you'll lose 2 seconds worth of time, which is a lot in this minigame where you need to hit the instructions button as quickly as possible. A and B are easier to recognize because of their colors, but X, Y, L, and R may be more difficult since they're all the same color. This is why you need to pay close attention to the letter you see on the button shown, or else you will mistake these buttons for one another at some point. The shy guy can hold up the same button multiple times in a row, so don't dismiss the button you just inputted as one that won't show up again. If you're falling way behind in this minigame and the threat isn't making any mistakes, then spam one of the six buttons to try and guess your way to victory. Throw me a bone. Throw bones to coax the chain chomp around obstacles and to the goal. Whoever crosses the goal first wins. If no one crosses the finish line after five minutes, then it's a tie. When the minigame begins, you'll see a purple arrow moving left and right in front of you. Pressing A will immediately stop the arrow and cause you to throw the bone in that direction. Your chain chomp will then bounce in a straight line towards the bone and stop on top of it. Your goal is to time each of your throws and navigate your chain chomp to the goal. Crashing into a pillar or a wall will stun you for little over a second, which isn't awful but clearly something you need to avoid. While the arrow is quite thin, your chain chomp certainly isn't, so when timing your A press, make sure you're leaving enough room for your big boy to not hit the many pillars scattered around the arena. A good rule of thumb for avoiding them is to always have your arrow land in between the two pillars ahead. When the arrow appears, it'll initially move left or right. I'm sorry to say that it is not consistent with which direction it chooses. Sometimes it'll choose to move left first multiple times in a row, and sometimes it'll alternate between choosing left or right first. Even crashing into a pillar or into a wall doesn't affect this arrow's random choice. There is something both directions have in common though, and it's that they both start in the middle, so if you need to go straight, then mash A and regardless of which direction you get, you'll go straight ahead. If your mash is a little bit off, then you'll go straight and a little towards the direction the arrow chose, but that's a risk you need to keep in mind in regards to your situation. If you have accidentally got your chain chomp directly in front of a pillar, then mash A as quickly as possible so that you can get the stun over and done with. I've seen players put themselves in this position and try to navigate around the pillar, but to no avail. The chain chomp is simply too thick. So just quickly take the L and make your next move. But can we talk about how pretty nighttime is here? Look at the pillars! I want to run into them! Trap Ease Artist one of my least favorite minigames in the franchise. Drop your cage at the right moment to capture as many Goombas as you can. Normal Goombas are worth 1 point, Golden Goombas are worth 3 points. If somehow no one gets any points, then it's a tie. Multiple players can win. If you don't release your trap when the time's up, then the game will release it for you. So make sure you release your trap when the most amount of Goombas are under you, or if you have a healthy sum of normal Goombas followed by a golden Goomba or two, whose glistening body will nab you a ton of points. If I had any piece of advice, it'd be to avoid this minigame like the plague, but if you're forced to play it, then don't get greedy. If the golden Goombas are far away from you and time's running out, then settle for the clump of Goombas under your cage instead. I've seen many players win this minigame with normal Goombas alone because their opponents were that adamant about just getting the golden ones. Why do I dislike this minigame? Good question, because it's entirely possible for the golden Goombas to not visit your trap area at all. They'll just waltz into enemy territory willy-nilly and give the biggest threat in the game an easy win, leaving you without any counter 
counterplay. Even if we take golden Goombas out of the equation, who's to say that the normal Goombas will gather under your cage? You have to hope that they will, since your only action in this minigame is dropping the cage. That's it. If you get unlucky and the Goombas avoid you because you're screaming at them, then you've got to take the L and move on, which sucks. This is a luck-based minigame disguised as a timing one. And not only that, it's a boring luck-based minigame too, because when all said and done, you don't really feel accomplished pressing a single button when all the stars align for you. You just feel like your time was wasted and you can't seem to ignore the bloodlust in your heart that you now feel for these parasites. Zoom's like, I'm a dumb commentator, and I'm still not convinced that this minigame sucks. Well, guess what? This minigame can only be played during the daytime. It has no nighttime variation. You know why? Because it doesn't deserve one. Treasure trawlers, find and recover the sunken treasure chest on the seafloor. If no one gets any points, it's a tie. Multiple players can win. A normal treasure chest is worth one point. A golden treasure chest is worth three points. And a babam is worth nothing. It'll stun you for one second. If rumbles on, then move around the pool of water until you feel your controller vibrate. Then immediately press A. This will stop your movement and lower your crane to retrieve what's hopefully a treasure chest. Items do not despawn. They will always remain in the same location until retrieved. So if you felt a rumble and didn't get anything upon pressing A, then that means you missed the retrieval spot. Turn around and try retrieving it again, but slower this time. If everyone's bunched up around the same spot, then move to a more open area so no one steals your loot. If rumble's turned off, then you'll see an exclamation mark appear over your character's head whenever you're on top of an item. The moment you see this indicator, press A. If you didn't get anything, then just like the rumble, that means you went past where the item was. So move back to where you saw the indicator and press A when you see it. What sets these indicators apart from the vibrations is that you can look at the other players to see where the items are, something you can't do when vibrations are on, unless you can hear each player's controllers rumbling for some reason. Most of the time, a player will retrieve the item that they saw an indicator for, but if they miss it or simply don't see it and you're close by, then you can go for a steal. Let's just hope you don't get karma'd by getting blown up by a babam. <laughs> Nighttime here introduces rain, which is purely cosmetic, but isn't it cool how they added entirely different weather just for the heck of it? Tricky tires, avoid obstacles and race to the goal in your six-wheeled vehicle. Reach the goal first to win. If five minutes passes without anyone crossing the finish line, then it's a tie. Practice the controls. What players struggle with in this minigame isn't the course itself, but the controls. There will almost always be a player or two that, upon beginning the minigame, will be utterly dumbfounded on how to control their vehicle and will end up losing a minigame that isn't as tricky as it makes itself out to be. Your analog stick controls your left tires, your C stick controls your right tires. If you only push up on your analog stick, you turn right. If you only push up on your C stick, you turn left. If you push up on both, you go straight. When the minigame starts, you have the option of going in between the two womps or along the circular structure in the middle. You can't go in between the womp and the wall. If you spawn in the outer part, then your only real option is going in between the womps, which is why you need to make it there before the player beside you. If they cut you off, you have to wait for them to move ahead without any alternative. On the other hand, if you spawn in the inner part, then cut off your opponent on the outer part by getting in between the two womps as quickly as possible. If you see that they're going to reach the spot first, then you can instead go along the circular wall so that you don't lose a lot of time. You could just go this way to begin with if you don't want to chance losing any time, but then you lose your opportunity to screw over the player beside you. The moment you get past the two womps, look at the two thwomps ahead and turn towards the one that is not currently on the ground. That thwomp will crush the floor as you make your way towards it and will raise up to let you pass as soon as you arrive. If you instead moved towards the one that was on the ground, then it would have most likely crushed you as soon as you went under it. I say most likely because these thwomps thwomps drop at random intervals, but if you do what I said and move in a straight line past the correct thwomp, then you'll make it almost all of the time. If only the outside of the rotating bar touches you, then keep moving forward, it's no big deal. If the inside of it touches you, then you're gonna get moved back quite a bit and should readjust your car back to the course. If the horizontal bar is blocking your way to the goal, then patiently wait it out and progress when the coast is clear. What goes up? Daytime version. Jump on paratroopers to reach breathtaking heights. Whoever reaches the highest altitude wins. If no one makes any yardage, it's a tie. Multiple players can win. You can only land on their shell, not their head. I know it may look like their head is stable enough to get footing on, but their shell's hitbox is a little generous, so always aim for it. 
your jump height will be the same regardless of how long you hold A, so just tapping it will do. As you scale higher and higher, keep your eyes on the paratroopers above. Some will be stationary and some will be moving left and right. If there's a paratrooper directly above you, then curve your jump around it and land on top. Bumping into the bottom of a paratrooper will cause you to fall, but you do have control over your movement while like this, so land on a paratrooper below and continue your climb. When a paratrooper in motion is landed upon, they'll recoil for half a second and continue their previous action. If you land on one in motion and immediately land on it again by bouncing off a paratrooper above you, then your buddy will get stuck and become a stationary paratrooper. All thanks to you. <laughs> Succeeding in scaling these shells really comes down to how well you can adjust yourself in the air to make a landing. Nearly every jump can be made if you jump accordingly, but if you're not confident in one, then waiting out a paratrooper in motion might be your best bet, since unless you're close to a cloud, falling down can be fatal. Nighttime version. Fall as fast as you can by avoiding paratroopers and clouds. Reach the ground first to win. If five minutes passes without anyone reaching the bottom, then it's a tie. If all players reach the bottom at the exact same time, then it's a tie. If only two or three players reach the bottom at the exact same time, then they'll win together. Keep your eyes glued to the bottom of the screen and move your analog stick to avoid coming into contact with paratroopers or clouds. Which side the cloud spawn on is random. Prioritize staying in the middle so that no matter which side a cloud spawns on, you'll be able to quickly move to the opening and continue your descent. If you're standing and press A, then you'll jump. I don't know why you're allowed to jump here, but you can. I guess you could do it if you want to style on your opponents or potentially tie with them if you need to reach the same amount of yards. <laughs> 1v3 minigames, ball dozers, break obstacles with your hammer to open a path for the ball to roll to the goal. If 5 minutes passes with no balls dozed to the bottom, it's a tie. If you're the solo player, then when the minigame starts, immediately make your way below the ball. This way you can smack down the pegs in front of it at a rapid pace. If you end up above the ball instead, then you've got to awkwardly maneuver around it and waste valuable time. When choosing which pegs to knock down, look ahead. The gray star structures cannot be broken, so you should often lead the ball away from them. Only move towards them if the amount of pegs on the detour route is too many to be worth it. If your ball gets stuck against a star statue, then it will continue to roll in the direction it was going once you free it. You cannot smack the ball with your hammer to get it to change directions, so keep in mind how it was rolling last and... Well, roll with it. <laughs> if you're on the team of three, then it is essential that as many of you are below the ball as possible. If anyone on the team is above it, then they risk wasting a lot of time trying to maneuver around this absolute unit of a ball. Stay below and smack every peg that's in this ball's route. The advantage you have over the solo player, aside from having three people, is that you have more time to hit pegs in advance, so that the ball has a clear lane to roll down. This won't matter if you and your teammates aren't in sync though, so take advantage of the more open area by directing your teammates on where to go. Cash Flow, a coin minigame. Grab coins as you zoom zike down the colossal water slide. You get to keep all the coins you grab. In addition to coins, there are also coin bags, which are worth 5 coins. If you're the solo player, then use your tight steering to collect as many coins as you can, prioritizing coin bags. Despite how slick your vehicle is, it ain't slick enough to collect two coins that are split horizontally. So if you see this formation, then commit to one of them and move on. If you hit a spiny, then you won't be able to accelerate, slow down, or steer, but you can still collect coins in coin bags. If you see a spiny right behind a coin or coin bag, then run right into that sucker and let your stunned self do the collecting. If you're on the team of three, then spread out. You can't steer yourselves nearly as well as the solo player can, so you need to cover as much ground as possible if you don't want to miss out on the goodies. If you see some cash side by side, then you should commit to one of them while a different player on your team commits to the other so that both are collected. If anyone on the team hits a spiny, then they'll get launched out of the minigame, so you need to avoid them unless you feel like letting everyone down. <laughs> Conveyor Bolt, daytime version. One player rides on a cloud chariot, dropping thunderbolts. The other three players have to avoid them to survive. If one of the three players gets hit by a lightning bolt, touches one when it's already grounded, or runs into a set of spikes, then they're out. If you're the solo player, then you should know that you can't put two thunderbolts on top of one another. Not that I see any reason for you to do so. For the players that you know are going to be easy to get, simply predict their predictable movements and predictably drop a predictable thunderbolt on their predictable selves. Foolishly. <laughs> for the players whose skill levels are above awful, you're going to have to outmaneuver them by strategically placing your thunderbolts around the spikes. 
this will make it so players not only have to avoid your wrath, but the spikes as well. Even if this doesn't outright kill a player, it may get them into a tighter spot that'll let you predict their next movement easier. Your Thunderbolt drop has a little over a second cooldown, so unless you're about to get into a fantastic position to drop a Thunderbolt, you should always be tapping A to make sure you get as many of these boys on the field as possible. It should be noted that they disappear when they reach the left end of the conveyor bolt, as do the spikes. Don't be afraid to get tricky with your movement. This is the kind of minigame where the three players can feel nice and comfortable for a while, just to lose within a matter of seconds. If you're on the team of three, then keep on the lookout for openings. The last thing you want is for the solo player to force you into moving predictably and zapping you for it. Here's something I didn't tell the solo player. You go a lot faster when running to the left because that's the way the conveyor bolt's moving. So if you're in a tight spot, then backpedal to easily outspeed the cloud. It's too difficult to do this while moving right since your character will go much slower while trying to run against the landscape. You and your teammates can run into each other, so don't blockade them from getting to a safe position. If they're accidentally or purposely blocking you off, then immediately retreat to a better position and see if there's a better route to take. Nighttime version! One player has to avoid thunderbolts dropped by three players riding in cloud cars. The thunderbolts that the three players drop are thinner than the ones that the solo player drops in the daytime version, meaning that they're easier to avoid. In addition, the conveyor bolt's not moving, so any thunderbolt dropped will remain in place until it fades away after a little over a second. However, the solo player can still get knocked out by a thunderbolt as it's fading away. There are no spikes in the arena. If you're the solo player, then you've got to bob and weave the three players as they attempt to nail you with thunderbolts. You move slightly faster than they do, so if you're running away from one of them, then they can't catch up until you reach a wall or run a different direction. If they're coordinated and know what they're doing, then they'll try to come at you from different angles, in which case you need to be ready to juke them out. If you have to run under someone's cloud and you know they're ready for you, then start to run under them, then immediately double back so they drop their thunderbolt early. Do not move into a corner if there are at least two of them around you. This is a death sentence. If you're on the team of three, then surround the solo player to restrict their movement options. If you're all chasing him from behind, then he'll have plenty of room to travel around and run down the timer. So it's good to get a feel for where everyone is and position yourself at a spot that you're pretty sure the solo player is about to turn towards. Crate in Peril. One player holds a box containing the other three players and tips it to try and hit them with spinies. There are four obstacle variations for this minigame. Inner panels in the form of a circle, inner panels in the form of an X, outer panels in the form of a circle, and outer panels in the form of an X. We'll go over the specifics of each one in a moment, but I need to emphasize that this minigame is heavily weighted in favor of the solo player, and that if you're going against someone that knows how to properly move the spinies around, then winning can feel impossible but there's always a chance, right? If you're the solo player, then separate your spinies by pushing them against an obstacle. This will let them cover the most ground possible, making it incredibly difficult for the three players to avoid them. Slide your spinies in such a way that they surround players trapped in the corners. If a stubborn player isn't in a corner or on the outskirts, then move one of your spinies in the middle to flush them out. This is extremely easy to do when the panels are on the inside, since a single one of your spinies occupies the entire space. If the panels are on the outside, Side, then you can still threaten a player there with a single spiny, but it's easier to avoid. Either way, your spiny should be threatening their safe position and moving them to the outer area where they're more vulnerable. The three players have collision with one another, so if one of them is especially good at this minigame, then target them first so that they have to avoid running into spinies, panels, and their own teammates. Leaving the best for last will give them more room to run around, and that's a luxury you don't want the best player to have. If you're on the team of three and got the outer panels, then prioritize staying in the middle as much as possible. If you play it right, then the solo player cannot kill you with a single spiny there. They'll have to either go another player into disturbing you or scare you into moving towards the corners. Don't. Moving towards the corners for more than a second is a death sentence and the main reason people lose this minigame. The longer you can spend in the middle of the arena where you have more chances to avoid the spinies, the better. If the solo player brings both spinies into the middle, then move to the side so avoid being hit and return to the middle as soon as possible afterwards. Check which direction the panels are facing, as they'll let you know how the spines will interact with them, letting you better predict their movements. If you got the inner panels, then the middle is still your best friend, but you're gonna need to run around panels multiple times for cover since a single spiny can threaten your position. You can always know how the spines are about to move if you get a handle on recognizing which way the box is turned and which way the panels are facing. Again, this minigame is hard for the 
3, but it isn't impossible. Practice your looping and strike decisively. Dust Till Dawn. One player has to clean a small room while the other three team up to dust a huge room. If five minutes pass and neither team wins, then it's a tie. Don't know how someone can be that bad at cleaning, but we are gamers after all. The layout of the room is the same every time, and the amount of dust it takes to clean every object is the same too. So if you memorize this guide, then you'll always know the exact amount of times an object needs to be dusted for it to be fully clean. This opens the door for four strategies. The first strat is to pay no mind to how many dust an object needs and button mash willy-nilly until you're done. This is the most commonly done and least optimal method. The second strat is to button mash but have somewhat of an idea of how many dusts an object takes. You're not keeping track but you know an object takes a while before it's clean so you won't move in advance. This is better than the first strat but we can do even better than that. The third strat is to not button mash and instead press A as soon as your character is ready to dust again. This way your A presses will line up with the amount of times you're dusting, and when you reach the amount of dust an object needs, you can immediately leave without having to wait to see if an object is clean or not. The fourth strat is to button mash again, but this time count each dust animation, and when it reaches the amount of dust that an object needs, then you know it'll be clean. Counting these animations is a little harder than counting your timed A presses, but this strat lets you keep the speed of button mashing while also letting you save time by leaving as soon as you know the place is clean. Perfecting this strat or the timed A presses will let you clean a bit faster than the other players, which can make the difference a lot of the time. The amount of dust the solo player needs to do is 44, whereas the team of 3 needs to do 108. If we divide that number by 3, then we'll get around the amount of dust that you should expect each member on the team to do, which is 36. 8 less than the solo player's 44. So is this minigame in favor of the 3? Only if they're well coordinated, which they tend to not be most of the time, letting the solo player win this minigame in their small room when by all means the team should be clearing this most of the time. This is the optimal route for the solo player and the team of 3. If both sides were to follow it to a T, the team should always win, but getting that in sync with your teammates can be tough, so I imagine the solo player would win more often following this path. If one of your teammates hasn't fully dusted an object and moves away from it, tell them, dusting it a little late is a lot better than a lot later. Objects can be dusted by multiple players at once to increase the speed of dusting, but some smaller objects are harder to do this for than the larger ones, so make sure that your dusting inputs are actually going through, as indicated by the dust animation. Pop Star! One player swings a hammer while the other three ground pound to blow up a balloon. Whoever pops their balloon first wins. It takes 100 button presses for the solo player to pop their balloon. It takes 45 full ground pounds from the team to pop their balloon. It also doesn't matter whether they're in sync or not. This means that each player on the team will have pulled their weight if they performed 15 full ground pounds. But that doesn't mean you should give up after doing 15 full ground pounds yourself. Just keep going and break your back carrying everyone else. If you're the solo player, then I hate to break it to you, but unless you're really fast at button mashing or the team of three is poor at ground pounds, your chances of winning this minigame are quite low. If you want to be morally bankrupt, then you could tell the team that it'd be better if their ground pounds were in sync, even though being in sync doesn't do anything at all. This may cause them to wait a few times to try and sync up, letting you take advantage of their lost time. Ray of Fright. One player controls a laser cannon. The other three have to avoid getting zapped by blasts of light. The solo player can only fire the laser when the gauge at the top is full, so you can either use that as an indicator it's ready, or look at the lights on either the front or the back of the machine and see if they're at their brightest. I rarely see the team win this minigame, and I don't blame them. The different angles this laser can fire at is crazy, and it goes much too quick for the average person to avoid them, which is why you'll often see the solo player win quickly. If you're the solo player, then just fire your laser at random angles a few times. This will win you the minigame for as long as you live. But if you're facing someone that actually knows how to play it, what we call a unicorn, then keep these angles in mind. Shooting at these spots will let you do a sweep of the outer perimeter. Shooting at these spots will let you hit any players hugging your sides. But most importantly, shooting at these spots will make the laser form the shape of my logo. And what better way is there to kill someone than that? If you're on the team of three, then not all hope is lost. 
lost. Your best chances of winning are to hug the solo player's machine on its side. If you keep doing this even while they turn, they will not be able to knock you out with a direct shot by the laser. Heck, it's hard for them to even hit you with the first reflection of the laser. What has the highest likelihood of killing you when using this strat is the second reflection, which you have a decent chance of avoiding since you'll have time to react to it after watching the laser's initial fire and its following reflection. Getting a handle for how the laser bounces off the walls will assist you in better avoiding it too. If you touch the laser when it's fully charged, then it'll obliterate you, so don't touch it unless you're a glutton for incineration. Sink or swim, one player drops mines in a pond while the other three players have to avoid getting hit. If a member of the team gets hit by a single mine, they're out. When all three members are out, the solo player wins. If the team manages to run out the 30 second timer, they win. It's not as simple as staying underwater and avoiding the mines though, since there is an air gauge. It takes 10 seconds for it to deplete completely, regardless if you've been moving around or not. If all of your air is gone, then your character will get stunned and start to float to the surface for air. This grants the solo player a lot of time to walk over to your spot and drop a mine straight on your head, so you need to reach the surface every now and then to avoid this fate. Fortunately, the solo player doesn't move too fast, so swimming to the surface for a gasp of air and diving back down normally isn't too big of a deal. You can also swim along the surface so that you can gain air and move away from the solo player at the same time. It takes two seconds to fully replenish an empty air gauge, which can be a substantial amount of time, so it's a good thing you can stop midway and dive back down in case the solo player's on your tail. You may have noticed that the team doesn't move fluidly in this minigame, which is ironic because they're in water. They instead look like they're stiffly moving around from quadrant to quadrant, as if they're on some kind of grid. Because guess what? They are. This minigame's water section operates on a 7x5 grid for a total of 35 quadrants. The team has 8 directions they can swim, the good ol' compass rose. When a member of the team faces any direction besides up and presses A, then they will swim one quadrant in that direction, given there's an empty space. If one holds up and presses A, or simply presses A without any direction inputted, then they will swim up two quadrants. This was likely implemented to make it easier for the team to reach the surface. If another player swims into you, then your placement can be temporarily outside of any quadrant, but you will slowly drift to the closest quadrant if you aren't swimming, or you'll enter a quadrant if you decide to swim. This phenomenon somewhat gives the illusion that you can move freely in the water when that simply isn't the case. It's a grid-based system with little level that you want to master if you wish to avoid a spiky fate. If you're the solo player, then rejoice in the fact that you aren't shackled to a grid. Watch each of the swimming player's placements along with each one's air gauge and take advantage of each one's moment of weakness. You can knock out players by cornering them underwater with mines, but it'll be tough to nail the better ones with this approach. For these players, wait until their air gauge is nearing empty and follow them as they swim to the top for oxygen. That's when you strike. Snow Brawl One player, joined by four monkeys or shy guys, faces off against the other three players in a snowball fight fight for the ages. It says the one player's joined by three allies in the tooltips, but that's a typo, there's actually four. If the timer runs out, then it's a tie. If one player is on each side of the field and a snowball hits both of them at the same time, it's also a tie, and probably one of the funniest ties in the whole series. <laughs> if all three players on the team get hit, then the solo player wins, but if the solo player gets hit, then the team wins. This is how the minigame balances out. While the solo player has more competitors, they're crippled by the fact that they'll instantly lose if they're hit. If you're the solo player, then prioritize your safety at the beginning above all else. Let your companions throw snowballs at the competition in order to get them out. Don't make your snowballs near the border. The snowballs only travel about two-thirds of the lateral map, so craft your ammo far away and then carry it around looking for an opening on one of the three. Don't take any shots that put you at risk since you're the opposing team's win condition. They will be aiming for you. You can use your allies as shields while they're running around, but you can't use any allies as shields once they're fallen over or frozen since they're too low to the ground. If your companions have all been hit and you've got to fight the team on your own, then stay away from the border and hug the wall. This is where you'll make your snowballs, where you'll then have to be extra careful as you throw them since the team no longer has to worry about your allies anymore. You shouldn't be in a rush to knock them out since the timer hitting zero simply means you all tie. So take your time as you retreat to safer positions and scope out openings against the others. 
If you're on the team and the solo player is close to the border, then take the shot for a quick win. If they're playing on the safe side, hiding behind their companions, then take any shot you can against their allies, knocking them out of the game one by one. It may be tempting to just target the solo player since their defeat is all you need to win the game, but it's a safer bet to stack the odds in your favor by decreasing their resources and firepower. Like the solo player, you should be making your snowballs away from the border and attack when in a safe position. You could use one of your allies as a shield, but considering they actually have feelings, you probably shouldn't do this unless you value your relationship with that person. All frozen allies are still tangible, so don't be surprised when you run into your friend that took a bullet for you. Stage Fright Three players on moving platforms fire balls at the stage. One player has to run around the stage to avoid getting hit. Players on platforms who are hit by their own teammates will be temporarily stunned. Each platform a player is on has its own speed. Blue is slow, green is medium, and red is fast. If you're the solo player, then take advantage of blue and green slower speeds by moving the opposite direction their platforms take them. This will lower the amount of projectiles you have to dodge, since red will be the only one fast enough to adapt to your juking shenanigans. Crossing up blue and green again and again like this can also potentially cause green or red to accidentally hit one of their teammates, which is a plus, but not something you should be counting on since good players will avoid this penalty at all costs. The colors of the paintballs each player shoots do not reflect what color platform they're on, so completely disregard this trickery and focus on simply dodging and wasting the slower player's times. If you're on the team and you're blue, then you don't have to worry about hitting any allies since they're both behind you, so feel free to shoot as many shots as you like at the solo player. However, you may find them taking advantage of your slow movement by moving to the opposite side, in which case don't take any unnecessary shots because they pause you for a moment, and let your platform inch closer to your target. I don't recommend waiting until you're directly in front of the solo player, but to instead try and wall them off with a few shots before you're in front of them. This will make it more difficult for them to juke you out once more, and can potentially lead to their defeat if your teammates follow up. If you're green, then never shoot when blue's in front of you. This will waste not only their time since they'll be in hit stun, but your time since every shot that's taken will, again, pause your platform for a moment. Blue will likely be shooting a lot since they don't have to worry about hitting anyone in front of them, so if you see that the solo player is getting backed into a corner, then take any critical shots you can. You shouldn't only be going for winning shots though, since denying the solo player a good position can be just, if not more, helpful, so if you see that they're running to safety, then try and cut them off. If you're red, then congratulations, you're in the toughest position to excel at. Not only do you have to avoid hitting two of your teammates that could pause at any moment by firing, but you're also moving rather fast, meaning you need to pay extra attention as to not commit friendly fire. If you avoid hitting your teammates no matter what and use your speed to your advantage, then you will be an absolute terror to the solo player. No matter where they go, you will be there within a quick moment to inflict pressure upon them. If they keep running to the opposite side, Side of your allies, then fire shots at their target location so that they have to deal with the shots your companions are firing. Don't be afraid to take shots that go in between your allies. As long as they're not dead on, these sneaky shots are fair game and have a chance of throwing the solo player off. Surge and Destroy! Three players scramble to dodge a high-voltage electro orb guided by the solo player. The controls for the solo player can take some getting used to. The analog stick moves the orb horizontally, and the C-stick moves it vertically. I imagine the devs designed it this way to make it harder to control since it'd be too easy otherwise, which is why you want to get comfortable with managing it so that you aren't disadvantaged. As the solo player, your goal is to obliterate the three by making them touch the huge electro orb, but unfortunately it moves a little too slow for it a alone to reach them, which is why you need to use the shocking streams of electricity around it to your advantage. Any player that touches these streams won't get knocked out of the game, but will instead get stunned for an instant, letting you creep up with the orb to spell their doom. If you move the stream with their character, then you could potentially get multiple stuns on them in a row. On the flip side, if you're moving the stream opposite of their direction, then you'll likely only get a single stun. The more often you corner your targets and read their jumps by having them land on your streams for some stuns, the easier it'll be for you to blast them out of the arena. If you know one player on the team 
team is a bit better than the other two, then target them first since they'll have to deal with both you and their teammates, who they can accidentally run into. If you're on the team, then dash and jump for open space as often as possible. The streams won't kill you nor make you stronger, so avoid them lest you want to get stunned and subsequently blasted out of the arena by the orb. When jumping, make sure you're holding A to perform the biggest one you can. Tapping A quickly won't give you the height necessary to leap over anything electrical, so you gotta wonder why it was implemented. My guess is that it's a way you can fake out the solo player, but I've always found that moving towards a safe space is a lot more reliable. Don't jump on your teammates' heads unless you're trying to throw the minigame. If your head gets jumped on, then your movement speed will be reduced, but not your jump height. At least not to a significant degree. While keeping your jump height is nice, losing your movement speed makes you an easy target for the solo player to zap you, which is why your team should be spread out so that you don't accidentally get in one another's way. If the orb is headed straight towards you and not stopping, then you can actually run towards it and perform a full hop to the opposite side. This is a Hail Mary move that should only be done if you're in a really tight spot or for style points. If the solo player knows you're about to jump over the orb, then all they have to do to counter this Chad play is move their orb in the opposite direction they were going so that they can catch your landing. But it seems like a good chunk of players get thrown off when a member of the team runs towards their weapon, so the decision of executing this technique is all up to you. 1v3 Mic Minigames The solo player is the one that speaks into the mic, which controls what they do in the minigame. The team of three control their characters as they normally would. Would. Under normal circumstances, this setup is in favor of the team of three for three reasons. One, if the mic's on the fritz, it may not register the solo player's commands. Two, opponents can easily disrupt the solo player's commands by shouting into the mic themselves. And three, the solo player is literally announcing what action they are going to take in the minigame, making counterplay by the team of three a cakewalk. If you just want to play the mic minigames normally, you'll probably want to turn the mic off, which will disable these minigames from showing up while you play on the board, or you can pick the setting that allows the solo player to select their commands by using their controller. This fixes all three issues. Their commands will be registered, opponents can't disrupt them by shouting, and it won't be entirely obvious what the solo player's next move will be, since they're now selecting their commands from a prompt in the corner of the screen instead of speaking them out loud. The only other downside to using a controller instead of the mic normally during these minigames is that there are secret commands that can only be issued through the mic. That's right, these commands do not show up on the controller's command window. Only three of the five minigames have secret commands, and of the ones that do have them, only half of the commands are great. So unfortunately, it's not enough to offset the imbalance between using the mic normally and using a controller, but I respect the effort they went to try and even things out. You may have noticed that they keep specifying using the mic normally over and over again. And that's because while most people only see two options to playing these minigames, using the mic and using a controller, I see three. Using the mic, using a controller, and using the mic but with code words. Here's the thing, the mic isn't perfect. Sometimes words that don't even sound like commands will trigger the command to work. For example, if in Fruit Talk Tale you were to say, corn, then for some reason the mic will register that as melon. Why does this matter? Because if you can find at corn. least one word or phrase that correlates to each command for each minigame, then you can issue voice commands corn. without your opponents knowing what you're up to. This even trumps the controller's way of doing things. That prompt it pulls up which you've got to select a command from is something all your opponents can easily see if they look out for it. Whereas by issuing code word commands, your orders sound like complete corn. nonsense and yet they accomplish what you want. But we could take this further. Who says that your code words have to be nonsense like corn? What if you could say a code word that sounds like it would activate one command, but actually activates another so that you can throw your opponents off? Back to Fruit Talk Tale, what if you were to say purple? Most players, upon hearing this command, will assume that purple refers to the purple grapes, but in reality, the game registers this command as apple. Oh, but zooms like corn and melon and purple and apple have the same ending, so for those who know this trick, they'll easily be able to adapt. You really think so? How about berry? Certainly the game would register that command as strawberry, right? Maybe it'll accidentally register banana because of the bee. 
Nope. Berry equals melon. I'm as lost as you are. I don't know why this is the case. We can take this even further by not even saying real words. What Born if you were to deep. just say made up words or complete gibberish into the mic? This can result the in the game registering a command too. Although I personally wouldn't do this as much as the code words Ring due to taco. not wanting to leave it up to luck or have the possibility of no command going through. But what if, despite it all, we wanted to advance this code word metagame even further beyond? I'm talking about taking this international. If one of your opponents knows more than one language, then try saying one of the commands in the language they know. This will completely throw them off since the command they hear will not line up with the command that executes on screen. Here's what this strategy would look like if it was used against an English speaker on a Japanese copy of the game. Grapes. Apple. It's confusing, right? There's probably hundreds, if not thousands of different words or phrases that you could say in order to hide what your true commands are from your opponents. Feel free to experiment with what works and what doesn't so that you'll have more tools under your belt. What's also cool is that by using the mic, you also allow yourself the ability to activate the secret commands, which again, only a few of which are great, but having the option to use them is appreciated. With all that said, let's hop into the mic minigames and cover the strategies for each playstyle. Fruit Talktail. One player says the name of a fruit, the other players have to scramble to the corresponding spaces before the other spaces fall. The commands are strawberry, apple, melon, orange, grape, and banana. The layout is different every time. If you're the solo player, then look for which fruits are on the outskirts. These are the ones you want to call out when players are in the middle so that they have to take a longer time trying to reach them. If two players are right next to each other, then call out a fruit that's right beside them. If they're uncoordinated, then they'll fumble over one another trying to stand on the same space. Using a code word command for either of these situations is recommended. In fact, you could start the minigame by saying fruits like normal just to suddenly say your nonsensical code word to throw your opponents off before they realize which platform they need to move to. Eliminating the last player can be tricky, but if you call out the fruit that's furthest from them as soon as the rest of the platforms pop back up, then they won't have enough time to find where said fruit is. If you call it too early, then the command won't register, and if you wait too long to call it, then they'll get a chance to observe the field and adapt quickly, so make sure you're saying it at the right time. Using a controller here isn't too unbalanced since the team needs to watch your prompt to see which command you select, as well as the floor that falls around them. Regardless, you want to select your commands as quickly as possible so they get little time to see which fruit is next. If you're on the team of three, then spread out a bit so you don't trip over one another. When the solo player makes a command, immediately dash to the correct fruit. If they're using code word commands, then keep positioning yourself in the middle of every kind of fruit so you can adapt to the right platform no matter what they say. You've got to have some good reaction time for this, though. Shoot your mouth off! One player gives attack orders to Shy Guys, while the other three avoid a bombardment of bombs and bullet bills. Each of the nine numbers correlates to either a row of bombs or a row of bullet bills. When a number is ordered, the closest available Shy Guy will fulfill that order. The number above a Shy Guy's head indicates what order that Shy Guy is currently fulfilling. While this indicator is present, they cannot be ordered to do anything else. This is an important mechanic to understand, because if you throw out orders without considering which Shy Guys are available and which aren't, then you might waste time by accidentally having a Shy Guy walk all the way to the other side of the field, a task that could have easily been done by a shy guy that was already there had you just waited a moment for them to finish what they were doing. The bullet bills take a while to get going and they're gone in a flash, making them a bit predictable and not very threatening. What I like to do is spam the orders 1, 3, and 7 over and over again. Each of these numbers correlates to a row of the bombs and each number has a shy guy right next to it. And if you keep inputting these commands as soon as each shy guy is ready to receive one, then the field should be flooding with bombs, giving the team of three quite a struggle, especially because the bombs can't be moved. This requires the team of three to avoid corners and stick to the sides or middle, which can be dangerous with how many explosives with legs are walking about. If your opponents are managing to scrape by with these bombs, then sending a single shy guy to bullet bill row four, which covers the middle lane, should do the trick. If you're using a mic, then throw in the secret zero command, which will cause three thwomps to randomly fall onto three of the nine 
nine potential spots on the field. They fall quite fast and can quickly dispose of players that are unfortunate enough to get caught in their path. I'd keep this surprise for when the field is flooded with babomps, since the impact of the thwomps will cause the shy guys to not take orders for a few seconds. Any thwomp that slams on the babomp will also cause it to explode preemptively. While these thwomps are indeed fast, their main problem is that they interrupt every command a shy guy is currently doing, which isn't always a bad thing. What if you messed up a command and started making a shy guy move to the wrong place? If you say zero, then you can cancel all of the shy guy's commands while still keeping pressure on your opponents. If you're on the team of three, then be weary of the babomps. They are your worst enemy. Earlier I said you can get cornered, but did you know that it's also possible to get cornered on the side? I didn't think it was possible, but it is. Always look for openings to run around in so that you don't get blown up. If the solo player readies a bullet bill, then don't overreact and stay away from that lane longer than you need to. The bullet bill enters and exits the arena fairly quick, so a quick dodge is all you need for it. If the zero command is used, then watch the ground for shadows that indicate where each thwomp will slam down. You've got to be quick to react though. Code word commands are basically pointless in this minigame since each shy guy's movement and indicator above their heads make it obvious what each command entails. Talky walky. One player speaks commands to reach the goal. The other three will try to hit them with a spiny. The commands are forward, left, right, and move back. If you're the solo player, then move forward whenever there's not a cursor in front of you. If you do see one, then move to any opening on the right or left. If there isn't one and you're surrounded on each of these sides, then either stand still until one of the players are done throwing or move back to the square behind you. You can't give commands while moving, which is a very important detail to remember because if you accidentally order your character to move while they're already in motion, then they will not receive that command and will instead stand still, waiting for another as your opponents get ready to chuck a spiny. You'll know when you're good to go when your character stops moving. You have a full 60 seconds from the start of the minigame to get to the end, so there's no need to rush. If you're on the team of three, then surround the solo player as much as you can. The optimal setup is for one teammate to constantly shoot at where the solo player is standing, which forces them to move. One teammate to constantly shoot at the space in front of the solo player, which makes it more difficult for them to make progress, and one teammate to cover the sides, so that the solo player struggles in making an escape. If this coordination is done properly, then the solo player will have a difficult time avoiding the spinies, but most of the time the team won't be this well coordinated, so you should be following your opponent with your cursor and shooting the space ahead of them to prevent any progress. Your cursor cannot overlap with a team's cursor, so don't be thrown off by that little detail. Be careful when using code word commands here. They might be useful in making your movements unpredictable, but one wrong move and you're a goner. This is especially true if you're on the sides of the platform since you can fall off for an immediate game over. Make sure you're careful. Verbal Assault One player commands a heavily armed battlecraft. The other three have to destroy it. The battlecraft has 300 HP total. It has six green knobs which are indicators for how much HP it has left, with the single green knob being worth 50 HP. After the battlecraft suffered a few blows, one of the green knobs will slowly turn red and eventually break, showing that 50 points of damage have been dealt. The team of three's lasers deal the same one point of damage no matter how beat up they are and no matter where their shot lands on the battlecraft. The fans of the battlecraft cannot be hit. The solo player has four regular attack commands at their disposal. Fire, Missile, Drop Bombs, and Laser. Fire will cause two flamethrowers to sweep the area in front of the battlecraft. They have short range and can be dodged simply by keeping to the bottom of the screen. As the solo player, you should only use this attack if your opponents are in your face. Doing so at this point will give them hardly any time to make it to the bottom of the screen where they'd be safe. Missile will cause the battlecraft to fire six missiles in a spread formation, which the team of three can dodge by moving in between the missiles. This can be more easily done the further the team players are away from the battlecraft since the missiles will be more spread out and allow more room between them. I do not recommend this attack as the solo player. These missiles just don't come out fast enough to make them worth it. Drop bombs will launch multiple bombs onto random areas of the road, which explode into pillars of fire that linger briefly. This is an excellent attack that you should be using often due to the unpredictability of where the bombs will land and how difficult it can be for the team to navigate the pillars of fire. If you're on the team, then quickly scope out for any openings in between the pillars and watch your machine's legs so that you don't get burnt. 
laser will fire two large beams straight down. They can be avoided by staying to the sides of the road or by staying between the lasers. Doing the latter is pretty difficult, so I recommend that you stick to hugging the sides of the arena the moment you realize this attack's coming. If you can't make it in time, then shimmy your way in between the beams and mimic the battlecraft's movement to avoid taking damage. If you're the solo player, then fire your laser when your opponents are in the middle of the field. The solo player also has two secret command attacks that they can use, Goomba and Bullet Bill. Goomba will cause multiple Goombas to jump out of the battlecraft and roll straight forward. There can be as few as two Goombas popping out to as many as 10, which by the way is scary to deal with as the team of three since 10 Goombas can cover quite a wide range. If the solo player uses this cursed command, then keep to the sides of the arena so that you won't get goomba If you're the solo player, then treat this command as a bit of a wild card. Sometimes it won't do crap and sometimes it can do a lot for you. I use it to throw off a opponents that have gotten into the rhythm of dodging the usual attacks. Bullet Bill will launch a single Bullet Bill from the Battlecraft. It moves slowly and homes in on the nearest opponent. The only way to dodge it is by moving forward and around to make it do a spin. If you perform this well enough, then you can send the Bullet Bill right back at the Battlecraft, dealing 10 points of damage, which isn't a lot, but certainly enough to make this maneuver worth it. Alternatively, you can just send the Bullet Bill into a wall. If the Bullet Bill doesn't hit a target after 6 seconds, then it'll aim straight down and slowly move off screen. It still has a hitbox when it does this by the way. This little trick to evade the bullet bill isn't one that most players will know how to do without a little experimentation, so if none of your opponents know the trick, then just spam this move over and over again for an easy win. If only one or two players don't know the trick, then only spawn the bullet bill when your battlecraft is at its closest to them. If you're on the team of three and the solo player is attempting to get rid of a player via bullet bill, then you can divert it by getting closer to it than your teammate and sending it right back at your opponent. As with all mic minigames, you want to make sure you don't say a command before the game's ready to register it. With attacks that open up the hatch, you'll know that they're finished once the hatch closes. With attacks that fire at the opponents, you'll know when it's done once the weapon has fully disappeared. You know what weapon never fully disappears though? These spikes on the front of the battlecraft. Yup, they deal damage. Steer clear of them if you're the team, or bait people closer if you're the solo player. If you say a command that isn't recognized into the mic, then gears will spring out of the battlecraft. They don't deal any damage and are simply a cute reminder that you didn't speak right. This minigame benefits a little bit from code word commands. Some attacks simply have too much startup time to be surprising no matter what word you say, such as the bullet bill, whereas others can catch you off guard, such as the laser. Now for some funny code word commands. Subscribe activates nothing, 2 activates the Goomba command, Zoom activates the Missile command, and Zyke also activates the Missile command. <laughs> if 5 minutes pass with neither side victorious, it's a tie. Word heard. One player shouts orders to herd the Goombas away from the other players who will try to punch them out of the corral. The commands are up, down, left, right, and scramble. As the solo player, your job is to get the Goombas as far away from the team of three as possible. The longer they waste time trying to reach Goombas to punch them out of the arena, the better. There is an issue though, and that's the fact that the up, down, left, and right commands will make Goombas run in whichever direction for a bit too long, often causing them to clump against the wall of the arena, which is obviously a terrible position for you. It's for this reason that you want to make use of the scramble command, which will spread out the Goombas from any clumps or bad spots they may have gotten themselves into. Don't try to save all of them. If a player is off on the sidelines focusing on a single Goomba, then don't say a command to try and save them. That'll put everyone else at risk. You've got to keep an eye on which direction the players are punching your minions so that you can adapt to their movements. Saying the secret command Ukiki will cause one of the three Ukikis around the arena to throw an apple at one of the team players, stunning them if hit. After Nukiki throws an apple, they will leave, meaning you've only got three uses of this command since there are only three Ukikis present at the start. While the stun time is long, the time it takes to use this command and the possibility of it missing leaves a lot to be desired. I'd much rather spend my time moving around the Goombas instead of leaving them vulnerable for a chance to stun one of the players. But hey, maybe all you need is a good old Ukiki to clench the win. If you're on the team of three, then prioritize smacking out the Goombas that are already 
already against the wall of the arena. This will save you a lot of time chasing after Goombas that are in the middle, which is much better suited for the end game when there's only a few remaining. If you see a clump of Goombas, then you can get away with hitting two at the same time, given you're close enough. It should go without saying that you and your teammates should be split up. A good solo player will notice if the entire team is in one spot, and will take advantage of this by moving all the Goombas away from your team. Spreading out puts more stress on which way the solo player should move their Goombas. When there's only a few Goombas left, simply run up to one and punch it over and over until it's out of the ring. No matter what commands the solo player shouts, they will not go through, since repeatedly punching a Goomba will not give it enough time to move. 2v2 minigames, Body Builder. Take turns stopping the wheel at the right spot to pick apart and build a robot. The first team to build a complete robot wins. The glowing section on the wheel shows you the next part you need. The order of pieces will always go feet, legs, arms, and head. The first turn will always belong to the left player. Timing your button press is fairly lax here. Don't overthink it and simply press A right as your target object is entering the yellow brackets in the middle. When a player's turn begins, they must wait for the machines to spin through every piece before they're allowed to jump. So if the headpiece is within your brackets and it's your turn, then that means that the headpiece is the earliest possible one you can get if you're mashing A. Knowing this, you're free to mash A when the piece you need is within your brackets. What piece everyone's machine starts on is completely random. Why does that matter? Do recall that the order of pieces needed will always go feet, legs, arms, and head. So if red team's left machine starts on feet and blue team's left machine starts on legs, then all the red team's left player has to do is button mash A and they'll get their feet piece as early as possible. Whereas the blue team has to wait for three more pictures to spin by before they're able to obtain their feet piece. Sure, the right player on the unlucky team might get lucky and bounce things out, but they could also get bad luck for their team again. This is an unfortunate downside to an otherwise alright minigame that will only matter if each team makes the same amount of mistakes or lack thereof. Burn Style Jump to avoid the spiky turnstile. Whichever team is left standing wins. If the minigame ends with no players left standing, such as two players falling into lava at the same time, then the winner will be selected at random. Before the minigame starts, you'll see the turnstile turning clockwise or counterclockwise. Whichever direction it goes is the one it'll continue to go for the entire entire minigame. It will not change directions. This minigame's difficulty instead comes from the turnstile slowly speeding up with every revolution. You need to hold the A button if you wish to perform a jump high enough to go over the burn style. Just tapping A will grant you a pathetic jump that barely leaves the ground. Why didn't the devs make full hops the default? Because if you full hop when the burn style is going at max speed, then you have very little time to input another jump before it swings back around. But between you and me, most players aren't good enough to reach that point in this minigame, so feel free to full hop until the speed becomes unwieldy. If a player gets jumped on by their teammate, then their movement speed will be reduced, but they can still jump. So if this happens to you, then don't panic and focus on timing your next jump. It should go without saying that knowing your teammate with jumps isn't the best idea unless you want to throw this minigame. My personal favorite spot to stay in when jumping over the burn style is here, where if I jump too early or too late, then I have enough room above and below me to correct my position. The fastest part of any rotating object is the end of it, so if you position yourself as far away from the burn style as possible, then you lessen the amount of frames where it can hit you. Alternatively, if you were to chill near its base where it's at its slowest, then there are more frames where it's up in your business, making it more difficult to avoid, especially at higher speeds. This is also why on TikTok hop from Mario Party 3, players often feel more comfortable being on the tip than on the base, because you're given more leeway. Cashapult, a coin minigame. Launch into the air and grab as many floating coins as you can. You get to keep any coins you collect. Wait a minute, this looks familiar. This from Crap, from quiet Mario down. Party what are you doing here? This is spoilers. Get out. Okay, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry about that interruption. I have a bit of a bad habit of time traveling between videos. Anyways, Cashapult, each player only gets two jobs. Jumps. Work together to get as many coins as possible. This minigame has four coin layouts it can choose from, and both teams will get the same layout. Unfortunately, you aren't
aren't shown which layout you're given before the minigame starts, and there doesn't seem to be any tells to help figure it out either. Regardless, these layouts aren't greatly different from one another, and your strategy should remain relatively the same if you're going first, that is, hold right as you blast through the cloud. No matter which variation it is, you're bound to get a few coins on your way up. After you grab the last possible coin from your ascension, immediately hold left to start grabbing the coins on your side as you descend. There will be a coin or two in the top left corner that'll get left behind, but we'll get to them later. You might initially think that your teammate in this scenario should just do the same moves you did except mirrored, but this isn't the case because they have something that you didn't when starting your turn what the coin layout is. The maneuver I told you is the one I believe covers all four layouts rather well, but if I knew which one I was getting exactly, then I'd change things up a bit of course. This is your teammate's situation. They should be paying attention during your turn and looking at which layout was dealt and hold the direction that sends their character to the most coins when rising, and then move towards where the most coins are on their side when falling. You can still gather a lot of coins by crossing over to each other's sides, but I find that the coins end up being in an easier to gather pattern more consistently when both teammates stick to their own sides. It's also easier to communicate too. When the second turn comes around, rise to those coins you left behind in the corner on your first turn and immediately move to the middle and grab the cleanest row of coins as you fall. This turn is important, because if you miss a coin or two when falling, then your teammate in this scenario won't be able to grab everything, so focus on a clean shot downwards. Your teammate's second turn is as simple as aiming for the last bit of coins left in the air, but if the situation is more complicated and there's multiple paths of coins to choose from, then they should simply choose the route that grants you both the most. Clean team, team up with a partner to fight window grime. The first team to clean up all the muck off their windows wins. If neither team knows how to clean up after themselves for five minutes, then it's a tie. There will always be six splats of grime to clean up, with each team receiving the same layout. In order to remove grime, it first needs to be sprayed on by one player and then wiped by the other. Wiping grime before it's been sprayed on will only make me disgusted, so don't do that. <laughs> Spraying on or wiping grime is as easy as a single A press in front of the desired window. What's interesting is that this A press will interrupt your run, so if you mash A as you run in front of grime, then you'll spray or wipe at the earliest possible moment. Where the difficulty comes from in this minigame is how each player on a team navigates the area by avoiding buckets, which serve as walls, and not obstructing their own player. That's right, you two have collision. This can cause many a problem if you go in to spray some grime and your teammates blocking your only exit. You want to clean these windows as fast as possible, but you don't want to be in such a hurry that you accidentally slow things down trying to let your partner pass you. The player with the spray bottle must always be in the lead since spraying grime must come first. When the sprayer goes to clean some grime and there's a bucket on that level, then their only way to leave is back the way they came, which the wiper should recognize and subsequently move to the ladder so that their partner can ascend to the next floor while they wipe up what's just been sprayed. Literally rinse and repeat this maneuver until you come across a floor that has no buckets, in which case the wiper is free to follow the sprayer right beside them since there's an exit on the other side. Garden Grab Team up with a partner to uproot a giant carrot. Press the displayed button to pull. The team to uproot its carrot first wins. If both teams completely forget how to press buttons and can't manage to pull out this carrot in five minutes, then it's a tie. The possible buttons that you'll be prompted to hit during this minigame are B, A, Y, X, L, and R. When the minigame begins, a random player on the team will be prompted one of these buttons, which they then have to react to and press as quickly as possible. Then their teammate has to react to whatever button pops up for them, and so on and so forth until both players on the team have correctly inputted four buttons each. Unfortunately, this is a straightforward reaction-based challenge, yeah right? Guess what, if you press the wrong button when prompted, then you aren't punished. You're you're not stunned for even a moment. What this means is that you don't even have to play this reaction game. You can just mash all six buttons, B, A, Y, X, L, and R, repeatedly, and you'll be guaranteed to fulfill the prompt instantly without worry. There's no reason not to do this unless you don't want to cheese this part of the minigame for some reason, or your reaction time is a lot better than your opponent's and you don't want to potentially reveal this strat and level the playing field. After mashing all six buttons for easy cheese strats, this final stretch of the minigame prompts you to mash but a single button, the one floating above your head. Don't mash the one above anyone else's, 
just yours. It'll only ask you to mash one of four buttons, A, B, Y, and X. L and R will not show up for this mashing portion of the minigame, which makes sense because I wouldn't want to lose because my opponents got to mash A and B while my partner and I got stuck mashing triggers. <laughs> when you see one of the four buttons above your head, mash it as fast as possible and pull that bad boy out. Gondola Glide. Press the button displayed on the gates repeatedly to move your gondola forward. The first team to reach the goal wins. If neither team reaches the goal after five minutes, it's a tie. This is a button mashing minigame that requires you to switch between mashing A and B when prompted. You will always go through an A gate first, so you should be ready to mash A as soon as the minigame is about to start. From that point onwards, pay close attention to every gate you come across. If it's an A gate, then mash A when you go through it. If it's a B gate, then mash B when you go through it. It's possible to go through the same gate multiple times. Don't assume that you'll always be alternating. When it does come time to switch which button you're mashing, don't switch too early or too late. Doing so will slow your gondola down and lose speed. You want to make the switch the instant your gondola plows through the gate. If you're concerned about timing this transition, then I recommend not pressing anything for a split second before hitting the gate. Then, when you do hit it, mash the button that it told you to. This can be a tiresome button masher, so the more endurance and focus you have when playing this minigame, the better. Fun fact, the wire your gondola is on matches the color of the last gate you went through. This probably won't help you out since it's easy to remember which button the last gate had, but I think it's a cute detail. Jump the gun. One player creates a bridge by shooting bullet bills while the other jumps across them to reach the goal. If both teams are atrocious at 2D platforming and can't reach the goal within 5 minutes, then it's a tie. The player shooting bullet bills should not waste their time hitting every target since the player jumping across bullet bills can leap quite the gap. As for vertical height, they can make jumps to targets two spaces higher than them as long as they don't have to jump more than one target's length across. As for horizontal distance, they can make jumps to targets two spaces away from them as long as they'd be landing on the same level. The distance they can make is obviously increased when jumping from a higher position to a lower one, where they can clear targets a little more than two spaces away from them with this added leverage. To jump as high as possible, the runner needs to hold down the A button instead of just tapping it. Knowing what jumps the runner can make is the job of the gunner, who should be shooting their bullet bills at targets that are spaced out enough so the runner can make more distance, but not so spaced out that the runner can't clear the jumps. The gunner should also keep in mind the runner's skill level. There's no point in hitting targets with a bit of space between them if the runner isn't comfortable enough to make those jumps. It'd be a lot smarter to lessen the distance so that some progress is made instead of no progress because the runner keeps falling from how difficult the jumps are. If the runner falls, then the gunner can still fire during their teammate's stun animation. This time should be spent making the jump the gunner failed a bit easier so that they don't get stuck on the same section. Light Breeze can only be played during nighttime. Swing your fan to spin a wind turbine and generate electricity. The first team to fill their electricity meter wins. If both teams have something against wind turbines for 5 minutes, then it's a tie. This is a simple button masher where you alternate pressing your L and R buttons as quickly as possible. What's cool about this one is that the game shows you how much each player on a team contributed to filling a gauge. So if you're doing awful and your teammate carries you, then you bet the game's gonna snitch. Mullet, daytime version. Jump to smack the Monty Moles as they emerge from pipes overhead. The team with the most points wins. If the teams have an equal amount of points by the end, it's a tie. Monty Moles are worth one point, Golden Monty Moles are worth three points. Hitting a Piranha Plant will temporarily stun you for a second. Both players on the team should stay separated and a little away from the middle so that the most amount of ground is covered. If you see a Golden Monty on your side, then get it. Three points is a big deal. If it's on your partner's side and they're too far away to get it in time or got stunned by a Piranha Plant, then trespass to their side and do the job yourself, then return to your own side. The plant boys are nothing to scoff at, so if you jump then make sure you're doing so for a reason, otherwise you might suffer from an entire second of stun time, which can be crucial to clutching out a win. Quickly tapping A won't give you the height to hit a Monty, you need to hold it to hit him. Thankfully, you can't stomp on your teammate in this minigame, so there's no need to worry about friendly fire. Nighttime version. Ground pound Monty Moles that peek out of pipes. The team with the most points wins. If the teams have an equal amount of points by the end, it's a tie. If you run into a Monty Mole, then it'll retreat back into the pipe and you'll get stunned for a quick moment. So watch where you're going lest you accidentally run into a golden Monty Mole and lose out on a three-point buffet. Jumping on a Monty 
Bounty Mole won't count as a hit, you need to ground pound them by pressing A when in the air. You can perform quick ground pounds by mashing A, which will give you a short hop followed by a ground pound as soon as you're able to. Jumps and ground pounds have no effect on your teammate, so no worries there. Standing on the warp pipe will make it so nothing pops out of it. Not a Monty Mole, not a Piranha Plant. This is somewhat necessary since you need somewhere to stand, but if you stand in between two pipes, then you count as standing on both of them, meaning you're blocking two spawn areas instead of the usual one, which is awful. Never stand in between two warp pipes. If you wanted to make it so you aren't covering up any spawn areas, then you could opt in for standing off to the side, which isn't recommended as it keeps you away from most of the action. I'd only do this if multiple piranha plants popped out near the middle and I'm hoping for some Montes to spawn on the sides. If a piranha plant's blocking your path, you can jump over it. It's a little tight, but if you get the hang of it, then that's one less thing standing in your way to victory. Pixel Perfect! Ground pound floor panels to change their color and make them match the example. The team that scores two points first wins. If a winner isn't chosen after five rounds, it's a tie. Getting ground pounded in this minigame is absolutely brutal. Should you suffer the wrath of your teammates but, or they yours, then the receiver will be stunned for three seconds, which is a decade in Mario Party minigame time. But wait, there is more. Ground pounds in this minigame will cause the initiator to bounce off their victim and ground pound the floor too. Normally, the ground pound would just end after hitting someone with it, but here, it continues until you hit the ground. And for a minigame where you have to be careful which square you ground pound, that can hold you back. So the moral of the story, be careful with your booty. Getting jumped on sucks too, but it'll only reduce your movement speed, still letting you ground pound like normal. When the minigame begins, immediately head towards a corner and dart your eyes between the squares you're next to and the example above. Move to the next square if it already matches the example or ground pound the one you're on if it doesn't. If you finish your side early and your teammate's still working on theirs, then help them out starting with the square furthest from them so that you can both cover more ground and minimize getting in each other's way. You cannot ground pound multiple squares at the same time. Rocky Road. Team up with a partner to bust apart boulders that are blocking the scenic road. The first team to reach the goal wins. If neither team reaches the goal, after five minutes passes, it's a tie. Your options are punching and jump kicks. Both of these actions will stun your teammate if they connect, but jump kicks will put them in stun for a split second longer. Punches are easier to do, what with only needing to mash B, but they aren't as quick at breaking boulders as jump kicks are, which require just a little more finesse to get right. You can hold A to do a high jump and then press B, but that's just a waste of time. To get the most out of a jump kick, you want to tap A for a short hop and then immediately tap B right after. If your character falls to the ground while doing a kick and you didn't see it connect, then you pressed B too late. It's a quick maneuver of tapping A and then B right after. Simple as that. On the first stage, both players should keep to their own boulder. If a member on the team finishes their boulder off before their partner, then they should only go help if there's room to do so. This is why you always want to leave an opening for your partner to help out in case you mess up. When you clear a stage by destroying all boulders, both characters on the team will automatically run back to the car. But if a player got stunned by their teammate's attack, then they need to wait for the stun animation to complete before progressing, which is why you want to avoid friendly fire at all costs. On the second stage, you're only dealing with a single boulder, meaning your teammate will be right beside you. You're free to jump kick under these circumstances, but you need to be careful with how you aim, unless you want to suffer a time penalty. If you're not confident in your aim, then go for punches instead. On the third stage, you've got three boulders to handle. You and your teammate should break down each boulder on your respective side, and then when you're done, immediately move to the middle, leaving room for the other to join in. On the fourth stage, you've got two big boy boulders in your way. Treat them like you would any other pair of boulders and split the task with your partner. The fifth and final stage is the easiest one. It's a single huge boulder that you and your partner can both kick while staying a relatively safe distance away from one another. Once this bad boy's down, this is a rocky road no more. Slot Trot. Team up with a partner and run along the wheels to match the symbols at the top of the screen. Earn three points to win. If five rounds pass without a winner, it's a tie. If both teams match the symbols at the same time, then they'll both score a point. If they both score their third point at the same time, then it's a tie. This is the order the symbols will always be in, but where each player on a team starts on the wheel is random. Knowing where each symbol is in relation to the others will let you match the example pretty quickly. No matter how quick you are though, if your teammate is, 
less skilled and having a hard time making a match, then your team won't get any points. You could let your teammate know which direction to spin if you're keeping track of both symbols on the example, or just lay back and let things run their course. Try not to undershoot or overshoot the target symbol when you get to it. Things can get a little slippery when you're going fast, so take it easy to line the symbol up within your bracket, and you'll be good to go. Battle mini games. All right, all right, here, here it comes. All right, hope I remember my lines. <laughs> Control stick. Tilt the control stick and C stick so that your left and right hands match the directions displayed on the screen. Last player standing hey. wins. No! What are you doing here? Remember that Mario Party Advance video? Which one? The April Fools? Wait, there's gonna be multiple? I, I mean, uh, no, there's not gonna be more than one Mario Party Advance video. That's not gonna happen. Hold on, saying that might have some serious ramp. What'd you do? Where'd it go? Oh, come on, dude. I put a lot of work into that one. Gosh, whatever. I remember now, Mario Party Advance, April Fool's, good meme. Can you leave now? You kind of just interrupted one of my favorite mini games in the franchise. Which one? Oh, is this control stick? Dude, I love this one. I know, right? Okay, wait. This isn't going to work. You got to go back. You can't send me back, dude. It's Mario Party Advance. I should have known better. Let me play a game of control stick with you instead. I... Please... I... Alrighty. Ah, uh, yeah! Looks like we're evenly matched. Of course! I'd expect as much from myself. <laughs> so, uh... I forgot. How did you get here again? Wacky watch. Oh, yeah. It's a pretty good item. It really is, though. Yeah. You know what else is? The reverse mushroom? Yeah, how'd you know? How would I not? It's the most overpowered item in the whole f What are you doing? NANI! Ah, uh, I remember being on the receiving end of that years ago. Boy, am I glad to be on the other side of it now. An identifying luck video for Mario Party Advance. What a stupid April Fool's joke that was. Where were we? Oh, right. Control Stick, one of my favorite minigames in the franchise due to how palm sweaty it makes your mom spaghetti. Any players that get out at the same time together will tie with one another. The game is simple. The example on screen will display two arrows. The left one is where you have to tilt your analog stick, and the right one is where you have to tilt your C stick. Should you not match the order on screen in time, you will be sentenced to a vertical slide. And trust me, they are not as fun as they sound. Each round, the speed will increase, lessening the amount of time you have to match what you see on screen. It's okay if you input the wrong direction at first, so long as you match what's on screen at the end of a round. This means that you can screw around all you like beforehand, especially in the earlier rounds, but I don't recommend doing so when the minigame decides to speed up. Hyper Sniper. Fire at the targets as they scroll down the screen. Whoever scores the most points, wins. Any players that score the same amount of points will tie with one another. The possible point targets you can shoot are 10, 30, 50, and 100. The higher the point value, the smaller the target is. Despite this, you should only be shooting at 100 point targets, nothing else. They are far too valuable, and ignoring them to hit a 30 point target or a <laughs> 10 point target is a huge waste of time. I can forgive you for shooting something other than a 100 point target if you can't find any on the screen, but seriously, they are one of the two things that will make or break this minigame for you. The second, the big ol' Bowser target, baby! That's right! Hitting this bad boy will multiply your points by zero. Don't sound too excited, though, because all that means is your points will get reduced to zero. So don't hit this huge target lest you wish to suffer that wrath. You can move your cursor and shoot whatever target you want on the entire screen. But keep in mind that your shots have travel time, meaning that the further away your target is, the longer it'll take for your projectile to get there. This means that if you and another player shoot at the same target at the exact same time, then whoever's character is closer will be the one to get it. For this reason, you should stay within a range somewhat close to your character so that you hit targets quicker and not lose them to other players. If there's a threat in the game that needs to be stopped, then follow where their cursor goes and attempt to steal the targets around it to deny them of any points. Insectoride. Pick a locomotion machine and start racing. Whoever reaches the goal first wins. Any players that reach the goal at the same time or don't make it after five minutes passes will tie with one another. Red is a button masher. We've got to press the button it says 10 times in a row before moving on to the next one. The possible buttons for mashing are A, 
B, X, and Y. The same button won't appear twice. If you hit the wrong button at any time, then you'll get stunned and a different button for mashing will show up. Blue is reaction based, where you've got to press the button that shows up as quickly as you can before moving on to the next one. The possible buttons are A, B, X, Y, L, and R. If you press a wrong button, then you'll get stunned. Yellow is timing based, where the distance you go is dependent upon when you press A. For the furthest distance, press A when the snail stretches out to his maximum length, which takes about one second from the moment he starts moving. Press A at any other point won't let you go max distance and isn't recommended. Green requires you to hit a set of buttons in a row before moving on to the next one. The possible buttons are A, B, X, Y, L, and R. Buttons can repeat and there's no punishment for failing a button. You can't mash all of the buttons on your controller to cheese this, only single inputs count. As you can see, each of these machines are attuned to a different skill set, meaning you should choose the one that best fits your strength. However, I recommend not choosing the blue machine which is reaction based. To succeed with this one, you need to react quickly to each input and not mess up lest you get stunned. If reaction timing is your thing, then go for the green one instead, where you can quickly react to all inputs in a row without any worry of being stunned for a mistake. The green machine in general is a great selection even for those that don't have good reaction time. It goes far for how many inputs you have to execute. If you can master the timing on the yellow machine, then it's a force to be reckoned with. Thing is, most people don't get the timing right so they end up feeling like a snail. The red machine is fair if you're good at mashing, but I'd much rather choose the green machine or the yellow one if I had the opportunity. Stamp by me. Stamp the pieces of paper as they zoom zike by you on the conveyor belt. Whoever stamps the most correctly, wins. There will always be a fast moving conveyor belt and a slow moving conveyor belt. Keep most of your focus on the fast moving one, since that will require stricter timing due to its speed. The slower moving one can be missed by players, but its lax pace gives you more time to realize it's within your range to hit it. If both the fast belt and slow belt are delivering you a piece of paper at nearly the same time, then hit the one on the fast belt first. I'll often see players try and wait for the slow belt's paper because it's closer, but it comes at such a slow speed that they end up letting the fast belt's paper zip on by. Don't let this be you, and you'll have this minigame mastered in no time. Strawberry Short Fuse. Pick a monkey with a cake to stay in the game. Choose a monkey with a bomb, and you're out. The last player standing wins. If after three rounds there's more than one player left standing, then the remaining players will tie with one another. The game begins with ten ukikis holding trays containing five bombs and five cakes. Like any good waiters, they cover their trays to keep them safe and run around the room like crazy until they return to their previous knee formation, except now they're all mixed up. Players then take turns choosing a new kiki. If it has a cake, then the player's safe. If it has a bomb, then not so much. If a new kiki with a cake is chosen, then it'll show up on the background's conveyor belt and a light will turn on, indicating how many cakes out of five have already been chosen. When it comes to choosing which new kikis to memorize, the answer may not be so clear cut. Before the minigame starts, the players can see which order they're going to take their turns in. It's a lot better to go first and a lot worse to go last. But Zoomzike, isn't this just Bowser's big blast all over again? Aren't everyone's odds of getting out first equal? No, and that's because of this memorization deal the minigame makes you go through. Let's say you're first in line. No matter which ukiki with a cake, which we will henceforth refer to as ukikis, you watch, you are guaranteed to get it because you have the first selection. Now let's say you're second in line. If you, by chance, watch the same ukiki that the first in line person does, then you're screwed because they'll get to select it before you do, leaving you with a guessing game that involves explosives. I guess this isn't that different from Bowser's Big Blast after all, huh? Point being, players lose this minigame not because they lose track of which ukeki they were watching, but because the player in front of them chose the one they were going to. The only way you can completely avoid this fate is by having everyone work together so you all win, or by watching where all five ukekis go. Since both of these scenarios are unlikely, I recommend trying to watch two ukekis at the same time. You might find this task difficult at first, but it's easy 
easier than you think. Keep your eyes in between where the two of them are and keep your focus on them until they're both back in line. I'd say the hardest Ukeki to follow is the one on the far right since it's off to the side and immediately gets covered up by these Ukikis moving a large cake. This is an event that happens every time the Ukikis scramble, making this little guy and possibly the one beside him a bit of a pain to watch due to getting obscured for a quick moment. But it's for these reasons they may actually tempt you into making them your prime watching targets. More often than not, the three Okakis to the left will get watched the most because they're closest to the players. They're also fairly easy to follow compared to the ones on the right since the large cake doesn't cover them up nearly as much. If you're front in line, then your goal should be to watch and select a new Keiki that you think the others wanted to select. This way, you're reducing their options and inching them closer to making blind guesses. If you're in the back of the line, then your strategy should be the opposite. Watch a new Keiki or two that you think the others won't so that you don't get screwed over into choosing at random. If you want to maximize your chances at winning this minigame, then practice following more than two Keikis at a time. Do that and you'll rarely see yourself lose. Rassel and Rapids, push your opponents off the raft as it floats down the river. The last player standing wins. Players that fall off at the same time or reach the end together will tie with one another. You can jump, punch, or jump kick. Jumping in a player will reduce their movement speed but still let them punch or jump kick. This form of attack isn't recommended since it doesn't do much to actually push your target off the raft. It's more annoying than anything really. Punching a player will knock them back a little, whereas jump kicking a player will knock them back a bit more. It's for this reason you want to get a handle for jump kicking at opportune times to get the most out of every hit. If you get hit by a punch or a jump kick, then take advantage of your invincibility frames by immediately returning to the center of the raft. I don't care how salty you are at the person that hit you. You almost always want to return to the middle so that one more hit doesn't send you into the river. The only time I wouldn't go towards the sweet, safe, and succulent center is if I could knock out a player without anyone else interfering once I'm vulnerable again. That aside, the center is your friend. Near the beginning of the minigame, you'll see spiky balls fall onto the raft, which will merely stun any player who gets hit by one, regardless if they were in the air or not. Trying not to get stunned is fine, but if you're moving to the edge to avoid this fate, then you've just thrown yourself in a worse position than before. What I'm trying to say is, if you're in the middle and a spiky ball's about to fall onto you, just eat it and return to center if someone hits you. I can't tell you how ironic it is to watch players freak out when the trees attack just to get out of position and knocked into the rapids for their foolish actions. Now the cannonballs from the train? Those you should be afraid of. If you're grounded when one lands, then you'll get stunned for a whole second, which is the same length of time a spiky ball stuns you for, but here you'll suffer the stun no matter where you're grounded. Not only that, but if a direct shot lands on you, then you're out. So make sure you're not only jumping to avoid the stun, but jumping away from where its impact is so that you don't get obliterated. You could collaborate with the other players so that you all win this minigame as friends, but be honest with me, how often do you see that happen? Dual minigames! Aster Road Rage. Steer your spaceship to avoid ramming into asteroids. Whoever hits an asteroid first, loses. You and your opponent have the same asteroid layout, so it's totally fair. Oh, and if you hit an asteroid, you immediately lose. I've seen players get surprised that the minigame ends when they run into one since they assume this was a race. This is not a race. It's a one-hit, you're-out minigame so avoid all asteroids. That can be easier said than done though. The way you change lanes is by hitting the L and R triggers, and from what I can tell, they aren't the most responsive here. If you're just moving a single lane, then you'll be fine, but if you need to move multiple lanes quickly, I recommend mashing that trigger so that your inputs go through fast. Hopefully you won't have to do this kind of maneuver in the first place as long as you're looking far ahead at the asteroids approaching, but even if you pay a lot of attention, there are just some layouts that are designed to cause some road rage. Some asteroid rage. <laughs> By the way, if both players hit an asteroid at the same time, it's a tie. Same goes for if they both run the timer out. Black Hole Boogie. Tap the A button as fast as you can to swim furiously and avoid being sucked into a black hole. If both players get sucked into the black hole, then it's a tie. The suction of the black hole will grow stronger over time, which might tempt you into doing slow mashing at the beginning and fast mashing at the end, but the minigame's length is so short you should be button mashing as fast as possible the entire length of it. Boot off the stage 
stage can only be played during the nighttime. Run away from the booze that zooms like across the screen from every angle. Whoever gets caught first loses. If both players are still in it when the time's up, it's a tie. This minigame has three variations, each one having walls in different spots that'll get in your way. Regardless of which layout you get, your strategy should remain relatively the same. Stay in the middle so that you have the most amount of room and time to dodge the booze. If you foolishly decide to hug a wall, then you risk a boo popping out of that very same wall, leaving you little time to dodge it and little choice for how to dodge it since you've literally walled off one of your escape routes. Being in the middle lets you prepare for booze that fly in from any angle. They'll always fly in a straight line, making them incredibly predictable, so when you see them on screen, it should be as simple as reading which direction they're going and moving out of the way. Their arms don't contain hitboxes. They won't catch you, so don't assume it's all over if one of their arms runs into you. Boonanza can only be played during nighttime. Round up boos and herd them into your pen. Whoever corrals the most boos wins. If both players gather an equal amount of boos in their pen, it's a tie. There are 64 boos total. Nice. Boos will move away from you if you move towards them, meaning your best bet at getting them into your pen is by pushing them along the wall. Now obviously you don't want to push the boos into an easy position that'll let your opponent nab them, so don't aim for any walls on your foe's side. Instead, run in a curved motion to force the boos towards your own walls, then run along the wall and finally towards your pen to force the boos in. When doing this last part, you want to run away from your pen as soon as the boos start flooding into it. Running closer to the pen than you need to will just cause nearby boos to scurry away and waste your time as you try and round them up again. If you did chase the boos into the pen correctly, then there will likely be a healthy amount of boos close by. Simply run around to the other side of them and run straight towards the pen so that they go in. When corralling these boos, you'll notice that they separate as you move towards them. That's because your area of influence isn't a square or rectangle, but a circle. Having a good feeling for how large your circle of influence is will prevent you from accidentally moving boos where you don't want them to be. It sounds obvious, but when the minigame starts, round up the largest clump of boos to you for a ton of points. The smaller clumps can come later. Moving to your opponent's side to try and steal their boos will just ironically move more towards them. Your opportunity to steal some is when you're both moving boos to the wall, since you can then wrap around to their side's wall and move a few of their boos to your side's wall. Leave any boos that get stuck in a corner. They are not worth running against for multiple seconds. You're much better off ignoring them and gathering boos elsewhere. After counting many beginning screens for this minigame, I can safely say that each side will spawn with a near equal amount amount of booze each time, so there isn't any preferential treatment given here, thankfully. <laughs> Cog Jog. Hop across spinning cogs and over obstacles to reach the goal. Reach the goal first to win. If the timer runs out, it's a tie. If you fall off or touch one of the two spinies, then you'll respawn at the door after 5 seconds have passed. You want to avoid these punishments at all costs, since they're basically a death sentence with how short this obstacle course is. The long route has multiple gears that are wide enough to hold both players. The short route has two thin rotating stars and a high kill count on players who think that taking this path is easy. It is not easy. I recommend you get good at taking the long route so that you can beat out players who take it with you as well as anyone that falls throughout the course of this minigame due to how brutal the punishment is. I'm not saying that the short route is bad by any means. If you get amazing at it and can do it consistently, then screw what I said, go for it. I just find it difficult to nail that consistency on platforms as thin as the stars, especially if I'm thinking about how I could lose a star and that one fall means I basically lose. Regardless of which route you select, Try to jump on your opponent's head at the beginning of the minigame. Most players start by holding down since that's where they've got to go, so you've got your work cut out for you. Simply jump down and towards where their head is to squish them and reduce their movement speed, which will pretty much guarantee you the victory so long as you immediately take either route and don't fall off. The thwomp in the center will slam down at random intervals, causing every machine to rotate the other direction, so if a gear was rotating clockwise, it'll now be going counterclockwise. There's a brief pause before the reversal occurs, giving you time to react to what's happening. It's a bit rare to see this event since the minigame normally ends before the thwomp gets the chance to pound ground, but if you see the dude go for a slam, then watch for the machines and don't let the shaking screen throw off your movement. Full tilt, race along the tilting twisted path and reach the goal 
first to win. If both players get motion sickness and neither can reach the end after 5 minutes pass, it's a tie. If you fall, then Alak 2 will pick you up and drop you off back at the beginning or at the checkpoint if you've made it that far. If you were close to the landing spot when you fell, then you won't have to wait as long to get back in the race as you would if you fell super far away. Which makes sense, this dude's gotta take his time carrying your sorry butt a mile towards your destination. As the minigame's title implies, nearly the entire course is tilting left and right, meaning you've gotta recognize if you're running uphill or downhill so you know how long to run in that direction. Running along the sides of the course can be tricky since you've gotta hold up and make adjustments depending on which way the course is tilting so that you don't fall off. You can avoid a lot of the pain in this minigame and save time if you choose to jump as often as possible. Running up a slope is a lot slower than just jumping over it. Having to make micro adjustments while running along the sides is more more stressful than just jumping in a straight line. And actually, interacting with the course is such a pain compared to just jumping over entire sections of it. Actually, that one may need a little bit of explanation. But before that, I should mention that the course tilts on a timer. Each time the clock hits a value that ends in 5, the course will tilt to the left, tilt to the right, and then return to a neutral position for 3 seconds before it repeats the same pattern. Simple jumps like these are no-brainers. You're a smart kid, you don't need me to explain them to you. This jump from higher elevation to lower elevation is fairly easy to pull off and saves you a little time from rounding the right side, but you can do even better if you jump from this left side to the next left side. Don't jump from a curve or attempt to land on a curve. Doing so needlessly increases the distance you have to cover, which will almost always lead you to the darkness below. You instead want to jump from one side to another side to minimize the distance you need to travel. In this case, the jump is a little tight, so you've got to leap from the ledge. The amount of time this skip saves over the previous one is about half a second, and anyone that's done a race before can tell you just how big a deal half a second can be, especially if you're up against someone that actually knows what they're doing. Oh, did I mention that your jump height is dependent on how long you hold the A button for? Make sure you're pinning it down each time you jump for the maximum height. You can leap from this curvy section to the final stretch of the course to save a second, and it's pretty easy to pull off, so there's no excuse for not doing this, even if you're bad. Light up my night, scramble through the dark maze to find candles and set them ablaze. Whoever lights five candles first wins. If five minutes passes without either player lighting up five candles, it's a tie. There will always be nine candles in every maze. While the minigame is dark, it's not dark enough to block the candles and parts of the maze from view. It may be hard at first, but once you know how the candles look, then you'll easily be able to find them and light multiple up in quick succession. The maze really isn't that big of a deal. It's not moving, it's not complicated, it's just composed of some random blocks that were thrown about. Worst thing that can happen to you is running into them for a second and immediately correcting your course. Target the candles that are closest to you. The less you have to move in between lightings of candles, the better. If you and your opponent are close to one another, then light the closest candle to the two of you so that they don't get a point. Make sure you're in range of the candle before attempting to light it or else you'll waste precious time, and let me tell you, time is everything in a minigame like this. Lunar Ticks! Fire your jetpack thrusters to control your falling speed. Whoever lands closest to zero wins. That last part is key. Whoever lands closest to zero wins, meaning that even if your score is in the negatives, if it's closer to zero than your opponent, then you win. Hold A the moment your icon lines up in the middle of the second moon and the sun above it. If you know you messed up the timing here bad, then make tiny adjustments to make up for your mistake. If both players land at the exact same time, it's a tie. Mass Meteor, dodge the hurtling asteroids and float to the goal. Whoever reaches the goal first, wins. If both players make it to the goal at the same time, then it's a tie, and one with the hilarious animation at that. You can see how much progress each player is making via the icons in the middle. This minigame's an auto-scroller, and one that stays at a fixed speed no matter where you are. You could chill at the far left of the screen and make the same amount of progress as someone at the far right of the screen. So where should you be? The left, of course! The asteroids are coming in from the right, so staying there will just get you hit before you have any time to react. If you hit a boulder, then your screen will stop auto-scrolling until you're able to move again. And since your victory is dependent on your screen scrolling to the end, that means you need to avoid these asteroids at all costs. But wait, doesn't that mean if you and your opponent get hit the same amount of times that the minigame's just gonna end in a tie? 
it's a little more complicated than that. To beat the minigame, you have to cross through the finish line, which, like the asteroids, will appear on the right side of your screen. So when you squeeze through the two rocks at the end and there's nothing else in sight, hold right until you reach the goal. Is this why the minigame doesn't tie? Because players don't know how to hold right at the end? Nah, even amateurs pick up on this. What's weird about tying in this minigame is how often it doesn't occur when it feels like it should. You and your opponent could both play the perfect game, hold right at the end, and instead of being a fair judge and calling it a tie, some bias is thrown to one of the players. I'm unsure why this inconsistency exists, but it's even more of a reason to make sure you don't hit any asteroids so that if your opponent does, then you'll secure a win. If you tap right on the analog stick, then your character will continue to move right at the same speed even after you stop touching your controller. This is because, as the game puts it, you're in the middle of space where you aren't bound by gravity, making the controls here exceptionally floaty. If you want to switch directions, then you've got to hold the analog stick long enough to influence your character to go that direction. A single tap will only slightly influence your movement, but this quirk can be used to your advantage. What if you need to squeeze through two asteroids? You can do little taps in your analog stick to flow as slowly as possible between them. This is a lot safer than holding the analog stick since you're increasing your speed a tiny bit at a time as opposed to just committing to a speed from the get-go. The amount of space <laughs> you have to move up and down is incredibly deceiving, especially for the player on the top. I mean, look at this huge gap that the player can't enter. What makes this monstrosity even worse is how the asteroids nonchalantly float through this unreachable space, making it seem like you can go there when in reality you can't. Oh, and it looks like the player on the bottom has a big gap on the floor. It's nice to see that both characters are receiving the same amount of visual barf, but I'd prefer it if the barf wasn't there at all. You need to keep these discrepancies in mind while you float around, or else you'll end up moving to a spot you thought you could reach, get stuck, and then bonk your head on a boulder. Speaking of which, if there's no good opening available to pass the asteroid or asteroids in front of you, then move to the left and wait for a better opening to show itself. Alternatively, if there already is a big opening available, then don't hesitate and float through there immediately. Ozone, ground pound the stage panels to find circles. Be the first to find three to claim victory. If neither player scores three points before time's up, it's a tie. There are three types of panels. Circle panels, which you need three of to win, blank panels, which don't do anything, and X panels, which stun you momentarily. There will always be five circle panels and four X panels. The rest will be blanks. At the beginning of the minigame, you'll see which panels are which, but here's the catch. After two seconds pass, all panels will get hidden and the stage will spin around, forcing you to follow the circles mid-spin so that you can then attempt to ground pound a circle panel. That is, if you're playing the way most people do, which unnecessarily overcomplicates things. In reality, you don't need to follow where the circle panels move during a spin. Why? Because the stage always spins 360 degrees, meaning that none of the panel's positions actually change. What this means is that you can simply memorize what positions the circles are in when they're shown to you, and then after the stage spins, just ground pound where the circles are. It really doesn't get any simpler than that. Get Getting jumped on will reduce your movement speed, but you can still jump and ground pound. Being on the receiving end of a ground pound will stun you for a cruel 3 seconds before you can move again. Avoid this fate by keeping distance from your opponent or by staying above them when they're mid-jump. Pity Fall! Choose one of the three ropes. Whoever chooses correctly and swings to the platform wins. Only one rope will drop a player onto the platform. The other two will result in a journey to the abyss. If both players choose the wrong rope, then a fly guy will randomly save one of the two players. Contrary to popular belief, the player who fell closest to the platform does not have a higher chance of being taken to it than the player further out. That fly guy is not lazy and will go the distance for fairness. Sadly, there are no tells in this minigame for which rope is the winner. My initial hypothesis was that the winning rope would have a different swaying animation at the start, but after overlaying multiple games on top of one another, the devs made each rope behave exactly the same way, regardless if it's a winner or not. So, uh... Good luck. Something's amiss. Hunt for gemstones hidden in the fog. When your controller rumbles, a gemstone is nearby. Find three gemstones first to win. If both players are garbage at treasure hunting and five minutes pass without a victor, it's a tie, regardless of how many points each player has. There will only ever be one gemstone to find per round. All of the trees in the background will stare at where the gemstone is. If you were to draw their lines of sight, then the gemstone can be found where all the lines intersect. Checking where all five trees 
enemies are looking at can be hard at first, but do it enough times and you'll just know where to move to. If you still find difficulty even after practicing it a bit, then only look for where a couple trees are looking instead. Some help is better than no help. If Rumble's turned on, then react to the vibrations in your controller as quickly as you can. Your opponent likely won't know that your controller vibrated, so the chances of them stealing the gemstone from you are low if they're further away. If Rumble's turned off, then you've got to be quick in nabbing the gemstone once you see the marker above your head. If you're not, then your opponent will make their way over to you in an attempt to steal the goods. On the other hand, if you see that your opponent's marker is going off, then book it to them and go for the steal. Sumo of Dumo. Use your vehicle to push your opponent off the crumbling platform. Whoever knocks the other player off first wins. If neither player falls before time's up, it's a tie. The goal here is to knock into your opponent over and over until they fall out of the arena. When the minigame starts, hold forward. Do not turn. Doing so will expose your side to your opponent, and if they hit you on your side where you can't hit back, then you'll keep getting pushed until you weasel your way out or fall off. So again, minigame starts, hold forward. If your opponent does the same, then your machines will clash against each other multiple times, with neither gaining a notable advantage. But after a few of these clashes, you'll both be off-center from one another. When this happens, turn to face your opponent and immediately hold forward again, not letting up. The core idea here is that you want your vehicle to be smacking into them as much as possible, and you can't do that if you're not facing them. So anytime you're turned away, be polite and face them with your vehicle, ramming in to them again and again. The arena will shrink when the timer's at 28, 20, 12, and 4, so every 8 seconds when starting at 28. The first shrink will be the top and bottom block platforms. The second shrink will be the left and right block platforms. The third will be the top and bottom ones again, and the fourth will end with knocking off the left and right ones. You'll be fighting for the middle of the arena most of the time, but knowing these patterns may help you realize which outer field positions are safe and which are unsafe depending on what the timer is at. Earlier I said you want to face your opponent so that you can bump into them as much as possible, but when I say face, that doesn't just mean the front of your vehicle, but the butt as well. That's right, your butt is just as effective at smacking your opponent off as your face is. So if you're spun around, then have confidence in your bumper and play just as aggressive. The only difference there is when using your bum is that your controls are reversed. But if you can get used to it, then you can cover all your bases. T-5, ground pound at the moment the panel beneath you flashes to warp to the next panel. Whoever reaches the goal first wins. If no one can figure out how to ground pound within five minutes, it's a tie. If both players finish at the exact same time, then the winner will be selected at random. There are five panels that lie before you, ready to get butt smacked, but only when they're lit up. For if you ground pound a panel when it is all but dim, then you'll get stunned for a quick second. This isn't a reaction based minigame though, it's a timing based one. You've got to watch each panel light up one after the other and then butt smack as soon as the one you're on lights up. If your ground pound's successful, then you'll be warped to the next panel where the goal remains the same, except the lights flash by quicker, meaning the timing stricter, but that shouldn't be a problem for us. For the first panel, wait for the one ahead of you to light up, and when it does, hold A to perform a high jump and then ground pound right after. For the second panel, wait for the one ahead of you to light up and when it does, mash A so that you perform a short hop and immediately ground pound right after. The moment you warp onto the third platform, immediately start button mashing A so that you can ground pound as quickly as possible. If done correctly, then when you land, you'll smack the lit up panel beneath you and warp to the fourth. Here, you need to wait for the lights to make their way up, then wait for them to go down, and finally, when you see the second panel light up, button mash A for a quick ground pound and a warp to the fifth panel, the most difficult one. Here's where you'll see players ground pounding at random intervals in a desperate attempt to get lucky and win the minigame. Either that, or they'll do their very best to time this daunting task. We're gonna avoid both of these strategies. If you button mash fast here, then you'll do a ground pound before the panel below you lights up, which is what we want to avoid. So instead of button mashing like mad, just cool off and hit the A button at a moderate pace, and your ground pound will have a little more air time, letting you hit the panel below as soon as it lights up. No timing required, just a matter of tapping the A button at a good pace. Trick or tree. All right, check this. It shows you which tree is the tallest. Okay. It pans down. Okay. It starts shuffling the trees. Okay. So this minigame is about carefully following the tallest tree then, right? Hmm. 
Nope. Some ingenious dev thought it'd be hilarious to go through all of the steps of a shuffling minigame just to go, hey, you know what would be funny? If during the shuffle, all of the trees lined up perfectly, making it impossible for the players to find where the tallest tree is. Whoever you are, you have a sick sense of humor. Because I spent hours on this minigame searching for any clues or tells that would help me decipher which tree is the tallest. But no, screw you for wasting my time. Just choose a tree and hope for the best. This may as well be a Bowser minigame. Dark and crispy. Bowser is lurking in the darkness. Avoid him and his fire breathing attack. Fall and it's game over. Despite what the explanation implies, touching Bowser, his fire breath, or falling will result in a game over. There are spotlights on every character in the arena except for Bowser, meaning you've got to keep a close eye on where he's hidden beneath all the darkness. Fortunately, there are lights in the walls, so even if no players are currently close to Bowser to light him up, the wall lights may be able to show where he is. Even if they only show a tiny part of him, anything is better than nothing. If you see that tiny part start moving up, then you can predict that up is where he's moving. Speaking of which, he has three behaviors, walking in a direction, running in a direction, and spewing fire breath. When he walks or runs, he does so in a straight line. The only way he can turn is by stopping all of his movement and rotating. So if he's charging at you, then simply step to the side and wait for his next action, which may very well be his fire breath. If you're facing him when he spews this stuff out, then you'd better be far away. Otherwise, you can stay on the side of him or behind him for safety. Don't underestimate the range of this attack. Even so much as touching a pixel of this stuff will knock you out of the game. The upside to this attack is that it lights up the area in full, revealing his location so that you can move to a safer spot. If there's a threat that you need to lose this minigame, then you can body block, but I'll warn you, this can be the end of you if you're not careful. Always keep in mind how much space you have when moving along the edges. The last thing you want to do is fall into the abyss when you were completely safe from the big bad himself. Dizzy Rotisserie. You're clumsy, dizzy, and disoriented. Reach the exit before the inferno begins. This is one of the easiest losable Mario Party minigames in the franchise. Simply put, move up on your analog stick and figure out which way your character moves. If it's left, for example, then rotate your stick around until you're moving up and awkwardly waltz your way to the exit. Despite the spikes on the walls and on the Bowser statues, nothing in this room can stun or injure you. So just focus on getting to the exit in what should be a cakewalk. If you somehow don't make it in time, in which you were probably fooling around, then you'll get burnt to a crisp by the Bowser statues no matter where you are. I know it looks like you might be able to find a spot where their fire doesn't reach, but I've tried and got grilled every time. Pit Boss, Dodge Bowser's Rolling Spike Spheres, what I argue is the hardest Bowser minigame in this title. It begins with Bowser throwing a Spike Sphere into the arena. While the throw is different each time, it'll land somewhere in the middle, never on the far edges. If you touch one of these guys, then you're out, so avoid this first one with care by moving to where the most open space is. When there's only one sphere on the field like here, it's pretty easy to predict where it's gonna roll. Bouncing off a wall doesn't change much. It's when Bowser throws in a second and third spike sphere that things get dicey. Instead of merely watching for how a single sphere bounces off the wall, you've got to keep track of three spheres bouncing off the wall and each other, which is terrifying but still doable so long as you have a good grasp on how the spheres physics work. If they bump into one another head on, then they'll start rolling in the opposite direction. If they bump while moving in the same direction, then they'll keep moving in the same relative direction. It feels completely natural. Once you ease into how it works, you'll find yourself being able to move to the right spot with ease. No matter how good you get at understanding these spheres' physics, there is one unpredictable factor in all this. Your opponents, or uh, teammates if you'd like to think of this as a you guys versus Bowser deal. Whatever you like to call them, they will get in your way and body block you whether they want to or not. Sure, they're smaller than the spheres and don't actually knock you out of the minigame, but your movement being halted for even a split second can mean doom. So if you have to choose between a safe spot with or away from the other players, then stay away. When dodging the spheres, don't be afraid to move through the middle. Oftentimes, players will stick to the wall and end up trapping themselves because they were too scared to dash in between a couple spheres. I assure you, there will almost always be a moment in the minigame where running through the middle to a different side is a better move than staying where you are. It's just a matter of seeing that opening and taking it at the right time.
DK Minigames, Banana Shake. Shake the banana tree to make as many bananas fall as you can. Press B to avoid falling hammers. You can also press B to avoid bananas, but you don't want to do that. The possible items that can fall out of a tree is a hammer, which will stun you for a second, a banana, and a bunch of bananas, which is worth five bananas. Each player's banana tree is different, so whatever falls onto you may differ from whatever falls onto someone else. Does this mean that some players may just get luckier than others? Yeah, but that's no excuse to not do your best. And by do your best, I mean don't press the B button at all. That's right, don't even bother trying to dodge any hammers that fall because you can't. They simply fall too fast for any normal person to react to them. Heck, even the brutal CPUs can't react to them. The time you spend attempting to dodge them and inevitably getting hit would be better spent on mashing A as fast as possible to get the maximum number of bananas. You might consider trying to dodge a hammer in advance, and sure that might work, but it's certainly not worth losing out on the many bananas you'll end up avoiding instead. It's unfortunate, but this minigame simply doesn't grant players enough time to see any hammers dropping. If you're still adamant about trying to avoid them though, then I offer you one golden strategy. Pausing. <laughs> pier Factor. Choose one of the five barrels. The barrels will collect bananas as they move down the pier. There are bridges scattered about that connect the paths to one another. If a barrel comes across a bridge, it'll automatically cross it to the other side. If two barrels come across the same bridge, then they'll bump into one another and resume going down the path they were originally on. The bridge and banana layouts are completely random, but you are shown the entire layout at the beginning of the minigame as the camera pans up to you. While this looks helpful, there are just too many bridges to keep track of. No normal person could memorize it all. But hey, let's say you aren't a normal person. Let's say you were able to lock in the positions of every bridge here in your head. There's just one more problem you'd have to face. The barrel situation. Remember, there are five barrels for players to choose from, not four. Why does this matter? Because that creates five possible variations for how the barrels will roll down the pier. Variation one is if no one gets in the first barrel, variation two is if no one gets in the second barrel, and so on and so forth. So even if you somehow manage to memorize all of the bridges as the camera pans up, you've also got to pick which barrel to enter based on which variation will be most useful to your position, and if your memory is off by even a single bridge close to you, then that's enough to throw everything off course. So that begs the question, what can you do? Well, I recommend paying close attention to the last few seconds as the camera pans up and scoping out any banana bunches, which are worth 5 bananas. If you spot one, then immediately soak in what bridges lead to it and which barrel will take you there. Then immediately move to that barrel and check which barrels the other players entered. If they went into one that screws you out of the bunch, then switch barrels to correct your course. Sometimes you'll be able to see the bunch on screen right as you're about to choose your barrel, in which case, quickly hop into the one that'll bring you to your your destiny. This strat may not guarantee you the maximum number of bananas in the minigame, but if you can get good at scoping out these bunches and nailing them every time, then you're set for a great average amount over time. Telling me banana, jump from barrel to barrel without falling into the water to grab the most bananas. Barrels can contain nothing, a banana, or a banana bunch worth 5 bananas. If you fall into the water, you're out of the minigame, but you get to keep the bananas you collected. When you hop onto a barrel, it'll break, giving you the contents inside, and you'll continue hopping until you either fall into the water or land on the panels. When the minigame starts, immediately hop onto the barrel in front of you and move towards the largest bunch of them. If you see another player pushing towards your claim, then cut them off and take the goods for yourself. Don't get too greedy and end up in the water though. You wouldn't want to end up as a stepping stone for the other player's hope, now would you? Oh yeah, I guess I should mention that players in the water can be hopped off of just like barrels can. So if you're in a tight situation and need more distance, then feel free to use your opponent's head as a bounce pad to further your game. Sometimes it's best to abandon your life of hopping and return to the good old days of running along the wooden planks. This will let you reposition yourself to reach barrels that you may have not been able to hop on from where you were. Finish! <laughs> 
Mario Party 6 is a weird game for me. Out of the first 7 Mario Party titles, it was the last one I played, and yet it ended up tying with Mario Party 3 for my favorite entry in the series. I didn't think that the item system could get any better, but there was so much effort put into this game to refine and expand the strategies that players could employ so that no match feels similar to one another. Can boards like Snowflake Lake and Fair Square get out of hand? Absolutely, but there's something to be said about the devs at least trying something new, trying to shake up the formula while retaining what people loved about it in the first place. And although I can't say they exactly hit their mark with these boards, I respect the work that's been put in so that players feel like they're having a fresh experience, especially with the day and night system. This game-wide mechanic had so much love packed into it, every board changing depending on the time of day, minigames matching what time of day it is or even changing their rule set entirely according to it, it's charm like this that it can't help but fawn over, and at the same time, it's charm like this that forced me to make the longest video I've ever had on my channel. While this length will undoubtedly be seen as impressive, considering aside from research this is a one zyg job, I can feel my lifespan shortening from the amount of time it takes to produce videos like these. For this reason, I've been looking into hiring an editor to help me pump out these high quality videos on a more frequent basis. As it stands right now though, I simply don't have the funds to afford it, which is why I've decided to open up memberships for this channel. I pledge that any funds I receive through these memberships will be saved up and funneled directly back into the videos I produce for you guys. If you end up deciding to join this channel's membership, then I'd be greatly appreciative and will ensure that all of your support be handled responsibly and with care. That's my promise. Thank you to these people who helped in researching and gathering information for this video. And thank you for watching. See you next time when we cover Mario Party 7.